The Empty House by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott W. Fields. The Empty House by Algernon Blackwood. Certain houses, like certain persons, manage somehow to proclaim at once their character for evil. In the case of the latter, no particular feature need betray them. They may boast an open countenance and an ingenuous smile, and yet a little of their company leaves the unalterable conviction that there is something radically amiss with their being, that they are evil. Willy-nilly, they seem to communicate an atmosphere of secret and wicked thoughts which makes those in their immediate neighborhood shrink from them as from a thing diseased. And perhaps with houses the same principle is operative, and it is the aroma of evil deeds committed under a particular roof, long after the actual doer has passed away, that makes the goose-flesh come and the hair rise. Something of the original passion of the evildoer, and of the horror felt by his victim, enters the heart of the innocent watcher, and he becomes suddenly conscious of tingling nerves, creeping skin, and a chilling of the blood. He is terror-stricken without apparent cause. There was manifestly nothing in the external appearance of this particular house to bear out the tales of horror that were said to reign within. It was neither lonely nor unkempt. It stood crowded into a corner of the square, and looked exactly like the houses on either side of it. It had the same number of windows as its neighbor, the same balcony overlooking the gardens, the same white steps leading up to the heavy black front door, and in the rear there was the same narrow strip of green, with neat box borders running up the wall that divided it from the backs of the adjoining houses. Apparently, too, the number of chimney-pots on the roof was the same, and the breadth and angle of the eaves, and even the height of the dirty area railings. And yet this house in the square, that seemed precisely similar to its fifty ugly neighbors, was a matter of fact entirely different. Horribly different. Wherein lay this marked invisible difference is impossible to say. It cannot be ascribed wholly to the imagination, because persons who had spent some time in the house, knowing nothing of the facts, had declared positively that certain rooms were so disagreeable that they would rather die than enter them again, and that the atmosphere of the whole house produced in them symptoms of a genuine terror. While the series of innocent tenants who tried to live in it, and being forced to decamp at the shortest possible notice, was indeed little less than a scandal in the town. When Shorthouse arrived to pay a weekend visit to his Aunt Julia in her little house on the seafront on the other end of town, he found her charged to the brim with mystery and excitement. He had only received her telegram that morning, and he had come anticipating boredom. But the moment he touched her hand, kissed her apple-skin wrinkled cheek, he caught the first wave of her electric condition. The impression deepened when he learned that there were to be no other visitors, and that he had been telegraphed for a very special object. Something was in the wind, and that something would doubtless bear fruit. For this elderly spinster aunt, with a mania for psychical research, had brains as well as willpower, and by hook or by crook she usually managed to accomplish her ends. The revelation was made soon after tea, when she sidled close up to him as they paced slowly along the seafront in the dusk. "'I've got the keys,' she announced with delight, yet half-awesome voice. "'Got them till Monday.' "'The keys of the bathing machine, or?' he asked innocently, looking from the sea to town. Nothing brought her so quickly to the point as feigning stupidity. Neither, she whispered. I've got the keys of the haunted house in the square, and I'm going there tonight. 
Shorthouse was conscious of the slightest possible tremor down his back. He dropped his teasing tone. Something in her voice and manner thrilled him. She was in earnest. But you can't go alone, he began. That's why I wired for you, she said with decision. He turned to her. The ugly, lined, enigmatical face was alive with excitement. There was the glow of genuine enthusiasm round it like a halo. The eyes shone. He caught another wave of her excitement, and a second tremor, more marked than the first, accompanied it. "'Thanks, Aunt Julia,' he said politely. "'Thanks awfully.' "'I should not dare to go quite alone,' she went on, raising her voice. "'But with you, I should enjoy it immensely. "'You're afraid of nothing, I know.' "'Thanks so much,' he began. "'Um, is anything likely to happen?' "'A great deal has happened,' she whispered. "'Though it's been most cleverly hushed up. Three tenants have come and gone in the last few months, "'and the house is said to be empty for good now.' "'In spite of himself, Shorthouse became interested. "'His aunt was so very much in earnest.' The house is very old indeed, she went on, and the story, an unpleasant one, dates a long way back. It has to do with a murder committed by a jealous stableman who had some affair with a servant in the house. One night he managed to secrete himself in the cellar, and when everyone was asleep, he crept upstairs to the servants' quarters, chased the girl down to the next landing, and before anyone could come to her rescue, threw her bodily over the banisters into the hall below. And the stableman? Was caught, I believe, and hanged for murder. But it all happened a century ago, and I have not been able to get more details of the story. Shorthouse now felt his interest thoroughly aroused. But though he was not particularly nervous for himself, he hesitated a little on his aunt's account. "'On one condition,' he said at length. "'Nothing will prevent my going,' she said firmly. "'But I may as well hear your condition. "'That you guarantee your power of self-control "'if anything really horrible happens. "'I mean that you are sure you won't get too frightened.' "'Jim!' she said scornfully. I'm not young, I know, nor are my nerves. But with you, I should be afraid of nothing in the world. This, of course, settled it. For Shorthouse had no pretensions to being other than a very ordinary young man, and an appeal to his vanity was irresistible. He agreed to go. Instinctively, by a sort of subconscious preparation, he kept himself and his forces well in hand the whole evening. Compelling an accumulative reserve of control by that nameless inward process of gradually putting all the emotions away and turning the key upon them, a process difficult to describe, but wonderfully effective, as all men who lived through severe trials of the inner man well understood. Later it stood him in good stead. But it was not until half-past ten, when they stood in the hall, well in the glare of friendly lamps and still surrounded by comforting human influences, that he had to make the first call upon the store of collected strength. For once the door was closed, he saw the deserted silent street stretching away white in the moonlight before them. It came to him clearly that the real test that night would be in dealing with two fears instead of one. He would have to carry his aunt's fear as well as his own. And as he glanced down at her sphinx-like countenance and realized that it might assume no pleasant aspect in the rush of real terror, he felt satisfied with only one thing in the whole adventure, that he had confidence in his own will and power to stand against any shock that might come. Slowly they walked along the empty streets of the town. A bright autumn moon silvered the roofs, Casting deep shadows, there was no breath of wind, 
and the trees in the former garden by the seafront watched them silently as they passed along. To his aunt's occasional remarks, Shorthouse made no reply, realizing that she was simply surrounding herself with mental buffers, saying ordinary things to prevent herself from thinking of extraordinary things. Few windows showed lights, and from scarcely a single chimney came smoke or sparks. Shorthouse had already begun to notice everything, even in the slightest details. Presently they stopped at the street corner and looked up at the name on the side of the house, full in the moonlight, and with one accord, but without remark, turned into the square, crossed over to the side of it that lay in shadow. "'The number of the house is thirteen whispered a voice at his side, and neither of them made the obvious reference, but passed across the broad sheet of moonlight and began to march up the pavement in silence. It was about halfway up the square that Shorthouse felt an arm slip quietly but significantly into his own, and knew then that their adventure had begun in earnest, and that his companion was already yielding imperceptibly to the influences against them. She needed support. A few minutes later, they stopped before a tall, narrow house that rose before them into the night, ugly in shape, and painted a dingy white. Shutterless windows without blinds stared down upon them, shining here and there in the moonlight. There were weather streaks in the wall and cracks in the paint, and the balcony bulged out from the first floor a little unnaturally. But beyond this generally forlorn appearance of an occupied house, there was nothing at first sight to single out this particular mansion for the evil character it had most certainly acquired. Taking a look over his shoulders to make sure that they had not been followed, they went boldly up the steps and stood against the huge black door that fronted them forbiddingly. But the first wave of nervousness was now upon them, and Shorthouse fumbled a long time with the key before he could fit it into the lock at all. For a moment, if the truth be told, they both hoped it would not open, for they were prey to various unpleasant emotions as they stood there on the threshold of their ghostly adventure. Shorthouse, shuffling with the key, and hampered by the steady weight on his arm, certainly felt the solemnity of the moment. It was as if the whole world, for all experience seemed at that instant concentrated in his own consciousness, were listening to the grating noise of the key. A stray puff of wind wandered down the empty street, woke a momentary rustling in the trees behind them. But otherwise, this rattling of the key was the only sound audible. And at last it turned in the lock, and the heavy door swung open, and revealed a yawning gulf of darkness below. With a last glance at the moonlit square, they passed quickly in, and the door slammed behind them with a roar that echoed prodigiously through the empty halls and passages. But instantly, with the echoes, another sound made itself heard, and Aunt Julia leaned suddenly so heavily upon him that he had to take a step backwards to save himself from falling. A man had coughed so close behind him, so close that it seemed they must have actually been by his side in the darkness. With the possibility of practical jokes in mind, Shorthouse had once swung his heavy stick in the direction of the sound, but had met nothing more solid than air. He heard an ant give a little gasp behind him. "'There's someone here,' she whispered. "'I heard him!' "'Be quiet,' he said sternly. "'It was nothing but the noise of the front door. "'Oh, get a light, quick!' she added as her nephew, fumbling with the box of matches, opened it upside down and let them all fall with a rattle onto the stone floor. The sound, however, was not repeated. There was no evidence of retreating footsteps. In another minute they had a candle burning, using an empty end of a cigar case as a holder, and when the first flare had died down, he held the impromptu lamp aloft and surveyed the scene. And it was dreary enough in all conscience, for there is nothing more desolate in all the abodes of men than an unfurnished house dimly lit, silent and forsaken, and yet tenanted by rumor with the memories of evil and violent histories. 
They were standing in the wide hallway. On their left was the open door of the spacious dining room, and in the front the hall ran, ever narrowing, into a long, dark passage that led apparently to the top of the kitchen stairs. The broad, uncarpeted stairway rose in a sweep before them, everywhere draped in shadows, except for a single spot about halfway up, where the moonlight came in through the window and fell into a bright patch on the boards. The shaft of light shed a faint radiance above and below it, lending to the objects within its reach a misty outline that was infinitely more suggestive and ghostly than complete darkness. Filtered moonlight always seems to paint faces on the surrounding gloom, and as Shorthouse peered up into the well of darkness, and the thought of countless empty rooms and passages in the upper part of the old house, he caught himself longing again for the safety of the moonlit square, or the cozy, bright drawing room that they had left an hour before. Then realizing that these thoughts were dangerous, he thrust them away again, and summoned all his energy for concentration on the present. "'Aunt Julia,' he said aloud severely, "'we must now go through the house from top to bottom "'and make a thorough search.' "'The echoes of his voice died away slowly all over the building, "'and in the intense silence that followed he looked at her. "'In the candlelight he saw that her face was already ghastly pale, "'but she dropped his arm for a moment "'and said in a whisper, stepping close in front of him, "'I agree. "'We must be sure there's no one hiding.' That's the first thing. She spoke with evident effort, and he looked at her with admiration. You feel not quite sure of yourself? It's not too late. I think so, she whispered, her eyes shifting nervously toward the shadows behind. Quite sure. Only one thing. What's that? You must never leave me alone for an instant. As long as you understand that any sound or appearance must be investigated at once, for to hesitate means to admit fear. That is fatal. Agreed, she said a little shakily, after a moment's hesitation. I'll try. Arm in arm, Shorthouse holding the dripping candle and stick, while his aunt carried the cloak over her shoulders, figures of utter comedy to all but themselves, they began a systematic search, stealthily walking on tiptoe and shading the candle lest it should betray their presence through the shutterless windows. They went first into the big dining room. There was not a stick of furniture to be seen. Bare walls, ugly mantelpieces, empty grates stared at them. Everything, they felt, resented their intrusion, watching them, as it were, with veiled eyes. Whispers followed them. Shadows flitted noiselessly to the right and left. Something seemed ever at their back, watching, waiting for an opportunity to do them injury. There was an inevitable sense that operations which went on when the room was empty had been temporarily suspended till they were well out of the way again. The whole dark interior of the old building seemed to become a malignant presence that rose up, warning them to detest and mind their own business. Every moment the strain on their nerves increased. Out of the gloomy dining room they passed through the large folding doors into a sort of library or smoking room, wrapped equally in silence, darkness, and dust, and from this they regained the hall near the top of the back stairs. Here a pitch-black tunnel opened before them into the lower regions and it must be confessed they hesitated, but only for a moment. With the worst of the night still to come, it was essential to turn from nothing. Aunt Julia stumbled at the top of the step of the dark descent, ill-lit by the flickering candle, and even Shorthouse felt at least half decision go out of his legs. "'Come on,' he said preemptively, and his voice ran on and lost itself in the dark, empty spaces below. I'm coming, she faltered, catching his arms with unnecessary violence. They went a little unsteadily down the stone steps, a cold, damp air meeting them in the face, close and malodorous. The kitchen into which the stairs led along the narrow passage was large, with a lofty ceiling. 
Several doors opened out of it, some into the cupboards with the empty jars still standing on the shelves, and others into horrible little ghostly back offices, even colder and less inviting than the last. Black beetles scurried all over the floor, and once, when they knocked against a deal table standing in the corner, something about the size of a cat jumped down with a rush and fled, scampering across the stone floor into the darkness. Everywhere there was a sense of recent occupation, an impression of sadness and gloom. Leaving the main kitchen, they next went toward the scullery. The door was standing ajar, and as they pushed it open to its full extent, Aunt Julia uttered a piercing scream, when she instantly tried to stifle by placing her hand over her mouth. For a second Shorthouse stood stock still, catching his breath. He felt as if his spine had suddenly become hollow, and someone had filled it with particles of ice. Facing them, directly in their way between the doorposts, stood the figure of a woman. She had disheveled hair and wildly staring eyes, and her face was terrified and white as death. She stood there motionless for the space of a single second. Then the candle flickered and she was gone. Gone utterly. And the door framed nothing but empty darkness. Only the beastly jumping candlelight, he said quickly, in a voice that sounded like someone else's and was only half under control. Come on, aunt. There, there's nothing there. He dragged her forward. With a clattering of feet and a great appearance of boldness, they went on. But over his body the skin moved as if crawling ants covered it, and he knew by the weight on his arm that he was supplying the force of locomotion for the two. The scullery was cold, bare and empty, more like a large prison cell than anything else. They went round it, tried the door into the yard and the windows, but found them all fastened securely. His aunt moved beside him like a person in a dream. Her eyes were tightly shut, and she seemed merely to follow the pressure of his arm. Her courage filled him with amazement. At the same time, he noticed that a certain odd change had come over her face, which somehow evaded his powers of analysis. "'There's nothing here, Auntie,' he repeated aloud quickly. "'Let's go upstairs and see the rest of the house. And then we'll choose a room to wait up in.' She followed him obediently, keeping close to his side, and they locked the kitchen door behind them. It was a great relief to get Tip again. In the hall there was more light than before, for the moon had traveled a little further down the stairs. Cautiously they began to go up in the dark vault of the upper house, the boards creaking under their weight. On the first floor they found a large double drawing room, a search of which unveiled nothing. Here also there was no sign of furniture or recent occupancy, nothing but dust and neglect and shadows. They opened the big folding doors between front and back drawing rooms, and they came out again to the landing and went on upstairs. They had not gone more than a dozen steps when they both simultaneously stopped to listen looking into each other's eyes with new apprehension across the flickering candle flame. From the room they had left hardly ten seconds before came the sounds of doors quietly closing. It was beyond all question. They heard the booming noise that accompanies the shutting of the heavy doors, followed by a sharp catching of the latch. "'We must go back and see,' said Shorthouse briefly in a low tone, turning to go downstairs again. Somehow she managed to drag after him, her feet catching in her dress, her face livid. When they entered the front drawing room, it was plain that the folding doors had been closed half a minute before. Without hesitation, Shorthouse opened them. He almost expected to see someone facing him in the back room, but only darkness and cold air met him. They went through both rooms, finding nothing unusual. They tried in every way to make the doors close of themselves, but there was not enough wind even to set the candle flame flickering. The doors would not move without strong pressure. All was silent as the grave. Undeniably, the rooms were utterly empty, 
and the house utterly still. It's beginning, whispered a voice at his elbow, which be hardly recognized as his aunt. He nodded acquiescence, taking out his watch to know of the time. It was fifteen minutes before midnight, setting the candle in its case upon the floor in order to do so. It took a moment or two to balance it safely against the wall. And Julia always declared that this was the moment she was not actually watching him, but had turned her head toward the inner room, where she fancied she heard something moving. But at any rate, both positively agreed that the sound of rushing feet, heavy and swift, and the next instant, instant the candle was out. But to Shorthouse himself had come more than this, and he had always thanked his fortunate stars that it came to him alone and not to his aunt too. For, as he rose from the stooping position of the balancing the candle, and before it was actually extinguished, a face thrust itself forward so close to his own that he could have almost touched it with his lips. It was a face working with passion, a man's face, dark, with thick features, angry and savage eyes. It belonged to a common man, and it was evil in an extraordinary normal expression, no doubt before he saw it, alive with intense, aggressive emotion. It was malignant and terrible human countenance. There was no movement in the air, nothing but the sound of rushing feet, stockinged or muffled feet, the apparition of the face, and the almost simultaneously extinguishing of the candle. In spite of himself, Shorthouse uttered a little cry, nearly losing his balance as his aunt clung to him with her whole weight in one moment of real, uncontrollable terror. She made no sound, but simply seized him bodily. Fortunately, however, she had seen nothing, but had only heard the rushing feet, for her control returned almost at once, and he was able to disentangle himself and strike a match. The shadows ran away on all sides before the glare, and his aunt stooped down, groping for the cigar case with the precious candle. Then they discovered the candle had not been blown out at all. It had been crushed out. The wick was now pressed down into the wax, which was flattened by some smooth, heavy instrument. How his companion so quickly overcame her terror, Shorthouse never really properly understood. But his admiration for her self-control increased tenfold, and at the same time served to feed his own dying flame, for which he was undeniably grateful. Equally inexplicable to him was the evidence of physical force they had just witnessed. He had once suppressed the memories of stories he had heard of physical mediums and their dangerous phenomena. For if these were true, and either his aunt or himself was unwittingly a physical medium, it meant that they were simply aiding to the focus of the forces of the haunted house already charged to the brim. It was like walking with unprotected lamps among uncovered stores of gunpowder. So with as little reflection as possible, he simply relit the candle, went tip to the next floor. The arm in his trembled, it is true, and his own tread was often uncertain. But they went on with thoroughness, and after a search revealing nothing, they climbed the last flight of stairs to the top floor of all. Here they found a perfect nest of small servants' rooms, with broken pieces of furniture, dirty caned bottom chairs, chest of drawers, cracked mirrors, decrepit bedsteads. The rooms had low sloping ceilings already hung here and there with cobwebs, small windows, and badly plastered walls, a depressing and dismal region which they were glad to leave behind. It was on the stroke of midnight when they entered a small room on the third floor, close to the top of the stairs, and arranged to make themselves comfortable for the remainder of the adventure. It was absolutely bare, and was said to be the room they used as a clothes closet, into which the infuriated groom had chased his victim and finally caught her. Outside, across from the narrow landing, began the stairs leading up to the floor above, and the servants' quarters where they had just searched. In spite of the chilliness of the night, there was something in the air of this room that cried for an open window. But there was more than this. Short House could only describe it, by saying he felt less master of himself than in any other part of the house. There was something that acted directly on his nerves, tiring the resolution, enfeebling the will. He was conscious of this result, 
before he had been in the room five minutes. And it was in this short time they stayed there that he suffered the wholesale depletion of his own vital forces, which was, for himself, the chief horror of the whole experience. They put the candle on the floor of the cupboard, leaving the door a few inches ajar so there was no glare to confuse the eyes, no shadow to shift about on the walls and ceiling. They spread the cloak on the floor and sat down to wait, with their backs against the wall. Shorthouse was within two feet of the door up onto the landing. His position commanded a good view of the main staircase leading down into the darkness, and also the beginning of the servant's stairs going to the floor above. The heavy stick lay beside him within easy reach. The moon was now high over the house. Through the open window they could see the comforting stars, like friendly eyes watching in the sky. One by one the clocks of the town struck midnight, and when the sounds died away, the deep silence of a windless night fell again over everything. Only the boom of the sea, far away and lugubrious, filled the air with hollow murmurs. Inside the house the silence became awful. Awful, he thought, because any minute now it might be broken by the sounds of portending terror. The strain of waiting told more and more severely on the nerves. They talked in whispers when they talked at all, for their voices sounded queer and unnatural. A chilliness not altogether due to the night air invaded the room and made them cold. The influences against them, whatever they might be, were slowly robbing them of self-confidence and the power of decisive action. Their forces were on the wane, and the possibility of real fear took on a new and terrible meaning. He began to tremble for the elderly woman by his side, whose pluck could hardly save her beyond a certain extent. He heard the blood singing in his veins. It sometimes seemed so loud that he fancied it prevented his hearing properly certain other sounds that were beginning to very faintly make themselves audible into the depths of the house. Every time he fastened his attention on these sounds, they instantly ceased. They certainly came no nearer. Yet he could not rid himself of the idea the movement was going on somewhere in the lower regions of the house. The drawing-room floor, where the doors had been so strangely closed, seemed too near. The sounds were further off than that. He thought of the great kitchen, with the scurrying black beetles, and the dismal little scullery. But somehow or other, they did not seem to come from there either. Surely they were not outside the house. Then suddenly the truth flashed in his mind, and for the space of a minute he felt as if his blood had stopped flowing and turned to ice. The sounds were not downstairs at all. They were upstairs. Upstairs. Somewhere among those gloomy little servants' rooms with bits of broken furniture, low ceilings and cramped windows. Upstairs where the victim had first been disturbed and stalked to her death. And the moment he discovered where the sounds were, he began to hear them more clearly. It was the sound of feet moving stealthily along the passage overhead, in and out among the rooms and past the furniture. He turned quickly to steal a glance at the motionless figure seated beside him to note whether she had shared his discovery. The faint candlelight coming through the crack in the cupboard door threw her strongly marked face into vivid relief against the white of the wall. But it was something else that made him catch his breath and stare again. An extraordinary something that had come into her face and seemed to spread over her features like a mask. It smoothed out the deep lines, drew the skin everywhere a little tighter, so the wrinkles disappeared. It brought into her face, with the sole exception of her old eyes, an appearance of youth, almost childhood. He stared in speechless amazement, amazement that was dangerously near to horror. It was his aunt's face indeed, but it was her face of forty years ago, the vacant, innocent face of a girl. He had heard stories of that strange effect of terror which could wipe a human countenance clean of other emotions, obliterating all previous expressions. But he had never realized that it could be literally true, or could mean anything so simply horrible as what he now saw. For the dreadful signature of overmastering fear was plainly written in that utter vacancy of the girlish face beside him, and when, feeling his intense gaze, she turned to look at him, he instinctively closed his eyes tightly to shut out the sight. 
Yet when he turned a minute later, his feelings well in hand, he saw to his intense relief another expression. His aunt was smiling, and though the face was deathly white, the awful veil had lifted, and the normal look was returning. Anything wrong? was all he could think of to say at the moment, when the answer was eloquent coming from such a woman. I felt cold and a little frightened, she whispered. He offered to close the door, but she seized hold of him and begged him not to leave her side for an instant. It's upstairs, I know, she whispered with an odd half-laugh, but I can't possibly go up. But Shorthouse thought otherwise, knowing that in action lay their best hope of self-control. He took the brandy flask and poured out a glass of neat spirit, stiff enough to help anybody over anything. She swallowed it with a little shiver. His only idea now was to get out of the house before her collapse became inevitable. But this could not be safely done by turning tail and running from the enemy. Inaction was no longer possible. Every minute he was growing less master of himself, and desperate, aggressive measures were imperative without further delay. Moreover, the actions to be taken toward the enemy, not away from it, the climax, if necessary and unavoidable, would have to be faced boldly. He could do it now, but in ten minutes he might not have the force left to act for himself, much less for both. Upstairs, the sounds were meanwhile becoming louder and closer, accompanied by the occasional creaking of the boards. Someone was moving stealthily about, stumbling now and then awkwardly against the furniture. Waiting a few moments to allow for the tremendous dose of spirit to produce its effect, and knowing this would last but a short time under the circumstances, Shorthouse then quietly got on his feet, and saying in a determined voice, Now Aunt Julia, we'll go upstairs and find out what this noise is all about. You must come too, it is what we agreed. He picked up his stick, and went to the cupboard for the candle. A limp form rose shakily beside him, breathing hard and he heard a voice say very faintly something about being ready to come. The woman's courage amazed him. It was so much greater than his own. Holding aloft the dripping candle, some subtle force exhaled from this trembling, white-faced old woman at his side that was the true source of his inspiration. It held something really great that shamed him and gave him the support without which he would have proved far less equal to the occasion. They crossed the dark landing, avoiding with their eyes the deep black space over the banisters. Then they began to mount the narrow staircase to meet the sounds which minute by minute grew louder and nearer. About halfway up the stairs Aunt Julia stumbled, and Shorthouse turned to catch her by the arm, and just at that moment there came a terrific crash in the servants' quarters overhead. It was instantly followed by a shrill, agonizing scream. There was a cry of terror, a cry of help melted into one. Before they could move aside or go down a single step, someone came rushing along the passage overhead, blundering horribly, racing madly at full speed, three steps at a time, down the very staircase which they stood. The steps were light and uncertain, but close behind them sounded the heavier tread of another person. The staircase seemed to shake. Shorthouse and his companion just had time to flatten themselves against the wall when the jumble of flying steps was upon them, and two persons, with the slightest possible interval between them, dashed past at full speed. It was a perfect whirlwind of sound breaking in upon the midnight silence of the empty building. The two runners, pursuer and pursued, had passed clean through them where they stood, and already with a thud the boards below received the first one, then the other. Yet they had seen absolutely nothing, not a hand, an arm, or a face, or even a shred of flying clothing. Then came a second's pause. Then the first one, the lighter of the two, obviously the pursued one, ran with uncertain footsteps into the little room which Shorthouse and his aunt just left. The heavier ones followed. There was a sound of scuffling, gasping, and smothered screaming. And then out onto the landing came the step of a single person treading weightily. A dead silence followed for the space of a half a minute, and then was heard a rushing sound through the air. It was followed by a dull, crashing thud in the depths of the house below, 
on the stone floor of the hall. Utter silence reigned after. Nothing moved. The flame of the candle was steady. It had been steady the whole time, and the air had been undisturbed by any movement whatsoever. Palsied with terror, Aunt Julia, without waiting for her companion, began fumbling her way downstairs. She was crying to herself. When Shorthouse put his arm around her and half carried her, he felt she was trembling like a leaf. He went into the little room, picked up the cloak from the floor, and arm in arm walked very slowly, without speaking a word or looking once behind them. They marched down the three flights of stairs into the hall. In the hall they saw nothing. But the whole way down the stairs they were conscious that someone followed them, step by step. When they went faster, it was left behind. When they went more slowly, it caught up. Never once did they look behind to see, and at each turning of the staircase they lowered their eyes for the fear of the following horror they might see on the stairs above. With trembling hands, Shorthouse opened the front door, and they walked out into the moonlight and drew a deep breath of the cool night air blowing in from the sea. This is the end of The Empty House by Algernon Blackwood. Recording by Scott W. Fields. Gloversville, New York, USA. www.scottwfields.com The Mass of Shadows by Anatole France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet. The Mass of Shadows by Anatole France. This tale, the Sacristan of the Church of saint Ulele at Neuville de Amont told me, as we sat under the arbor of the white horse, one fine summer evening, drinking a bottle of old wine to the health of the dead man, now very much at his ease, whom that very morning he had borne to the grave with full honors, beneath a pall powdered with smart silver tears. My poor father who is dead, it is the sacristan who is speaking, was in his lifetime a grave digger. He was of an agreeable disposition, the result, no doubt, of the calling he followed. For it often had been pointed out that people who work in cemeteries are of a jovial turn. Death has no terrors for them. They never give it a thought. I, for instance, Monsignor, enter a cemetery at night as little perturbed as though it were the arbor of the white horse. And if by chance I meet with a ghost, I don't disturb myself in the least about it, for I reflect that he may just as likely have business of his own to attend to as I. I know the habits of the dead, and I know their character. Indeed, so far as that goes, I know things of which the priests themselves are ignorant. If I were to tell you all I have seen, you would be astounded. But a still tongue makes a wise head, and my father, who all the same delighted in spinning a yarn, did not disclose a twentieth part of what he knew. To make up for this, he often repeated the same stories, and to my knowledge, he told the story of Catherine Fontaine at least a hundred times. Catherine Fontaine was an old maid who he well remembered having seen when he was a mere child. I should not be surprised if there were still, perhaps, three old fellows in the district who could remember having heard folks speak of her, for she was very well known and of excellent reputation, though poor enough. She lived at the corner of Rouenois in the turret which is still to be seen there, and of which formed part of the old half-ruined mansion looking out onto the garden of the Ursuline nuns. On that turret can still be traced certain figures and half-obliterated inscriptions. The late curé of saint Ulélie, Monsignor Levasseur, 
asserted that there are words in Latin, Love is stronger than death, which is to be understood, he would add, of divine love. Catherine Fontaine lived by herself in this tiny apartment. She was a lace maker. You know, of course, that the lace made in our part of the world was formerly held in high esteem. No one knew anything of her relatives or friends. It was reported that when she was 18 years of age, she had loved the young Chevalier de Amont Claret and had been secretly affianced to him. But decent folk didn't believe a word of it and said it was nothing but a tale concocted because Catherine Fontaine's demeanor was that of a lady rather than that of a working woman and because, moreover, she possessed beneath her white locks the remains of great beauty. Her expression was sorrowful, and on one finger she wore one of those rings fashioned by the goldsmith into the semblance of two tiny hands clasped together. In former days, folks were accustomed to exchange such rings at their betrothal ceremony. I'm sure you know the sort of thing I mean. Catherine Fontaine lived a saintly life. She spent a great deal of time in churches, and every morning, whether might be the weather, she went to assist at the six o'clock mass at saint Eulalie. Now, one December night, while she was in her little chamber, she was awakened by the sound of bells, and nothing doubting that they were ringing for the first mass, the pious woman dressed herself and came downstairs and out onto the street. The night was so obscure that not even the walls of the houses were visible, and not a ray of light shone from the murky sky. And such was the silence amid this black darkness that there was not even the sound of a distant dog barking, and a feeling of aloofness from every living creature was perceptible. But Catherine Fontaine knew well every single stone she stepped on, and as she could have found her way to the church with her eyes shut, she reached without difficulty the corner of the Rue des Anois and the Rue de la Paroisse, where the timbered house stands with the tree of Jesse carved on one of its massive beams. When she reached the spot, she perceived that the church doors were open and that a great light was streaming out from the wax tapers. She resumed her journey, and when she had passed through the porch, she found herself in the midst of a vast congregation which entirely filled the church. But she did not recognize any of the worshippers and was surprised to observe that all of these people were dressed in velvets and brocades with feathers in their hats and that they wore swords in the fashion of days gone by. Here were gentlemen who carried tall canes with gold knobs and ladies with lace caps fastened with cornet-shaped combs. Chivalry of the Order of St. Louis extended their hands to these ladies, who concealed behind their fans painted faces, of which only the powdered brow and the patch at the corner of the eye were visible. All of them proceeded to take their places without the slightest sound, and as they moved, neither the sound of their footsteps on the pavement nor the rustle of their garments could be heard. The lower places were filled with a crowd of young artisans in brown jackets, dimity breeches, and blue stockings, with their arms round the waist of pretty blushing girls who lowered their eyes. Near the holy water stoops, peasant women, in scarlet petticoats and laced bodices, sat upon the ground as immovable as domestic animals, whilst young lads, standing up behind them, stared out from wide eyes and twirled their hats round and round on their fingers, and all these sorrowful countenances seemed centered irremovably on one and the same thought, at once sweet and sorrowful. On her knees, in her accustomed place, Catherine Fontaine saw the priest advance towards the altar, preceded by two servers. She recognized neither priest nor clerks. The mass began. It was a silent mass, during which neither the sound of the moving lips nor the tinkle of the bell was audible. Catherine Fontaine felt that she was under the observation and the influence also of her mysterious neighbor, and when, 
scarcely turning her head, she stole a glance at him. She recognized the young Chevalier de Montclaret, who had once loved her, and who had been dead for five and forty years. She recognized him by a small mark which he had over the left ear, and above all by the shadow which his long black eyelashes cast upon his cheeks. He was dressed in his hunting clothes, scarlet with gold lace, the very clothes he wore that day when he met her in St. Leonard's Wood, begged of her a drink, and stole a kiss. He had preserved his youth and good looks. When he smiled, he'd still displayed magnificent teeth. Catherine said to him in an undertone, Monsignor, you who were my friend, and to whom in days gone by I gave all that a girl holds most dear, may God keep you in his grace. Oh, that he would at length inspire me with regret for the sin I committed in yielding to you. For it is a fact that, though my hair is white and I approach my end, I have not yet repented of having loved you. But, dear dead friend and noble seigneur, tell me, who are these folk, habited after the antique fashion, who are here assisting at this silent mass? The Chevalier de Montclaret replied in a voice feebler than a breath, but none the less crystal clear, Catherine, these men and women are souls from purgatory, who have grieved God by sinning, as we ourselves sinned, through love of the creature, but who are not on that account cast off by God, inasmuch as their sin, like ours, was not deliberate. Whilst separated from those whom they loved upon earth, they are purified in the cleansing fires of purgatory. They suffer the pangs of absence, which is for them the most cruel of tortures. They are so unhappy that an angel from heaven takes pity upon their love torment. By the permission of the Most High, for one hour in the night, he reunites each year lover to love in their parish church, where they are permitted to assist at the Mass of Shadows hand clasped in hand. These are the facts. If it has been granted to me to see thee before thy death, Catherine, it is a boon which is bestowed by God's special permission. And Catherine Fontaine answered him, I would die gladly enough, dear dead Lord, if I might recover the beauty that was mine when I gave you to drink in the forest. Whilst they thus conversed under their breath, a very old canon was taking the collection and pro-offering to the worshippers a great copper dish, wherein they let fall, each in his turn, ancient coins which have long since ceased to pass current. A coup of six livres, flore, doca and docatunes, jocabuses and rose nobla, and the pieces fell silently into the dish. When at length it was placed before the chevalier, he dropped into it a louis which made no more sound than the other pieces of gold and silver. When the old canon stopped before Catherine Fontaine, who fumbled in her pocket without being able to find a farthing, then being unwilling to allow the dish to pass without an offering from herself, she slipped from her finger the ring which the chevalier had given her the day before his death and cast it into the copper bowl. As the golden ring fell, a sound like a heavy clang of the bell rang out, and on the stroke of this reverberation, the chevalier, the canon, the celebrant, the servers, the ladies and their cavaliers, the whole assembly vanished utterly. The candles guttered out, and Catherine Fontaine was left alone in the darkness. Having concluded his narrative after this fashion, the sick Christian drank a long draught of wine, remained pensive for a moment, then resumed his talk in these words. I have told you this tale exactly as my father has told it to me over and over again, and I believe that it is authentic, because it agrees, in all respects, with what I have observed of the manners and customs peculiar to those who have passed away. 
I have associated a good deal with the dead ever since my childhood, and I know that they are accustomed to return to what they have loved. It is on this account that the miserly dead wander at night in the neighborhood of the treasures they conceal during their lifetime. They keep a strict watch over their gold, but the trouble they give themselves, far from being of service to them, turns to their disadvantage, and it is not a rare thing at all to come upon money buried in the ground on digging in a place haunted by a ghost. In the same way, deceased husbands come by night to harass their wives who have made a second matrimonial venture, and I could easily name several who have kept a better watch over their wives since death than they ever did while living. That sort of thing is blameworthy, for in all fairness the dead have no business to stir up jealousies. Still, I do but tell you what I have observed myself. It is a matter to take into account if one marries a widow. Besides, the tale I told you is vouchsafe for in the following manner. The morning after that extraordinary night, Catherine Fontaine was discovered dead in her chamber, and the beetle attached to saint Uleli, found in the copper bowl used for the collection a gold ring with two clasped hands. Besides, I'm not the kind of man to make jokes. Suppose we order another bottle of wine. End of The Mass of Shadows Recorded by Janet Marysville, Washington February 28, 2011The Apparition by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Longshanker The Apparition by Guy de Maupassant The subject of sequestration of the person came up in speaking of a recent lawsuit, and each of us had a story to tell. A true story, he said. We had been spending the evening together at an old family mansion in the Rue de Grenelle, just a party of intimate friends. The old Marquis de la Tour Samuel, who was eighty-two, rose and, leaning his elbow on the mantelpiece, said in his somewhat shaky voice, I also know of something strange, so strange that it has haunted me all my life. It is now fifty-six years since the incident occurred, and yet not a month passes that I do not see it again in a dream. So great is the impression of fear it has left on my mind. For ten minutes I experienced such horrible fright that ever since then a sort of constant terror has remained with me. Sudden noises startle me violently, and objects imperfectly distinguished at night inspire me with a mad desire to flee from them. In short, I am afraid of the dark. But I would not have acknowledged that before I reached my present age. Now I can say anything. I have never receded before real danger, ladies. It is therefore permissible, at eighty-two years of age, not to be brave in presence of imaginary danger. That affair so completely upset me, caused me such deep and mysterious and terrible distress, that I never spoke of it to anyone. I will now tell it to you exactly as it happened, without any attempt at explanation. In July 1827, I was stationed at Rouen. One day, as I was walking along the quay, I met a man whom I thought I recognised without being able to recall exactly who he was. Instinctively, I made a movement to stop. The stranger perceived it and at once extended his hand. He was a friend to whom I had been deeply attached as a youth. For five years I had not seen him. He seemed to have aged half a century. His hair was quite white and he walked bent over as though completely exhausted. He apparently understood my surprise, and he told me of the misfortune which had shattered his life. Having fallen madly in love with a young girl, he had married her, but after a year of more than earthly happiness, she died suddenly of an affection of the heart. He left his country home on the very day of her burial, and came to his town house in Rouen, where he lived alone and unhappy, so sad and wretched that he thought constantly of suicide. Since I have found you again in this manner, he said, I will ask you to render me an important service. It is to go and get me out of the desk in my bedroom, our bedroom, 
some papers of which I have an urgent need. I cannot send a servant or a business clerk, as discretion and absolute silence are necessary. As for myself, nothing on earth would induce me to re-enter that house. I will give you the key of the room which I myself locked on leaving, and the key of my desk. Also, a few words for my gardener, telling him to open the chateau for you. But come and breakfast with me tomorrow, and we will arrange all that. I promised to do him this, this slight favour he asked. It was, for that matter, only a ride which I could make in an hour on horseback, his property being but a few miles distant from Rouen. At ten o'clock the following day I breakfasted tete-a-tete -tete with my friend, but he scarcely spoke. He begged me to pardon him. The thought of the visit I was about to make to that room, the scene of his dead happiness, overcame him, he said. He indeed seemed singularly agitated and preoccupied, as though undergoing some mysterious mental struggle. At length, he explained to me exactly what I had to do. It was very simple. I must take two packages of letters and a roll of papers from the first right-hand drawer of the desk, of which I had the key. He added, I need not beg you to refrain from glancing at them. I was wounded at that remark and told him so somewhat sharply. He stammered, Forgive me, I suffer so, and tears came to his eyes. At about one o'clock I took leave of him to accomplish my mission. The weather was glorious and I trotted across the fields listening to the song of the larks and the rhythmical clang of my sword against my boot. Then I entered the forest and walked my horse. Branches of trees caressed my face as I passed and now and then I caught a leaf of my teeth and chewed it from sheer gladness of heart at being alive and vigorous on such a radiant day. As I approached the chateau I took from my pocket the letter I had for the gardener and was astonished at finding it sealed. I was so irritated that I was about to turn back without having fulfilled my promise, but reflected that I should thereby display undue susceptibility. My friend in his troubled condition might easily have fastened the envelope without noticing that he had did so. The manor looked as if it had been abandoned for twenty years. The open gate was falling from its hinges, the walks were overgrown with grass, and the flower beds were no longer distinguishable. The noise I made by kicking at a shutter brought out an old man from a side door. He seemed stunned with astonishment at seeing me. On receiving my letter, he read it, re-read it, turned it over and over, looked me up and down, put the paper in his pocket, and finally said, Well, what is it you wish? I replied shortly, You ought to know since you have just read your master's orders. I wish to enter the chateau. He seemed overcome. Then you are going in, into her room? I began to lose patience. Damn it! Are you presuming to question me? He stammered in confusion. No, sir, but... But it has not been opened since... Since the death. If you will be kind enough to wait five minutes, I will go and see if... I interrupted him angrily. See here, what do you mean by your tricks? You know very well you cannot enter the room since here is the key. He no longer objected. Then, sir, I will show you the way. Show me the staircase and leave me. I'll find my way without you. But, sir, indeed, this time I lost patience and pushed him aside, went into the house. I first went through the kitchen, then two rooms occupied by this man and his wife. I then crossed a large hall, mounted a staircase, and recognized the door described by my friend. I easily opened it and entered the apartment. It was so dark that at first I could distinguish nothing. I stopped short, disagreeably affected by that disagreeable, musty odour of closed, unoccupied rooms. As my eyes slowly became accustomed to the darkness, I saw plainly enough a large and disordered bedroom. The bed without sheets, but still retaining its mattresses and pillows, on one of which was a deep impression, as though an elbow or a head had recently rested there. The chairs all seemed out of place. I noticed that a door, doubtless that of a closet, had remained half open. I first went to the window which I opened to let in the light, but the fastenings of the shutter had grown so rusty that I could not move them. I even tried to break them with my sword, but without success. As I was growing irritated over my useless efforts, and could now see fairly well in the semi-darkness, I gave up the hope of getting more light and went over to the writing desk. I seated myself in an armchair, and letting down the lid of the desk, 
I opened the drawer designated. It was full to the top. I needed but three packages, which I knew how to recognise, and began searching for them. I was straining my eyes in the effort to read the superscriptions when I seemed to hear, or rather feel, something rustle at the back of me. I paid no attention, believing that a draught from the window was moving some drapery. But in a minute or so, another movement, almost imperceptible, sent a strangely disagreeable little shiver over my skin. It was so stupid to be affected, even slightly, that self-respect prevented my turning around. I had just found the second package I needed and was about to lay my hand in the third, when a long and painful sigh uttered just at my shoulder made me bound like a madman from my seat and land several feet off. As I jumped, I had turned round my hand on the hilt of my sword, and truly, if I had not felt it at my side, I should have taken to my heels like a coward. A tall woman dressed in white stood gazing at me from the back of the chair where I had been sitting an instant before. Such a shudder ran through all my limbs that I nearly fell backward. No one who has not experienced it can understand that frightful, unreasoning terror. The mind becomes vague, the heart ceases to beat, the entire body grows as limp as a sponge. I do not believe in ghosts. Nevertheless, I collapsed from a hideous dread of the dead, and I suffered. Oh, I suffered in a few moments more than in all the rest of my life from the irresistible terror of the supernatural. If she had not spoken, I should have died perhaps. But she spoke. She spoke in a sweet, sad voice that set my nerves vibrating. I dare not say that I became master of myself and recovered my reason. No, I was terrified and scarcely knew what I was doing. But a certain innate pride, a remnant of soldierly instinct, made me, almost in spite of myself, maintain a bold front. She said, Oh, sir, you can render me a great service. I wanted to reply, but it was impossible for me to pronounce a word. Only a vague sound came from my throat. She continued, Will you? You can save me, cure me. I suffer frightfully. I suffer. Oh, how I suffer. And she slowly seated herself in my armchair, still looking at me. Will you? she said. I nodded in assent, my voice still being paralysed. Then she held out to me a tortoise-shell comb and murmured, Comb my hair. Oh, comb my hair, that will cure me. It must be combed. Look at my head, how I suffer, and my hair pulls so. Her hair unbound, very long and very black, it seemed to me, hung over the back of the armchair and touched the floor. Why did I promise? Why did I take that comb with a shudder? And why did I hold in my hands her long black hair that gave my skin a frightful, cold sensation, as though I were handling snakes? I cannot tell. That sensation has remained in my fingers, and I still tremble in recalling it. I combed her hair. I handled, I know not how, those icy locks. I twisted, knotted and unknotted, and braided them. She sighed, bowed her head, seemed happy. Suddenly she said, Thank you, snatched the comb from my hands, and fled by the door that I had noticed ajar. Left alone, I experienced for several seconds the horrible agitation of one who awakens from a nightmare. At length I regained my senses, I ran to the window, and with a mighty effort burst open the shutters, letting a flood of light into the room. Immediately I sprang to the door by which that being had departed. I found it closed and immovable. Then the mad desire to flee overcame me like a panic, the panic which soldiers know in battle. I seized the three packets of letters on the open desk, ran from the room, dashed down the stairs four steps at a time, found myself outside, I know not how, and, perceiving my horse a few steps off, leapt into the saddle and galloped away. I stopped only when I reached Rouen and alighted at my lodgings. Throwing the reins to my orderly, I fled to my room and shut myself in to reflect. For an hour I anxiously asked myself if I were not the victim of a hallucination. 
Undoubtedly, I had had one of those incomprehensible nervous attacks, those exaltations of mind that give rise to visions and are the stronghold of the supernatural. And I was about to believe I had seen a vision, had a hallucination, when, as I approached the window, my eyes fell, by chance, upon my breast. My military cape was covered with long black hairs. One by one, with trembling fingers, I plucked them off and threw them away. I then called my orderly. I was too disturbed, too upset to go and see my friend that day, and I also wished to reflect more fully upon what I ought to tell him. I sent him his letters for which he gave the soldier a receipt. He asked after me most particularly, and, on being told I was ill, had had a sunstroke, appeared exceedingly anxious. Next morning I went to him, determined to tell him the truth. He had gone out the evening before and had not yet returned. I called again during the day. My friend was still absent. After waiting a week longer without news of him, I notified the authorities, and a judicial research was instituted. Not the slightest trace of his whereabouts or manner of disappearance was discovered. A minute inspection of the abandoned chateau revealed nothing of a suspicious character. There was no indication that a woman had been concealed there. After fruitless researches, all further efforts were abandoned, and for fifty-six years I have heard nothing. I know no more than before. End of the Apparition Recording by Longshanker, Ayrshire, Scotland The Wrong Door by W. C. Morrow. This is a LibriVox recording. All of the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett. The Wrong Door by W. C. Morrow. My condition at last became alarming, and I was afraid of myself. The cause of it, ah, that was something. Had it been a matter which an honorable man might discuss with a friend, I could have had the healing consolation of sympathy. But at the very core of my affliction lay the obligation of silence. Let us suppose a case. Once there was a very beautiful woman, married happily, and a mother. Her husband had a friend, a man of the world. This man discovered in his friend's wife an accumulation of all womanly graces. He saw in her the ideal woman in all the world the only one he could have loved and courted, fought for, and died for. Yet she was wholly inaccessible, even in dreams. She was as good as she was beautiful, as true as she was winsome. Even had she not been so, his hands were tied by loyalty to his friend. Some of you will laugh at that. Well, if a man's honor fails him in one direction, I will not trust it in another. For a man is a whole remainder after subtracting all his evil from his good. But the flesh is weak. That is the villain's only plea for mercy. The friend could not conceal it from his wife. Could not. I must be careful in my choice of words. Is there anything in the line of right that a man cannot do in such a case? The world is wide. He could have gone away. But she was so beautiful and winsome nor, as he had not declared himself, could she presume to send him away. He thought he saw in her eyes something of pity, something of warning, something of everything. The suffering wore him out. But I must return to the beginning and resume my story. I was much prostrated in mind and flesh, and the services of a skillful physician were eminently needed. With that idea I went to see a famous man, Dr. Brownell, a specialist in matters of the nerves. It may be thought a little peculiar that I went to consult this particular man, but it must be considered that besides being a very skillful physician, he was my friend. There might have been certain reasons why I should not consult him, but we need not discuss them now. His wife was a beautiful woman, and I knew her well, but what in the world has this to do with my visit to her husband? Brownell was a peculiar man. Though he was the best friend I ever had, there was not a very close intimacy between us, and yet I was nearer to him than was any other of his friends. He was much older than his wife. A kind heart, 
given force and direction by great wealth, had been exercised by him in my behalf with so intelligent purpose that I was become a man of little importance in the community. The physician lived in a fine old house of great size. Not all of it was occupied. He was a tireless collector of curiosities, and had expended a fortune in that pursuit. Few of these were ever shown to his friends, and he never spoke of them, but kept them in out-of-the-way places in the great establishment. He was a reticent man, and many feared him, but I saw in him nothing but goodness and a marvelous skill. So it was upon Dr. Brownell that I called formally as a patient. His office was on the main floor of the house, and consisted of two rooms, a handsomely fitted reception room, and back of it one in which his patients consulted him. Both were very large. Although I had called and visited very often at his house, I had never been in his office before. When I entered, he was just ready to go out, but he welcomed me with his old-time cordiality. "'Why, I am glad to see you,' he said, taking my hand. This is the first time you have honored my office with a call. Come in and rest a while. You surely haven't come to see me professionally. He looked closely at me as he asked the question. Yes, I replied, I fear I am in rather a bad way. His face showed much concern. You do look a little shaken, said he, removing one of his gloves. Then he began, in a deliberate fashion, to make a scientific inquiry into my case. While he was occupied thus, a messenger, all out of breath, arrived to call him to a case of great urgency. Dr. Brownell, seeing the need to hurry, asked me if I could come as well on the following day. Of course I released him. He hurried away, saying, "'I am very sorry to leave you, but it can't be helped. Step into the house and see Mrs. Brownell. I am sure she will be glad to see you. Go through that door. It is the nearest way. You will find the hall a little dark.' but go straight ahead and you will be all right then he hurried away and in a moment was gone i went to the door which i understood him to have pointed out it was in the consultation room i discovered that there were two doors close together i selected the left hand one i turned the knob and pulled the door open the hall beyond appeared to be quite dark but i remembered what he had said about that and i felt safe I stepped into the hall, and instantly the door, which was a heavy affair, made of oak, closed upon me, pushing me out of its way into the hall. Then I discovered that I was in absolute darkness, although there was a bright day without. Nevertheless, recalling Brownell's instruction, I went ahead with much confidence. Suddenly, to my infinite amazement, the ground seemed to open, and I plunged headlong downward into a suffocating darkness, at every instant striking cruelly upon hidden obstacles along the way. At last, after having taken what seemed to be a great flight, I came heavily to a stone floor where the darkness was as dense as ever before I fell. Fright was my first sensation, and indignation my next, for was it not likely that Brownell had played some ugly trick upon me? I sat perfectly still for a little while, doing much wondering. There was nowhere the smallest glimmer of light. The darkness was ponderable and terrifying. With it was a silence so vast that the ordinary roaring in my ears became an obtrusive presence. A little reason at last found exercise in my disordered faculties. I reflected that the abyss into which I had fallen was an unguarded flight of stairs into which I had walked in the darkness. A cautious hand survey verified the belief, for there I lay at the bottom of the stairs. A moment later I remembered that I had noticed two doors, one beside the other. It was very clear that I had made a mistake by choosing a door leading to the cellar. It was then no serious matter at all, and I laughed at myself for my terror. All that was necessary was to ascend the flight, open the door, and emerge by the other. Without any waste of time I went about putting this plan into use, but when I had clambered up the stairs and found the door, I discovered that I was securely locked within this dismal place. There was no knob on the inside at all. My first intention was to get relief by knocking on the door, but there quickly arose two reasons why I should not. No one was within, and besides, even if I should summon attention, how could I explain my ridiculous plight? My clothing had been torn by my fall, and I knew by the token of a warm sticky sensation about my face and neck that I had been hurt and was bleeding freely. 
I was satisfied there must be some way of escape from the cellar without alarming the household, and, though my prison was darker than night, I determined to exhaust this resource before trying the other. Accordingly I descended the stairs, and by keeping my hands on one of the walls began to creep forward, with a careful guard upon the possibility of another flight of stairs. Presently I found a turn in the passage and followed it on. Then I came to a transverse passage and was in doubt which way to turn. Meanwhile the darkness did not relax in the smallest way, and absolute silence packed my environment. I turned to the right, and in that direction not far away I saw an exceedingly thin line of light, which I surmised issued from the bottom of a door. I went toward this, and was about to put my hand upon the door when it occurred to me that caution sometimes was a valuable exercise. Thereupon I knelt and examined the line of light more closely, and it was somewhat disheartening to discover that the light, instead of being white, was yellow. In other words, it was gaslight, and not daylight, that shone beyond the door. While thus I knelt, I thought I heard a certain scurrying within. It was a sound not very unlike that which I had heard in the dark passage, and which I had mistaken for automatic aberrations of my hearing sense. Now the same sound gave me a certain depressing feeling of insecurity, as though a malign mystery, suited to this uncanny place, was preparing a grotesque and perhaps dangerous reception for me. Should I abandon this enterprise and seek another door? There was danger that I might not find this one again. Indeed, was there anything to fear? Surely my conscience... I gently pushed open the door. It did not open. I found a keyhole and peered through it. A curious large hall seemed to be beyond, lighted faintly, and I thought I saw the shadowy form of a woman float across the field of vision. Just above the keyhole I found a knob. I turned it, and instantly the door flew open, pulling me violently with it, and, before the instinctive movement to seize upon a support and hold it securely permitted me to take my grasp from the knob, I found myself wholly at the mercy of unresisted gravitation, flying undoubtedly downward, if reason is to be accepted, but in all other directions as well, if my feelings had been the ground of judgment. But this time, instead of falling upon a cold stone floor, I alighted on a deliciously soft carpet of the thickest and finest rugs, and for that matter the distance which I had fallen was in reality quite small. Upon looking I found myself in the strangest place it was ever my fortune to see, but before I describe it I must say something in explanation of my unaccountable flight through the air. The floor of this hull was sunk a few feet below the level of the passage by which I had approached, and down from the floor led a flight of stone steps, which the pulling of the door had made me to clear as I fell. I had thought that someone was concealed behind the door, and pulled it open quickly when I turned the knob, but upon looking I saw no one, and I must believe that, for some reason which I shall not attempt to explore, the conduct of the door was guided by a powerful spring. There was no time for any intelligent kind of thinking, for, besides being in a large hall of extraordinary appearance, I found myself in a company of the most astonishing people. The walls were covered with curious things from every corner of the world. The roof was perforated with openings, representing stars, animals, angels, demons, and other things. These openings were covered with colored glass of every shade, and above all was the light, which shone through the grotesque openings, and filled the room with a soft yellow radiance. The light was too faint for a fine definition of features, and so I could not then have said that I knew any of the persons present. They were all on the opposite side of the room, and every one of them was looking at me. Some were sitting, others standing, and all were upon an elevated platform which ran around the room. This platform was raised not more than eight inches above the floor. I scrambled to my feet and looked around upon them, of course expecting that I should be spoken to. But not a word was said and not a movement was made. The whole circumstance was so extraordinary and the silence and immovability of the assembled people so impressive that a strange tingling feeling which all who have been frightened know the nature of, crept up my face and into my hair, and my heart beat with what seemed to be so strong a torsional force that it twisted a sharp pain out of its function. I made an essay of speech. This, I said, 
indignation arising with the emergence of courage, may be a very amusing pastime for you, but I have it that you are putting a very gross indignity upon me. If Dr. Brownell is in this distinguished company, I would like him to hear me say that I resent being made the victim of this boyish prank for the edification of spectators invited to enjoy my discomfiture, and that I propose, without any loss of time, to give my resentment such form and character as will cause it to have a disagreeable permanency in his recollection. This wide-winged and rather silly threat might as well have been spoken to the red dragons and green angels in the ceiling, for not a word or movement did it elicit. I found it easy to speak but my voice sounded as though it had come from someone else to me alone, and that made me uncertain that I had spoken at all. But a quickening anger was straining its leash within me, and I made no effort to control it. A sense of outrage, shame, and indignation swept over me. There were things I would not bear. At this moment Brownell's individuality emerged from the dim shadows of the company, and I walked straight up to him. He looked at me steadily as I approached, the old, good-natured, half-quizzical expression that I knew so well sitting upon his face. I had approached him very near, when an indefinable, violent sensation seized upon me, and held me from further advance. Likely it was as much dread as terror, but whatever it was, there I stood grown to the floor, staring in dismay at this silent and motionless man with the quizzical expression. Quite near me was an old man sitting on a chair, his hand resting on a heavy stick. I seized the stick and tried to wrench it from his grasp, intending to brain Brownell with it, but think what must have been my horror to see the old man's arm come away from his body with the stick, the hand still retaining its hold. I threw the stick away with a shudder and went up closer to Brownell. I caught him by the shoulders and shook him with such violence that his head rolled on the floor at my feet. Then the truth burst through the envelope of my vast and inconceivable stupidity. Not all stupidity, for another affliction beset me. These were all wax figures. I had stumbled into one of those queer nooks in Brownell's house, where some of his treasures were stored, and where, in these uncanny ways, he enjoyed himself alone. The reaction from this discovery was peculiar. At first I laughed but my laughter became so loud and furious that I saw it was hysteria, and then I had trouble to check it. My head was splitting, and my throat was cracked and burning. Pains of various kinds found employment in torturing me, and they were pains to which I was in no wise accustomed. Therefore it was necessary that I make haste to escape from this almost unearthly place. The silence and apparent intelligent immobility of the wax figures were more than depressing. I began to fear, indeed, that, after all, they would take on life and present some new form of suffering for my torture. At the end of the hall was a wide door draped with a portiere. From where I stood I could see the white satin of a woman's skirt just behind the portiere on one side. Evidently no light entered that room except the weak, diffused light of the demons and angels in the room where I was standing, and hence it was much darker beyond the portieres but after looking around I saw that if there was any escape, except by the way I had come, it must be through the room in which stood the woman in satin. Yet I feared to enter that room. The dim light, the woman behind the portiere, it all looked mysterious and dread-lurking. It was evident that the woman stood, as did the others, on a platform, but was that sufficient upon which to construct a belief that she too was wax? and would it not be all the better if she were flesh and blood? Assuredly, for that meant deliverance. I went, without further thinking, to the portiere, and passed within the room, having an unaccountable care that I did not pass too near the woman in satin. I went into the room, and looked around for a door. None could I find. My gaze fell upon the woman whose skirt I had seen, and then came upon me the very heaviest blow of all in that day of miseries, for there, before me, beautiful and radiant, embodiment of all the finest graces of womankind, unspeakably winsome, and in all possible ways the loveliest woman under the sun, stood the physician's wife. If only it had been she, indeed, instead of an artful wax counterfeit. I stood and admired her to my heart's content, and then I looked another way and continued my search for the door. 
In what way soever I turned, I felt that the soft blue eyes of this enchanting figure were upon me. This gave me a certain fear, the meaning of which, beyond a consciousness of extreme nervous irritation, I was not able to understand. My disorder began to take on an exhilaration much like that which comes from hashish, imparting a quickening power to my senses and a keen edge to my imagination. A feeling of happy confidence and lively enthusiasm struck off the angles of the fear which formerly had depressed me, and I became bold, valiant, and adventurous. What an inspiring effect even the wax image of a beautiful woman may have on a man! I again looked at the figure in satin. Could I have been in error? Was it possible that a wax figure could be caught stealing a quick glance at me, and suppressing a delicious smile? Was this a new Galatea, ready to step from her pedestal and be my devoted slave? A great hope, so wild that I dared not give it too generous entertainment, leaped up from my heart. Fool or madman, which was I? Though the whole world might be consumed with love of her, she would remain steadfast in the way of a wife forever. It was wholly impossible that she should choose this astounding way of letting me know that the one secret of my life had slipped away from me and had been welcomed into her own life. I gazed upon her, filled with awe. Her head slowly turned, her glorious eyes rested full upon my face, and the sweetest smile that I had ever seen on her beautiful face saturated all my sensibilities with inconceivable delights. There was a meaning in that look and smile that I had never seen before, and the light that shone through it was a welcome to me. I went closer to her, my feet winged with joy. The smile beckoned, the glance was a reassurance. "'Alice!' I cried. "'I have waited for you long,' she answered. "'And there can be no music on earth so sweet as those words.' I caught her in my arms and drew her to my breast, nearly crushing her. I looked up into her face, and she looked down into mine. I drew her from the pedestal. All at once a look of horror came into her face. "'You are bloody!' she cried. "'It is nothing,' I protested. The look of horror became one of terror. "'Oh!' she said. "'There is blood on your face, and villainy in your heart. So this is how you would betray your best friend and wreck my life.' I will save him and you. With that I saw something bright and keen glitter a moment in her hand, and in an instant a thing cold and sharp slipped between the ribs of my breast. I choked. A blindness assailed me, and I felt myself going all at large to the floor. Dr. Brownell was sitting beside me in a room of his house, and I was lying in bed with a feeling of great weakness. He saw that I was watching him, he arose and stood over me, and his face showed much relief. "'You are all right now, aren't you, old fellow?' How kind his voice was. "'Yes.' I felt no pain in my breast, but feebly I put up my hand. "'Is the wound dangerous?' I asked. "'What wound?' I made no reply. "'The only wound you had was a slight abrasion of the scalp, and that has been cured a week.' I dared not ask any more questions. Alice came in to see you this morning and left these flowers for you. I told her I thought you would be all right today, and she will come to see you as soon as I send her word. By the way, old man, that was a curious mistake you made in getting among my wax figures. We found you unconscious there. In your delirium you must have developed a strong dislike of the figures of Alice and me, as you completely demolished them. End of The Wrong Door by W. C. Morrow A Spectral Collie by Elia Wilkinson Petey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Spectral Collie by Elia Wilkinson Petey. Read by Michelle Chevalier, a.k.a. Beagle Mixtape. A Spectral Collie William Percy Cecil happened to be a younger son, so he left home, which was England, 
and went to Kansas to ranch it. Thousands of younger sons do the same, only their destination is not invariably Kansas. An agent at Wichita picked out Cecil's farm for him and sent the deeds over to England before Cecil left. He said there was a house on the place. So Cecil's mother fitted him out for America, just as she had fitted out another superfluous boy for Africa, and parted from him with the heroic front and big agonies of Mother Ache which she kept to herself. The boy bore up the way a man of his blood ought, but when he went out to the kennel to see Nita, his collie, he went to pieces somehow, and rolled on the grass with her in his arms, and wept like a booby. But the remarkable part of it was that Nita wept too, big, hot dog tears, which her master wiped away. When he went off she howled like a hungry baby, and had to be switched before she would give anyone a night's sleep. When Cecil got over on his Kansas place, he fitted up the shack as cozily as he could, and learned how to fry bacon and make soda biscuits. Incidentally, he did farming, and sunk a heap of money finding out how not to do things. Meantime, the Americans laughed at him, and were inclined to turn the cold shoulder, and his compatriots, of whom there were a number in the county, did not prove to his liking. They consoled themselves for their exiled state in fashions not keeping with Cecil's traditions. His homesickness went deeper than theirs, perhaps, and American whiskey could not make up for the loss of his English home, nor flirtations with the gay American village girls quite compensate him for the loss of his English mother. So he kept to himself and had nostalgia as some men have consumption. At length the loneliness got so bad that he had to see some living thing from home, or make a flunk of it and go back like a crybaby. He had a stiff pride still, though he sobbed himself to sleep more than one night, as many a pioneer has done before him. So he wrote home for Nita, the collie, and got word that she would be sent. Arrangements were made for her care all along the line, and she was properly boxed and shipped. As the time drew near for her arrival, Cecil could hardly eat. He was too excited to apply himself to anything. The day of her expected arrival, he actually got up at five o'clock to clean the house and make it look as fine as possible for her inspection. Then he hitched up and drove fifteen miles to get her. The train pulled out just as before he reached the station, so Nita in her box was waiting for him on the platform. He could see her in a queer way, as one sees the purple center of a revolving circle of light, for, to tell the truth, with the long ride in the morning sun and the beating of his heart, Cecil was only about half conscious of anything. He wanted to yell, but he didn't. He kept himself in hand and lifted up the sliding side of the box and called to Nita, and she came out. But it wasn't the man who fainted, though he might have done so, being crazy homesick as he was, and half-fed and overworked while he was yet soft from an easy life. No, it was the dog. She looked at her master's face, gave one cry of inexpressible joy, and fell over in a real feminine sort of a faint, and had to be brought to like any other lady, with camphor and water and a few drops of spirit down her throat. Then Cecil got up on the wagon seat, and she sat beside him with her head on his arm, and they rode home in absolute silence, each feeling too much for speech. After they reached home, however, Cecil showed her all over the place, and she barked out her ideas in glad sociability. After that, Cecil and Nita were inseparable. She walked beside him all day when he was out with the cultivator, or when he was mowing or reaping. She ate beside him at table, and slept across his feet at night. Evenings when he looked over the graphic from home, or read the books his mother sent him, that he might keep in touch with the world, Nita was beside him, patient but jealous. Then, when he threw his book or paper down, and took her on his knee and looked into her pretty eyes, or frolicked with her, she fairly laughed with delight. In short, she was faithful with that faith of which only a dog is capable, that unquestioning faith to which even the most loving women never quite attain. However, fate was annoyed at this perfect friendship. It didn't give her enough to do, and fate is a restless thing with a horrible appetite for variety. So poor Nita died one day mysteriously and gave her last look to Cecil as a matter of course, and he held her paws till the last moment, 
as a staunch friend should, and laid her away decently in a pine box in the cornfield, where he could be shielded from public view, if he chose to go there now and then, and sit beside her grave. He went to bed very lonely indeed the first night. The shack seemed to him to be removed endless miles from the other habitations of men. He seemed cut off from the world, and ached to hear the cheerful little barks which Nita had been in the habit of giving him by way of saying good night. Her amiable eye, with its friendly light, was missing. The gay wag of her tail was gone. All her ridiculous ways, at which he was never tired of laughing, were things of the past. He lay down, busy with these thoughts, yet so habituated to Nita's presence, that when her weight rested upon his feet, as usual, he felt no surprise. But after a moment it came to him that, as she was dead, the weight he felt upon his feet could not be hers. And yet there it was, warm and comfortable, cuddling down in the familiar way. He actually sat up and put his hand down to the foot of the bed to discover what was there. But there was nothing there, save the weight. And that stayed with him that night and many nights after. It happened that Cecil was a fool, as men will be when they are young, and he worked too hard and didn't take proper care of himself, and so it came about that he fell sick with a low fever. He struggled around for a few days, trying to work it off, but one morning he awoke only to the consciousness of absurd dreams. He seemed to be on the sea, sailing for home, and the boat was tossing and pitching in a weary circle and could make no headway. His heart was burning with impatience, but the boat went round and round in that endless circle till he shrieked out with agony. The next neighbors were the tailors, who lived two miles and a half away. They were awakened that morning by the howling of a dog before their door. It was a hideous sound and would give them no peace. So Charlie Taylor got up and opened the door, discovering there an excited little collie. "'Why, Tom,' he called, "'I thought Cecil's collie was dead.' "'She is,' called back Tom. "'No, she ain't neither, for here she is, shaking like an aspen and a begging me to go with her. Come out, Tom, and see.' It was Nita, no denying, and the men, perplexed, followed her to Cecil's shack, where they found him babbling. But that was the last of her. Cecil said he never felt her on his feet again. She had performed her final service for him, he said. The neighbors tried to laugh at the story at first, but they knew the tailors wouldn't take the trouble to lie, and as for Cecil, no one would have ventured to chaff him. End of A Spectral Collie by Elia Wilkinson Peaty The Caller in the Night by Burton Klein This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett The Caller in the Night by Burton Klein By the side of a road which wanders in company of a stream across a region of Pennsylvania farmland that is called Paradise because of its beauty, you may still mark the ruins of a small brick cabin in the depths of a grove. In summer time, ivy drapes its jagged fragments, and the pile might be lost to notice, but that at dusk the trembling leaves of the vine have a way of whispering to the nerves of your horse, and setting them too in a tremble. And the people in the village beyond have a belief that three troubled human beings lie buried under those ruins, and that at night, or in a storm, they sometimes cry aloud in their unrest. The village is Bustlebury, and its people have a legend that on a memorable night there was once disclosed to a former inhabitant the secret of that ivied sepulchre. All the afternoon the two young women had chattered in the parlor, cooled by the shade of the portico, and lost to the heat of the day, to the few sounds of the village, to the passing hours themselves. Then of a sudden Mrs. Pollard was recalled to herself at the necessity of closing her front windows against a gust of wind that blew the curtains, like flapping flags, into the room. "'Sally, we're going to get it again,' she said, pausing for a glance at the horizon before she lowered the sash. "'Get what?' Her visitor walked to the other front window and stooped to peer out. Early evening clouds were drawing a black cap over the fair face of the land. I think we're going to have some more of old Screamer Mole this evening. I knew we should, after this hot— There, Margie, that was the expression I've been trying to remember all afternoon. 
You used it this morning. Where did you get such a poetic nickname for a thunder? Oh. For a second, noon had returned to the two women. From their feet, two long streaks of black shadow darted back into the room and vanished. Overhead, an octopus of lightning snatched the whole heavens in its grasp, shook them, and disappeared. The two women screamed and threw themselves on the sofa. Yet in a minute it was clear that the world still rolled on, and each looked at the other and laughed at her fright, till the prospect of an evening of storm sobered them both. Mercy, Mrs. Pollard breathed in discouragement. We're in for another night of it. We've had this sort of thing for a week, and tonight, of all nights, when I wanted you to see this wonderful country under the moon. Mrs. Pollard, followed by her guest, Mrs. Reeves, ventured to the window timidly again, to challenge what part of the sky they could see from under the great portico outside, and learn its portent for the night. An evil visage it wore, a swift change from a noonday of beaming calm. Now it was curtained completely with the blue-black cloud, which sent out mutterings, and then long brooding silences more ominous still, in their very concealment of the night's intentions. There was no defense against it but to draw down the blinds and shut out this angry gloom in the glow of the lamps within and, with a half-hour of such glow to cause in them, the two women were soon merry again over their reminiscences, Mrs. Pollard at her embroidery, Mrs. Reeves at the piano, strumming something from Chopin in the intervals of their chatter. The girl fetched them their tea. Five already. Mrs. Pollard verified the punctuality of her servant with a glance at the clock. Then John will be away for another night. I do hope he won't try to get back this time. Night before last he left his assistant with a case, and raced his horse ten miles in the dead of the night to get home, Mrs. Pollard proudly reported, for fear I'd be afraid in the storm. And married four years, Mrs. Reeve smilingly shook her head in indulgence of such long-lived romance. In the midst of their cakes and tea the bell announced an impatient hand at the door. Well, speak of angels, Mrs. Pollard quoted, and flew to greet her husband but she opened the door upon smiling old Mr. Barber instead, from the precincts across the village street. Mr. Barber seemed to be embarrassed. I—I I rather thought you might be wanting something, he said in words. By intention he was making apology for the night. I saw the doctor drive away, but I haven't seen him come back, so I—I I thought I'd just run over and see—see see if there wasn't something you wanted, he laughed uneasily. Mr. Barber's transparent diplomacy having been rewarded with tea, they all came at once to direct speech. "'It ain't going to amount to much,' Mr. Barber insisted. "'Better come out, you ladies, and have a look around. It may rain a bit, but you'll feel easier if you come and get acquainted with things, so to say.' And gathering their resolution, the two women followed him out onto the portico. They shuddered at what they saw. Night was at hand, two hours before its time. Nothing stirred. Not a vocal cord of hungry, puzzled, frightened chicken or cow. The whole region seemed to have caught its breath, to be smothered under a pall of stillness, unbroken except for some occasional distant earthquake of thunder from the inverted Switzerland of cloud that hung pendant from the sky. Mr. Barber's emotions finally ordered themselves into speech as he watched. "'Ain't it grand?' he said. The two women made no reply. They sat on the steps to the portico, their arms entwined. The scene beat their more sophisticated intelligences back into silence. Some minutes they all sat there together, and then again Mr. Barber broke the spell. It do look fearful like, but you needn't be afraid. It's better to be friends with it, you might say, and then go to bed and forget it. They thanked him for his goodness, bade him good-bye, and he clinked down the flags of the walk and started across the street. He got midway across when they all heard a startling sound, an unearthly cry. It came out of the distance, and struck the stillness like a blow. "'What is it? What is it, Margie?' Mrs. Reeves whispered excitedly. Faint and quavering at its beginning, the cry grew louder and more shrill, and then died away, as the breath that made it ebbed and was spent. It seemed as if this unusual night had found at last a voice suited to its mood. Twice the cry was given, and then all was still as before. At its first notes the muscles in Mrs. Pollard's arm had tightened, but Mr. Barber had hastened back at once with reassurance. "'I guess Mrs. Pollard knows what that is,' he called to them from the gate. 
It's only our old friend Mole that lives down there in the notch. She gets lonesome every thunderstorm and lets it off like that. It's only her rheumatiz, I reckon. We wouldn't feel easy ourselves without them few kind words from old Mole. The two women applauded as they could his effort toward humor. Then, "'Come on, Sally, quick!' Mrs. Pollard cried to her guest, and the two women bolted up the steps of the portico and flew like girls through the door, which they quickly locked between themselves and the disquieting night. Once safe within, relief from their nerves came at the simple effort of laughter, and an hour later, when it was clear that the stars still held to their courses, the two ladies were at their ease again, beneath the lamp on the table, with speech and conversation to provide an escape from thought. The night seemed to cool its high temper as the hours wore on, and gradually the storm allowed itself to be forgotten. Together, at bedtime, the two made their tour of the house, locking the windows and doors, and visiting the pantry on the way for an apple. Outside all was truly calm and still, as, with mock and exaggerated caution, they peered through one last open window. A periodic, lazy flash from the far distance was all that the sky could muster of its earlier wrath and they tripped upstairs and to bed, with that hilarity which always attends the feminine pursuit of repose. But in the night they were awakened. Not for nothing, after all, had the skies marshaled that afternoon array of their forces. Now they were as terribly vociferous as they had been terrifyingly still before. Leaves, that had drooped melancholy and motionless in the afternoon, were whipped from their branches at the snatch of the wind. The rain came down in a solid cataract. The thunder was a steady bombardment, and the frolic powers above, that had toyed and practiced with soundless flashes in the afternoon, had grown wanton at their sport, and hurled their electric shots at earth in appallingly accurate marksmanship. Between the flashes from the sky, the steady glare of a burning barn here and there reddened the blackness. The village dead, under the pelted sod, must have shuddered at the din. Even the moments of lull were saturate with terrors. In them rose audible the roar of waters, the clatter of frightened animals, the rattle of gates, the shouts of voices, the click of heels on the flags of the streets, as the villagers hurried to the succor of neighbors fighting fires out on the hills. For long afterward the tempest of that night was remembered. For hours while it lasted, trees were toppled over, and houses rocked to the blast. And for as long as it would, the rain beat in through an open window and wetted the two women where they lay in their bed, afraid to stir, even to help themselves, gripped in a paralysis of terror. Their nerves were not the more disposed to peace either, by another token of the storm. All through the night, since their waking, in moments of stillness sufficient for it to be heard, they had caught that cry of the late afternoon. Doggedly it asserted itself against the uproar. It insisted upon being heard. It too wished to shriek relievingly, like the inanimate night, and publish its sickness abroad. They heard it far off at first, but it moved and came nearer. Once the two women quaked when it came to them, shrill and clear, from a point close at hand. But they bore its invasion along with the wind and the rain, and lay shameless and numb in the rude arms of the night. They lay so till deliverance from the hideous spell came at last, in a vigorous pounding at the front door. "'It's John!' Mrs. Pollard cried in her joy, and through such a storm. She slipped from the bed, threw a damp blanket about her, and groped her way out of the room and down the stair, her guest stumbling after. They scarcely could fly fast enough down the dark steps. At the bottom Mrs. Pollard turned brighter the dimly burning entry lamp, shot back the bolt with fingers barely able to grasp it in their eagerness, and threw open the door. John, she cried. But there moved into the house the tall and thin but heavily framed figure of an old woman who peered about in confusion. In a flash of recognition Mrs. Pollard hurled herself against the intruder to thrust her out. No, the woman said, no, you will not on such a night. And the apparition herself, looking with feverish curiosity at her unwilling hostesses, slowly closed the door and leaned against it. Mrs. Pollard and her friend turned to fly, in a mad instinct to be anywhere behind a locked door. Yet before the instinct could reach their muscles, the unbidden visitor stopped them again. No, she said. I am dying. Help me. The two women turned, as if hypnotically obedient to her command, 
Their tongues lay thick and dead in their mouths. They fell into each other's arms, and their caller stood looking them over with the same fevered curiosity. Then she turned her deliberate scrutiny to the house itself. In a moment she almost reassured them with a first token of being human and feminine. On the table by the stairs lay a book, and she went and picked it up. Fine, she mused. Then her eye traveled over the pictures on the walls. Fine, she said. So this is the inside of a fine house. But suddenly, as her peering gaze returned to the two women, she was recalled to herself. But you wanted to put me out. On a night like this. Hear it. For a moment she looked at them in frank hatred and on an impulse she revenged herself upon them by sounding, in their very ears, the shrill cry they had heard in the afternoon and through the night, that had mystified the villagers for years from the grove. The house rang with it, and with the hard peal of laughter that finished it. All three of them stood there, for an instant, viewing each other. But at the end of it, the weakest of them was the partly sibylline, partly mountebank intruder. She swayed back against the wall, her head rolled limply to one side, and she moaned, "'Oh, God, how tired I am to-night!' Frightened as they still were, their runaway hearts beating a tattoo that was almost inaudible, the two other women made a move to support her. But she waved them back with a suddenly returning air of command. "'No,' she said. "'You wanted to put me out!' The creature wore some sort of thin skirt whose color had vanished in the blue-black of its wetness. Over her head and shoulders was thrown a ragged piece of shawl. From under it dangled strands of grizzled gray hair. Her dark eyes were hidden in the shadows of her impromptu hood. The hollows of her cheeks looked deeper in its shadows. She loosed the shawl from her head, and it dropped to the floor, disclosing a face like one of the fates. She folded her arms, and there was a rude majesty in the massive figure and its bearing as she tried to command herself and speak. I come here, in this storm. Hear it. Hear that. I want shelter. I want comfort. And what do you say to me? Well, then I take comfort from you. You thought I was your husband. You called his name. Well, I saw him this afternoon. He drove out. I called to him from the roadside. Let me tell your fortune, only fifty cent. But he whipped up his horse and drove away. You are all alike." But I see him now in Woodman's Narrows. It rains there, same as here. Thunder and lightning, same as here. Trees fall, the wind blows. The wind blows. The woman had tilted her head and fixed her eyes, shining and eager, as if on some invisible scene, and she half intoned her words as if in a trance. I see your husband now. His wagon is smashed by a tree. The horse is dead. Your husband lies very still. He does not move. There! She turned to them, alert again to their presence. There is the husband that you want. If you don't believe me, all I say is, Wait! He is there. You will see. She ended in a peal of laughter, which itself ended in a weary moan. Oh, why can't you help me? She came toward them, her arms outstretched. Don't be afraid of me. I want a woman to know me, to comfort me. I die tonight. It's calling me outside. Don't you hear? Listen to me, you women, she went on and tried to smile to gain their favor. I lied to you to get even with you. You want your husband. Well, I lied. He isn't dead. For all you tried to shut me out. Do you never pity? Do you never help? Oh, oh! Her hand traveled over her brow, and her eyes wandered. No one knows what I need now. I got to tell it. I got to tell it. Hear that? There had been a louder and nearer crash outside. That's my warning. That says I got to tell it before it's too late. No storm like this for forty years, not since one night forty years ago. My God, that night! Another heavy rumble interrupted her. Yes, yes, she turned and called. I'll tell it, I promise. She came toward her audience and said pleadingly, Listen, even if it frightens you, you've got to listen. That night, forty years ago, 
she peered about her cautiously. I think... I think I hurt two people, hurt them very bad. And ever since that night... The two women had once again tried to fly away, but again she halted them. Listen! You have no right to run away. You got to comfort me. You hear? Please, please don't go. She smiled, and so seemed less ugly. What could her two auditors do but cling to each other and hear her, though dumb and helpless beneath her spell? Only wait. I'll tell you quickly. Oh, I was not always like this. Once I could talk. Elegant, too. I've almost forgotten now. But I never looked like this then. I was not always ugly. No teeth, gray hair. Once I was beautiful, too. You laugh? But yes. Ah, I was young and tall and had long black hair. I was Molly, then. Molly Morgan. That's the first time I've said my name for years. But that's who I was. Ask Bruce. He knows. She had fallen back against the wall again, her eyes roaming as she remembered. Here she laughed. But Bruce is dead these many years. He was my dog. A long pause. We played together, among the flowers, in the pretty cottage under the vines, not far from here, but all gone now, all gone. Even the woods are gone, the woods where Bruce and I hunted berries, and my mother. Again the restless hand sought the face and covered it. My mother, almost as young as I, and how she could talk. A fine lady, as fine as you. And, oh, we had good times together, nearly always. Sometimes mother got angry, in a rage. She'd strike me and say I was an idiot like my father. The next minute she'd hug me and cry and beg me to forgive her. It all comes back to me. Those were the days when she'd bake a cake for supper. The days when she cried and put on a black dress. But mostly she wore the fine dresses, all bright and soft and full of flowers. Oh, how she would dance about in those, sometimes, and always laughed when I stared at her, and say I was Ned's girl to my fingertips. I never understood what she meant, then. The shrill speaker of a moment before had softened suddenly. The creature of the woods sniffed eagerly this atmosphere of the house, and faint vestiges of a former personage returned to her, summoned along with the scene she had set herself to recall. But, oh, how good she was to me, and read to me, and taught me to read, and careful of me. Ha! Never let me go alone to the village. Said I was too good for such a place. Some day we would go back to the world, whatever she meant by that. Said people there would clap the hands when they saw me, more than they had clapped the hands for her. Once she saw a young man walk along the road with me. Oh, how she beat my head when I came home! Nearly killed me she was so angry! Said I mustn't waste myself on such trash! My mother! I never understood her then. She used to tell me stories about New York and Philadelphia, many big cities. There they applaud and clap the hands when my mother was a queen or a beggar girl in the theater and make love and kill and fight have grand supper in hotel afterward, and I'd ask my mother how soon I too may be a queen, and she'd give me to learn the words they say, and I'd say them. Then she'd clap me on the head again and tell me, oh, you're Ned's girl, you're a blockhead, just like your father. And I'd say, where is my father? Why does he never come? And after that my mother would always sit quiet and never answer when I talked. And then she'd be kind again, and make me proud, and tell me I'm a very fine lady, and have fine blood. And she'd talk about the day when we'd go back to the world, and she'd buy me pretty things to wear. But I thought it was fine where we were, there in the cottage, I with the flowers and Bruce. In those days, yes. The woman sighed, and left them to silence for a space for silent seemed the wind and the rain on the breaking of her speech. A rumble from without started her on again. Yes, yes, I'm telling. I'll hurry. Then I grow big, seventeen. 
My mother called me her little giantess, her handsome darling, her conceited fool, all at the same time. I never understood my mother. Then. But then, one day, it came. The woman pressed her fingers against her eyes, as if to shut out the vision her mind was preparing. Everything changed then. Everything was different. No more nights with stories and books. No more about New York and Philadelphia. Never again. I was out in the yard one day, on my knees, with the flowers. It was springtime, and I was digging and fixing, and I heard a horse's hoofs on the road. A runaway, I thought at first. I stood up to look, and— She faltered and then choked out. I stood up to look, and the man came— and with the words came a crash that rocked the house. "'Hear that!' the woman almost shrieked. "'That's him! That's the man! I hear him in every storm! He came!' she went on more rapidly. "'A tall man, fine, dressed in fine clothes, brown hair, brown eyes. Oh, I often see those brown eyes. I know what they are like. He came riding along the by-road. When he caught sight of my mother, he almost fell from his horse. The horse nearly fell. The man pulled him in so sham. "'Good God!' the man said. "'Fanny, is this where you are? "'Curse you, old girl, is this where you are?' "'Funny how I remember his words. "'And then he came in. "'And he talked to my mother a long time. "'Then he looked round and said, "'So this is where you've crawled to.' "'And he petted Bruce. "'And then he came to me "'and looked into my face a long time "'and said, "'So this is his girl, eh?' Fanny Junior, down to the last eyelash. Come here, puss, he said, and I made a face at him. And he put his hands to his sides and laughed and laughed at me. And he turned to my mother and said, Fanny, Fanny, what a queen. I thought he meant be a queen in the theater, but he meant something else. He came to me again and squeezed me and pressed his face against mine. And my mother ran and snatched him away, and I ran behind the house. And by and by my mother came to find me and said, Oh, oh, my little giantess, so here you are. What are you trembling for? And she kicked me. Take that, she said. And I didn't understand, not then. But I understand now. Next day the man came again and talked to my mother, but I saw him look and look at me, and by and by he reached for my hand, and my mother said, Stop that! None of that, my little George. One at a time, if you please. And he laughed and let me go, and they went out and sat on a bench in the yard, and the man stroked my mother's hair, and I watched and listened. They talked a long time till it was night, and I heard George say, Well, Fanny, old girl, we did for him all right, didn't we? I've always remembered it, and they laughed and they laughed. Then the man said, God, how it does scare me sometimes. And my mother laughed at him for that, and George said, Look what I've had to give up, and you pinned up here. But never mind, it will blow over. Then we'll crawl back to the old world, eh, Fanny? All this the woman had rattled off like a child with a recitation, as something learned long ago and long rehearsed against just this last contingency and confession. Oh, I remember it, she said, as if her volubility needed an explanation. It took me a long time to understand, but one day I understood. He came often then, George did, and I was not afraid of him any more. He was fine, like my mother. Every time I saw him come my stomach would give a jump, and I liked to have him put his face against mine the way I'd seen him do to mother and every time he went away I'd watch him from the hilltop till I couldn't see him any more, and at night I couldn't sleep, and George came very often to see me, he told me, and not my mother. And my mother was changed then. She never hit me again, because George said he'd kill her if she did. But she acted very strange when he told her that, and looked and looked at me, and didn't speak to me for days and days. But I didn't mind. I could talk to George and we'd go for long walks, and he'd tell me more about New York and Philadelph, more than my mother could tell. Oh, I loved to hear him talk, and he said such nice things to me, such nice things to me. Bruce, I forgot all about Bruce. Oh, I was happy, 
but that was because I knew nothing. Yes, I pleased George, but by and by he changed too. Then I couldn't say anything that he liked. Stupid child, he called me. I tried ever so hard to please him, but it was like walking against a wind that you can't push aside. You women, you just guess how I felt then. You just guess. You want your husband. It was the same with me. I want George. But he wouldn't listen to me no more. The woman seemed to sink, to shrivel under the weight of her recollection. Finding her not a monster but a woman after all, her two hearers were moved to another slight token of sympathy. They were guessing as she commanded. But still, with a kind of weary magnanimity, she waved them back, away from the things she had yet to make clear. But one day I saw it. One day I saw something. I came home with my berries, and George was there. His breath was funny, and he talked funny and walked funny. I'd seen people in the village that way. But my mother was that way, too. She looked funny, had very red cheeks, and talked very fast. Very foolish. And her breath was the same as George's. And she laughed and laughed at me and made fun of me. I said nothing. But I didn't sleep that night. I wondered what would happen. Many days I thought of what was happening. Then I knew. My mother was trying to get George away from me. That was what had happened. Another day I came back with my berries, and my mother was not there. Neither was George there. So, she had taken George away. My George. Well. I set out to look. No rest for me till I find them. I knew pretty well where they might be. I started for George's little brick house down in the hollow. That's where he had taken to living, hunting and fishing. It was late. The brick house was far away. I was very tired, but I went, and— She had been speaking more rapidly. Here she stopped to breathe, to swallow, to collect herself for the final plunge. I heard a runaway horse. George's horse, I said. George is coming back to me, after all. George is coming back to me. She can't keep him. And yes, it was George's horse, but nobody on him. I was so scared I could hardly stand. Something had happened to George. Only then did I know how much I wanted him, when something had happened to him. I almost fell down in the road, but I crawled on, and presently I came to him, to George. He was walking in the road, limping and stumbling and rolling, all muddy, singing to himself. He didn't know me at first. I ran to him, to my George, and he grabbed me and stumbled and fell, and he grabbed my ankle. "'Come to me, little one,' he said. "'Damn the old hag,' he said. "'It's the girl I want. Ned's own,' he said. "'Come here to me. Ned's own. I want you.' And he pinched me. He bit my hand. And—and and I— All of a sudden I was afraid, and I snatched myself loose. "'George!' I screamed. "'No,' I said. "'I don't know why. I was very scared. I was wild. I kicked away and ran, ran, ran away. I don't know where. To the woods. And oh, a long time I heard George laugh at me. Just like the very old Ned, I heard him shout. But I ran, till I fell down, tired. And there I sat and thought. And all of a sudden I understood. All at once I knew many things. I knew then what my mother had said about Ned sometimes. He was my father. He was dead. Somebody had killed him, I knew. I knew it from what they said. George knew my father then, too. What did he know? That was it. He, he was the man that killed my father. He was after my mother then. He had been after her before, and made her breathe funny, made a fool of her. That was why my beautiful mother was so strange to me sometimes. That's why there was no more New York and Philadelphia. George did that, spoiled everything. Now he was back, making a fool of her again, my mother, and wanted to make a fool of me. Oh, then I knew, that man. And I had liked him, his brown hair, his brown eyes, but oh, I understood. I understood. I got up from the ground. Everything reeled and fell apart. There was nothing more for me everything spoiled. Our pretty cottage, the stories, all gone, spoiled. So I ran back. Maybe I could bring my mother back. Maybe I could save something. 
Oh, I was sick. The trees, they bent and rolled the way George walked. The wind bent them double. They held their stomachs as if they were George laughing at me. They seemed to holler, Ned's girl, at me. I was dizzy, and the wind nearly blew me over, but I had to hurry home. I got near, no one there, not even George, but I had to find my beautiful little mother. All round I ran. The brambles threw me down. I fell over a stump and struck my face. I could feel the blood running down over my cheeks. It was warmer than the rain. No matter. I had to find my mother. My poor little mother. Bruce growled at me when I got to the house. He didn't know me. That's how I looked. But there was a light in the house. Yes, my mother was there. But George was there, too. That man. They had bundles all ready to go away. They weren't glad to see me. I got there too soon. George said, Damn her soul, always that girl of Ned's. I'll show her. And he kicked me. George kicked me. But my mother, she didn't laugh when she saw me. She was very scared. She shook George and said, George, come away, quick. Look at her face. Look at her eyes, she said. Oh, my mother, my little mother. She thought I would hurt her. Even when she'd been such a fool, I was the one that had to take care of her then. But she wanted to go away with that man. That made me wild. You, George, I said. You've got to go. You've... You've done too much to us, I said. You go. And, Mother, I said, you've got to leave him. He's done too much to us, I said. She only answered, George, come, quick. And she dragged George toward the door. And George laughed at me, laughed and laughed, till he saw my eyes. He didn't laugh then, nor my mother. My mother screamed when she saw my eyes. Shut up, George, she screamed. She's not Ned's girl now. And George said, No, by God, she's your brat now, all right. She's the devil's own. And they ran for the door. I tried to get there first to catch my little mother. My mother only screamed as if she were wild. And they got out, out in the dark. Mother, I cried. Mother, come back, come back. No answer. My mother was gone. Oh, that made me feel, somehow, very strong. I'll bring you back, I shouted. You, George, I'll send you away. Wait and see. They never answered. Maybe they never heard. The wind was blowing like tonight. But I knew where I could find them. I knew where to go to find George. And I ran to my loft for my knife. But, oh, my God, when I saw poor Molly in the glass, teeth gone, I wasn't beautiful any more. And my eyes, they came out of the glass at me, like two big dogs jumping a fence. I ran from them. I didn't know myself. I ran out of the door in the night. I went after that man. He had done too much. That storm, the lightning that night, awful. But no storm kept me back. Rain, hail, but I kept on. Trees fell, but I went on. I called out. I laughed then myself. I'll get him, I say. Look out for Ned's girl. Look out for Ned's girl, I say. Unconsciously the woman was reenacting every gesture, repeating every phrase and accent of her journey through the night, that excursion out of the world from which there had been no return for her. Look out for Ned's girl! The house rang with the cry. But this second journey of the memory ended in a moan and a faint. I said I would tell it. Help me, she said. In some fashion they worked her heavy bulk out of its crazy wrappings and into a bed. John arrived to help them. Morning peered timidly over the eastern hills, as if fearful of beholding what the night had wrought. In its smiling calm the noise of the storm was already done away. But the storm in the troubled mind raged on. For days it raged in fever and delirium. Then they buried the rude minister of justice in the place where she commanded, under the pile of broken stones and bricks among the trees in the hollow. And it is said that the inquisitive villagers who had a part in the simple ceremonies stirred about till they made the discovery of two skeletons under the ruins, 
and to this day there are persons in Bustlebury with a belief that at night, or in a storm, they sometimes hear a long-drawn cry issuing from that lonely little hollow. End of The Caller in the Night by Burton Klein The Secret of the Two Plaster Casts by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett. The Secret of the Two Plaster Casts by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Years before the accession of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, and yet at not so remote a date as to be utterly beyond the period to which the reminiscences of our middle-aged readers extend, it happened that two English gentlemen sat at a table on a summer's evening, after dinner, quietly sipping their wine and engaged in desultory conversation. They were both men known to fame. One of them was a sculptor, whose statues adorned the palaces of princes, and whose chiseled busts were the pride of half the nobility of his nation. The other was no less renowned as an anatomist and surgeon. The age of the anatomist might have been guessed at fifty, but the guess would have erred on the side of youth by at least ten years. That of the sculptor could scarcely be more than five and thirty. A bust of the anatomist, so admirably executed as to present, although in stone, the perfect similitude of life and flesh, stood upon a pedestal opposite to the table at which sat the pair, and at once explained at least one connecting link of companionship between them. The anatomist was exhibiting for the criticism of his friend a rare gem which he had just drawn from his cabinet. It was a crucifix, magnificently carved in ivory, and encased in a setting of pure gold. "'The carving, my dear sir,' observed Mr. Phidias, the sculptor, is indeed, as you say, exquisite. The muscles are admirably made out, the flesh well modelled, wonderfully so for the size and material, and yet, by the by, on this point you must know more than I, the more I think upon the matter, the more I regard the artistic conception as utterly false and wrong. You speak in a riddle, replied Dr. Carnell, but pray go on and explain. It is a fancy I first had in my student days, replied Phidias. Conventionality, not to say a most proper and becoming reverence, prevents people by no means ignorant from considering the point. But once think upon it, and you at least, of all men, must at once perceive how utterly impossible it would be for a victim nailed upon a cross by hands and feet to preserve the position invariably displayed in figures of the crucifixion. Those who so portray it fail in what should be their most awful and agonizing effect. Think for one moment, and imagine, if you can, what would be the attitude of a man, living or dead, under this frightful torture? "'You startle me,' returned the great surgeon, "'not only by the truth of your remarks, but by their obviousness. It is strange indeed that such a matter should have so long been overlooked. The more I think upon it, the more the bare idea of actual crucifixion seems to horrify me though heaven knows I am accustomed enough to scenes of suffering. How would you represent such a terrible agony? Indeed I cannot tell, replied the sculptor. To guess would be almost vain. The fearful strain upon the muscles, their utter helplessness and inactivity, the frightful swellings, the effect of weight upon the racked and tortured sinews, appall me too much even for speculation. But this, replied the surgeon, one might think a matter of importance, not only to art, but higher still, to religion itself. Maybe so, returned the sculptor. But perhaps the appeal to the senses through a true representation might be too horrible for either the one or the other. Still, persisted the surgeon, I should like, say, for curiosity, though I am weak enough to believe even in my own motive as a higher one, to ascertain the effect from actual observation. So should I, could it be done, and of course without pain to the object, which, as a condition, seems to present at the outset an impossibility. Perhaps not, mused the anatomist. I think I have a notion. Stay, we may contrive this matter. I will tell you my plan, and it will be strange indeed if we two cannot manage to carry it out. 
The discourse here, owing to the rapt attention of both speakers, assumed a low and earnest tone, but had perhaps better be narrated by a relation of the events to which it gave rise. Suffice it to say that the sovereign was more than once mentioned during its progress, and in a manner which plainly told that the two speakers each possessed sufficient influence to obtain the assistance of royalty, and that such assistance would be required in their scheme. The shades of evening deepened while the two were still conversing. And, leaving this scene, let us cast one hurried glimpse at another taking place contemporaneously. Between Pimlico and Chelsea, and across a canal of which the bed has since been used for the railway terminating at Victoria Station, there was, at the time of which we speak, a rude timber footway, long since replaced by a more substantial and convenient erection, but then known as the Wooden Bridge. It was named shortly afterward Cutthroat Bridge, and for this reason. While Mr. Phidias and Dr. Carnell were discoursing over their wine, as we have already seen, one Peter Stark, a drunken Chelsea pensioner, was murdering his wife upon the spot we have last indicated. The coincidence was curious. In those days the punishment of criminals followed closely upon their conviction. The Chelsea pensioner whom we have mentioned was found guilty one Friday, and sentenced to die on the following Monday. He was a sad scoundrel, impenitent to the last, glorying in the deeds of slaughter which he had witnessed and acted during the series of campaigns which had ended just previously at Waterloo. He was a tall, well-built fellow enough, of middle age, for his class was not then, as now, composed chiefly of veterans, but comprised many young men just sufficiently disabled to be unfit for service. Peter Stark, although but slightly wounded, had nearly completed his term of service, and had obtained his pension and presentment to Chelsea Hospital. With his life we have but little to do, save as regards its close, which we shall shortly endeavor to describe far more voraciously, and at some greater length than set forth in the brief account which satisfied the public of his own day, and which, as embodied in the columns of the few journals then appearing, ran thus. On Monday, Peter Stark was executed at Newgate for the murder at the Wooden Bridge, Chelsea, with four others for various offenses. After he had been hanging only for a few minutes, a respite arrived, but although he was promptly cut down, life was pronounced to be extinct. His body was buried within the prison walls. Thus far history. But the conciseness of history far more frequently embodies falsehood than truth, perhaps the following narration may approach more nearly to the facts. A room within the prison had been, upon that special occasion and by high authority, allotted to the use of Dr. Carnell and Mr. Phidias, the famous sculptor, for the purpose of certain investigations connected with art and science. In that room Mr. Phidias, while wretched Peter Stark was yet swinging between heaven and earth, was busily engaged in arranging a variety of implements and materials, consisting of a large quantity of plaster of Paris, two large pails of water, sonic tubs, and other necessaries of the molder's art. The room contained a large deal table, and a wooden cross, not neatly planed and squared at the angles, but of thick, narrow, rudely sawn oaken plank, fixed by strong, heavy nails. And while Mr. Phidias was thus occupied, the executioner entered, bearing upon his shoulders the body of the wretched Peter, which he flung heavily upon the table. "'You are sure he is dead?' asked Mr. Phidias. "'Dead as a herring,' replied the other, "'and yet just as warm and limp as if he had only fainted.' "'Then go to work at once,' replied the sculptor, as turning his back upon the hangman he resumed his occupation. The work was soon done. Peter was stripped and nailed upon the timber, which was instantly propped against the wall. "'As fine a one as ever I see!' exclaimed the executioner, as he regarded the defunct murderer with an expression of admiration, as if at his own handiwork, in having abruptly demolished such a magnificent animal. "'Drops a good bit forward, though. Shall I tie him up round the waist, sir?' "'Certainly not,' returned the sculptor. "'Just rub him well over with this oil, especially his head, and then you can go.' Dr. Carnell will settle with you. All right, sir. The fellow did as ordered, and retired without another word, leaving this strange couple, the living and the dead, in that dismal chamber. Mr. Phidias was a man of strong nerve in such matters. 
He had been too much accustomed to taking posthumous casts to trouble himself with any sentiment of repugnance at his approaching task of taking what is called a peace mold from a body. He emptied a number of bags of the white powdery plaster of Paris into one of the larger vessels, poured it into a pail of water, and was carefully stirring up the mass when a sound of dropping arrested his ear. Drip, drip. There's something leaking, he muttered, as he took a second pail and emptying it again stirred the composition. Drip, drip, drip. It's strange, he soliloquized, half aloud. There is no more water, and yet... The sound was heard again. He gazed at the ceiling. There was no sign of damp. He turned his eyes to the body, and something suddenly caused him a violent start. The murderer was bleeding. The sculptor, spite of his command over himself, turned pale. At that moment the head of Stark moved, clearly moved. It raised itself convulsively for a single moment, its eyes rolled, and it gave vent to a subdued moan of intense agony. Mr. Phidias fell fainting on the floor as Dr. Carnell entered. It needed but a glance to tell the doctor what had happened, even had not Peter just then given vent to another low cry. The surgeon's measures were soon taken. Locking the door, he bore a chair to the wall which supported the body of the malefactor. He drew from his pocket a cease of glittering instruments, and with one of these, so small and delicate that it scarcely seemed larger than a needle, he rapidly, but dexterously and firmly, touched Peter just at the back of the neck. There was no wound larger than the head of a small pin, and yet the head fell instantly as though the heart had been pierced. The doctor had divided the spinal cord, and Peter Stark was dead indeed. A few minutes sufficed to recall the sculptor to his senses. He at first gazed wildly upon the still-suspended body, so painfully recalled to life by the rough vinisection of the hangman and the subsequent friction of anointing his body to prevent the adhesion of the plaster. "'You need not fear now,' said Dr. Carnell. "'I assure you he is dead.' "'But he was alive, surely.' Only for a moment, and even that scarcely to be called life. Mere muscular contraction, my dear sir. Mere muscular contraction. The sculptor resumed his labor. The body was girt at various circumferences with fine twine, to be afterward withdrawn through a thick coating of plaster, so as to separate the various pieces of the mold, which was at last completed, and after this Dr. Carnell skillfully flayed the body to enable a second mold to be taken of the entire figure, showing every muscle of the outer layer. The two molds were thus taken. It is difficult to conceive more ghastly appearances than they presented. For sculptor's work they were utterly useless, for no artist except the most daring of realists would have ventured to indicate the horrors which they presented. Phidias refused to receive them. Dr. Carnell, hard and cruel as he was, for kindness' sake, in his profession, was a gentle father of a family of daughters. He received the castes, and at once consigned them to a garret, to which he forbade access. His youngest daughter, one unfortunate day, during her father's absence, was impelled by feminine curiosity, perhaps a little increased by the prohibition, to enter the mysterious chamber. Whether she imagined in the pallid figure upon the cross a celestial rebuke for her disobedience, or whether she was overcome by the mere Mortal horror of one or both of those dreadful castes can now never be known, but this is true, she became a maniac. The writer of this has more than once seen, as no doubt have many others, the plaster effigies of Peter Stark, after their removal from Dr. Carnell's to a famous studio near the Regent's Park. It was there that he heard whispered the strange story of their origin. Sculptor and surgeon are now both long since dead, and it is no longer necessary to keep the secret of the two plaster casts. End of The Secret of the Two Plaster Casts by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. The Hour and the Man by Robert Barr This is a LibriVox recording. All of the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett The Hour and the Man by Robert Barr 
Prince Lotarno rose slowly to his feet, casting one malignant glance at the prisoner before him. You have heard, he said, what is alleged against you. Have you anything to say in your defense? The captured brigand laughed. The time for talk is past, he cried. This has been a fine farce of a fair trial. You need not have wasted so much time over what you call evidence. I knew my doom when I fell into your hands. I killed your brother. You will kill me. You have proven that I am a murderer and a robber. I could prove the same of you if you were bound hand and foot in my camp as I am bound in your castle. It is useless for me to tell you that I did not know he was your brother, else it would not have happened, for the small robber always respects the larger and more powerful thief. When a wolf is down, the other wolves devour him. I am down, and you will have my head cut off, or my body drawn asunder in your courtyard, whichever pleases your excellency best. It is the fortune of war, and I do not complain. When I say that I am sorry I killed your brother, I merely mean I am sorry you were not the man who stood in his shoes when the shot was fired. You, having more men than I had, have scattered my followers and captured me. You may do with me what you please. My consolation is that killing me will not bring to life the man who is shot, therefore conclude the farce that has dragged through so many weary hours. Pronounce my sentence. I am ready. There was a moment's silence after the brigand had ceased speaking. Then the prince said, in low tones, but in a voice that made itself heard in every part of the judgment hall, Your sentence is that on the 15th of January you shall be taken from your cell at four o'clock, conducted to the room of execution, and there beheaded. The prince hesitated for a moment as he concluded the sentence, and seemed about to add something more, but apparently he remembered that a report of the trial was to go before the king, whose representative was present, and he was particularly desirous that nothing should go on the records which savored of old-time malignity, for it was well known that His Majesty had a particular aversion to the ancient forms of torture that had obtained heretofore in his kingdom. Recollecting this, the prince sat down. The brigand laughed again. His sentence was evidently not so gruesome as he had expected. He was a man who had lived all his life in the mountains, and he had had no means of knowing that more merciful measures had been introduced into the policy of the government. "'I will keep the appointment,' he said jauntily, "'unless I have a more pressing engagement.' The brigand was led away to his cell. "'I hope,' said the prince, "'that you noted the defiant attitude of the prisoner.' "'I have not failed to do so, Your Excellency,' replied the ambassador. "'I think,' said the prince, that under the circumstances his treatment has been most merciful. I am certain, Your Excellency, said the ambassador, that His Majesty will be of the same opinion, for such a miscreant beheading is too easy a death. The prince was pleased to know that the opinion of the ambassador coincided so entirely with his own. The brigand, Tosa, was taken to a cell in the northern tower, where, by climbing on a bench, he could get a view of the profound valley at the mouth of which the castle was situated. He well knew its impregnable position commanding, as it did, the entrance to the valley. He knew also that if he succeeded in escaping from the castle, he was hemmed in by mountains practically unscalable, while the mouth of the gorge was so well guarded by the castle that it was impossible to get to the outer world through that gateway. Although he knew the mountains well, he realized that, with his band scattered, many killed, and the others fugitives, he would have a better chance of starving to death in the valley than of escaping out of it. He sat on the bench and thought over the situation. Why had the prince been so merciful? He had expected torture, whereas he was to meet the easiest death that a man could die. He felt satisfied there was something in this that he could not understand. Perhaps they intended to starve him to death, now that the appearance of a fair trial was over. Things could be done in the dungeon of a castle that the outside world knew nothing of. His fears of starvation were speedily put to an end by the appearance of his jailer with a better meal than he had had for some time, for during the last week he had wandered a fugitive in the mountains until captured by the prince's men, who evidently had orders to bring him in alive. Why, then, were they so anxious not to kill him in a fair fight if he were now to be merely beheaded? What is your name? asked Tosa of his jailer. I am called Paolo, was the answer. 
Do you know that I am to be beheaded on the fifteenth of the month? I have heard so, answered the man. And do you attend me until that time? I attend you while I am ordered to do so. If you talk much, I may be replaced. That, then, is a tip for silence, good Paolo, said the brigand. I always treat well those who serve me well. I regret, therefore, that I have no money with me, and so cannot recompense you for good service. That is not necessary, answered Paolo. I receive my recompense from the steward. Ah, but the recompense of the steward and the recompense of a brigand chief are two very different things. Are there so many pickings in your position that you are rich, Paolo? No, I am a poor man. Well, under certain circumstances I could make you rich. Paolo's eyes glistened, but he made no direct reply. Finally he said in a frightened whisper, I have tarried too long. I am watched. By and by the vigilance will be relaxed, and then we may perhaps talk of riches. With that the jailer took his departure. The brigand laughed softly to himself. Evidently, he said, Paolo is not above the reach of a bribe. We will have further talk on the subject when the watchfulness is relaxed. And so it grew to be a question of which should trust the other. The brigand asserted that hidden in the mountains he had gold and jewels, and these he would give to Paolo if he could contrive his escape from the castle. Once free of the castle, I can soon make my way out of the valley, said the brigand. I am not so sure of that, answered Paolo. The castle is well guarded, and when it is discovered that you have escaped, the alarm bell will be rung, and after that not a mouse can leave the valley without the soldiers knowing it. The brigand pondered on the situation for some time, and at last said, I know the mountains well. Yes, said Paolo, but you are one man, and the soldiers of the prince are many. Perhaps, he added, if it were made worth my while, I could show you that I know the mountains even better than you do. What do you mean? asked the brigand in an excited whisper. Do you know the tunnel? inquired Paolo, with an anxious glance towards the door. What tunnel? I never heard of any, but it exists, nevertheless. A tunnel through the mountains to the world outside. A tunnel through the mountains? Nonsense, cried the brigand. I should have known of it if one existed. The work would be too great to accomplish. It was made long before your day, or mine either. If the castle had fallen, then those who were inside could escape through the tunnel. Few knew of the entrance. It is near the waterfall up the valley, and is covered with brushwood. What will you give me to place you at the entrance of that tunnel? The brigand looked at Paolo sternly for a few moments. Then he answered slowly, Everything I possess. And how much is that? asked Paolo. It is more than you will ever earn by serving the prince. Will you tell me where it is before I help you to escape from the castle and lead you to the tunnel? Yes, said Tosa. Will you tell me now? No. Bring me a paper tomorrow, and I will draw a plan showing you how to get it. When his jailer appeared, the day after Tosa had given the plan, the brigand asked eagerly, Did you find the treasure? I did, said Paolo quietly. And will you keep your word? Will you get me out of the castle? I will get you out of the castle and lead you to the entrance of the tunnel, but after that you must look to yourself. Certainly, said Tosa. That was the bargain. Once out of this accursed valley I can defy all the princes in Christendom. Have you a rope? We shall need none, said the jailer. I will come for you at midnight, and take you out of the castle by the secret passage, then your escape will not be noticed until morning. At midnight his jailer came and led Tosa through many a tortuous passage, the two men pausing now and then, holding their breaths anxiously as they came to an open court through which a guard paced. At last they were outside of the castle at one hour past midnight. The brigand drew a long breath of relief when he was once again out in the free air. "'Where is your tunnel?' he asked, in a somewhat distrustful whisper of his guide. "'Hush!' was the low answer. "'It is only a short distance from the castle, but every inch is guarded, and we cannot go direct. We must make for the other side of the valley, and come to it from the north.' "'What?' cried Toza in amazement. Traverse the whole valley for a tunnel a few yards away. It is the only safe plan, said Paolo. If you wish to go by the direct way, I must leave you to your own devices. I am in your hands, said the brigand with a sigh. 
Take me where you will, so long as you lead me to the entrance of the tunnel. They passed down and down around the heights on which the castle stood, and crossed the purling little river by means of stepping stones. Once Toza fell into the water, but was rescued by his guide. There was still no alarm from the castle as daylight began to break. As it grew more light, they both crawled into a cave which had a low opening difficult to find, and there Paolo gave the brigand his breakfast, which he took from a little bag slung by a strap across his shoulder. "'What are we going to do for food if we are to be days between here and the tunnel?' asked Toza. "'Oh, I have arranged for that, and a quantity of food has been placed where we are most likely to want it. I will get it while you sleep.' "'But if you are captured, what am I to do?' asked Toza. "'Can you not tell me how to find the tunnel, as I told you how to find my treasure?' Paolo pondered over this for a moment, and then said, "'Yes, I think it would be the safer way. You must follow the stream until you reach the place where the torrent from the east joins it. Among the hills there is a waterfall, and halfway up the precipice on a shelf of rock there are sticks and bushes. Clear them away, and you will find the entrance to the tunnel. Go through the tunnel until you come to a door which is bolted on this side. When you have passed through, you will see the end of your journey.' Shortly after daybreak, the big bell of the castle began to toll, and before noon the soldiers were beating the bushes all around them. They were so close that the two men could hear their voices from their hiding place, where they lay in their wet clothes, breathlessly expecting every moment to be discovered. The conversation of two soldiers who were nearest them nearly caused the hearts of the hiding listeners to stop beating. "'Is there not a cave near here?' asked one. "'Let us search for it.' "'Nonsense,' said the other. I tell you that they could not have come this far already. Why could they not have escaped when the guard changed at midnight? insisted the first speaker. Because Paolo was seen crossing the courtyard at midnight, and they could have had no other chance of getting away until just before daybreak. This answer seemed to satisfy his comrade, and the search was given up just as they were about to come upon the fugitives. It was a narrow escape, and, brave as the robber was, he looked pale while Paolo was in a state of collapse. Many times during the nights and days that followed, the brigand and his guide almost fell into the hands of the minions of the prince. Exposure, privation, semi-starvation, and, worse than all, the alternate wrenchings of hope and fear, began to tell upon the stalwart frame of the brigand. Some days and nights of cold winter rain added to their misery. They dare not seek shelter, for every habitable place was watched. When daylight overtook them on their last night's crawl through the valley, they were within a short distance of the waterfall, whose low roar now came soothingly down to them. "'Never mind the daylight,' said Toza. "'Let us push on and reach the tunnel.' "'I can go no farther,' moaned Paolo. "'I am exhausted.' "'Nonsense,' cried Toza. "'It is but a short distance.' "'The distance is greater than you think. Besides, we are in full view of the castle.' Would you risk everything now that the game is nearly won? You must not forget that the stake is your head, and remember what day this is. What day is it? asked the brigand, turning on his guide. It is the 15th of January, the day on which you were to be executed. Toza caught his breath sharply. Danger and want had made a coward of him, and he shuddered now, which he had not done when he was on his trial and condemned to death. How do you know it is the fifteenth? he asked at last. Paolo held up his stick, notched after the method of Robinson Crusoe. I am not so strong as you are, and if you will let me rest here until the afternoon, I am willing to make a last effort and try to reach the entrance of the tunnel. Very well, said Toza shortly. As they lay there that morning, neither could sleep. The noise of the waterfall was music to the ears of them both. Their long toilsome journey was almost over. "'What did you do with the gold that you found in the mountains?' asked Toza suddenly. Paolo was taken unawares, and answered, without thinking, "'I left it where it was. I will get it after.' The brigand said nothing, but that remark condemned Paolo to death. Toza resolved to murder him as soon as they were well out of the tunnel and get the gold himself. They left their hiding place shortly before twelve o'clock, but their progress was so slow crawling as they had to up the steep side of the mountain, under cover of bushes and trees, that it was well after three when they came to the waterfall, 
which they crossed as best they could on stones and logs. There, said Toza, shaking himself, that is our last wetting. Now for the tunnel. The rocky sides of the waterfall hid them from view of the castle, but Paolo called the brigands' attention to the fact that they could be easily seen from the other side of the valley. It doesn't matter now, said Toza. Lead the way as quickly as you can to the mouth of the cavern. Paolo scrambled on until he reached a shelf about halfway up the cataract. He threw aside bushes, brambles, and logs, speedily disclosing a hole large enough to admit a man. "'You go first, said Paolo, standing aside. "'No,' answered Toza. "'You know the way, and must go first. "'You cannot think that I wish to harm you. "'I am completely unarmed.' "'Nevertheless,' said Paolo, "'I shall not go first. "'I did not like the way you looked at me "'when I told you the gold was still in the hills. "'I admit I distrust you.' Oh, very well, laughed Toza. It doesn't really matter. And he crawled into the hole in the rock, Paolo following him. Before long the tunnel enlarged so that a man could stand upright. Stop, said Paolo. There is the door near here. Yes, said the robber. I remember that you spoke of a door. Adding, however, What is it for, and why is it locked? It is bolted on this side, answered Paolo, and we shall have no difficulty in opening it. "'What is it for?' repeated the brigand. "'It is to prevent the current of air running through the tunnel "'and blowing away the obstruction at this end,' said the guide. "'Here it is,' said Toza, as he felt down its edge for the bolt. "'The bolt drew back easily, and the door opened. "'The next instant the brigand was pushed rudely into a room, "'and he heard the bolt thrust back into its place, "'almost simultaneously with the noise of the closing door. "'For a moment his eyes were dazzled by the light.' He was in an apartment blazing with torches held by a dozen men standing about. In the center of the room was a block covered with black cloth, and beside it stood a masked executioner, resting the corner of a gleaming axe on the black-draped block, with his hands crossed over the end of the axe's handle. The prince stood there surrounded by his ministers. Above his head was a clock, with the minute hand pointed to the hour of four. "'You are just in time,' said the prince, grimly. "'We are waiting for you.'" End of The Hour and the Man by Robert Barr The Middle Toe of the Right Foot by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett The Middle Toe of the Right Foot by Ambrose Bierce It is well known that the old Manton house is haunted. In all the rural district near about, and even in the town of Marshall a mile away, not one person of unbiased mind entertains a doubt of it. Incredulity is confined to those opinionated persons who will be called cranks as soon as the useful word shall have penetrated the intellectual domain of the martial advance. The evidence that the house is haunted is of two kinds. The testimony of disinterested witnesses who have had ocular proof, and that of the house itself. The former may be disregarded and ruled out on any of the various grounds of objection which may be urged against it by the ingenious, but facts within the observation of all are material and controlling. In the first place, the Manton House has been unoccupied by mortals for more than ten years, and with its outbuildings is slowly falling into decay, a circumstance which in itself the judicious will hardly venture to ignore. It stands a little way off the loneliest reach of the Marshall and Harriston Road, in an opening which was once a farm and is still disfigured with strips of rotting fence, and half covered with brambles overrunning a stony and sterile soil long unacquainted with the plough. The house itself is in tolerably good condition, though badly weather-stained and in dire need of attention from the glacier, the smaller male population of the region having attested in the manner of its kind its disapproval of dwelling without dwellers. It is two stories in height, nearly square, its front pierced by a single doorway flanked on each side by a window boarded up to the very top. Corresponding windows above, not protected, serve to admit light and rain to the rooms of the upper floor. 
Grass and weeds grow pretty rankly all about, and a few shade trees, somewhat the worse for wind, and leaning all in one direction, seem to be making a concerted effort to run away. In short, as the Marshall Town humorist explained in the columns of the advance, the proposition that the Manton House is badly haunted is the only logical conclusion from the premises. The fact that in this dwelling Mr. Manton thought it expedient, one night some ten years ago, to rise and cut the throats of his wife and two small children, removing at once to another part of the country, has no doubt done its share in directing public attention to the fitness of the place for supernatural phenomena. To this house, one summer evening, came four men in a wagon. Three of them promptly alighted, and the one who had been driving hitched the team to the only remaining post of what had been a fence. The fourth remained seated in the wagon. Come, said one of his companions, approaching him, while the others moved away in the direction of the dwelling. This is the place. The man addressed did not move. By God, he said harshly, this is a trick, and it looks to me as if you were in it. "'Perhaps I am,' the other said, looking him straight in the face and speaking in a tone which had something of contempt in it. "'You will remember, however, that the choice of place was, with your own assent, left to the other side. Of course, if you are afraid of spooks—' "'I am afraid of nothing,' the man interrupted with another oath, and sprang to the ground. The two then joined the others at the door, which one of them had already opened with some difficulty, caused by rust of lock and hinge. All entered.' Inside it was dark, but the man who had unlocked the door produced a candle and matches and made a light. He then unlocked a door on their right as they stood in the passage. This gave them entrance to a large, square room that the candle but dimly lighted. The floor had a thick carpeting of dust, which partly muffled their footfalls. Cobwebs were in the angles of the walls and depended from the ceiling like strips of rotting lace, making undulatory movements in the disturbed air. The room had two windows in adjoining sides, but from neither could anything be seen except the rough inner surfaces of boards a few inches from the glass. There was no fireplace, no furniture. There was nothing besides the cobwebs and the dust. The four men were the only objects there which were not a part of the structure. Strange enough they looked in the yellow light of the candle. The one who had so reluctantly alighted was especially spectacular. He might have been called sensational. He was of middle age, heavily built, deep-chested, and broad-shouldered. Looking at his figure, one would have said that he had a giant's strength, at his features, that he would use it like a giant. He was clean-shaven, his hair rather closely cropped and gray. His low forehead was seamed with wrinkles above the eyes, and over the nose these became vertical. The heavy black brows followed the same law, saved from meeting only by an upward turn at what would otherwise have been the point of contact. Deeply sunken beneath these glowed in the obscure light a pair of eyes of uncertain color, but obviously enough too small. There was something forbidding in their expression, which was not bettered by the cruel mouth and wide jaw. The nose was well enough, as noses go. One does not expect much of noses. All that was sinister in the man's face seemed accentuated by an unnatural pallor. He appeared altogether bloodless. The appearance of the other men was sufficiently commonplace. They were such persons as one meets and forgets that he met. All were younger than the man described, between whom and the eldest of the others, who stood apart, there was apparently no kindly feeling. They avoided looking at each other. "'Gentlemen,' said the man holding the candle and keys, "'I believe everything is right. Are you ready, Mr. Rosser?' The man standing apart from the group bowed and smiled. "'And you, Mr. Grossmith?' The heavy man bowed and scowled. You will be pleased to remove your outer clothing. Their hats, coats, waistcoats, and neckwear were soon removed and thrown outside the door in the passage. The man with the candle now nodded, and the fourth man, he who had urged Grossmith to leave the wagon, produced from the pocket of his overcoat two long, murderous-looking bowie knives, which he drew now from their leather scabbards. They are exactly alike, he said, presenting one to each of the two principals, for by this time the dullest observer would have understood the nature of this meeting. It was to be a duel to the death. Each combatant took a knife, examined it critically near the candle, and tested the strength of blade and handle across his lifted knee. Their persons were then searched in turn, each by the second of the other. If it is agreeable to you, Mr. Grossmith, said the man holding the light, 
you will place yourself in that corner. He indicated the angle of the room farthest from the door, whither Grossmith retired, his second parting from him with a grasp of the hand which had nothing of cordiality in it. In the angle nearest the door Mr. Rosser stationed himself, and after a whispered consultation his second left him, joining the other near the door. At that moment the candle was suddenly extinguished, leaving all in profound darkness. This may have been done by the draught from the open door. Whatever the cause, the effect was startling. Gentlemen, said a voice which sounded strangely unfamiliar in the altered condition affecting the relations of the senses, gentlemen, you will not move until you hear the closing of the outer door. A sound of trampling ensued, then the closing of the inner door, and finally the outer one closed with a concussion which shook the entire building. A few minutes afterward a belated farmer's boy met a light wagon which was being driven furiously toward the town of Marshall. He declared that behind the two figures on the front seat stood a third, with its hands upon the bowed shoulders of the others, who appeared to struggle vainly to free themselves from its grasp. This figure, unlike the others, was clad in white, and had undoubtedly boarded the wagon as it passed the haunted house. As the lad could boast a considerable former experience with the supernatural, thereabouts his word had the weight justly due to the testimony of an expert. The story, in connection with the next day's events, eventually appeared in the advance, with some slight literary embellishments and a concluding intimation that the gentleman referred to would be allowed the use of the paper's columns for their version of the night's adventure. But the privilege remained without a claimant. The events that led up to this duel in the dark were simple enough. One evening, three young men of the town of Marshall were sitting in a quiet corner of the porch of the village hotel, smoking and discussing such matters as three educated young men of a southern village would naturally find interesting. Their names were King, Sancher, and Rosser. At a little distance within easy hearing, but taking no part in the conversation, sat a fourth. He was a stranger to the others. They merely knew that on his arrival by the stagecoach that afternoon he had written in the hotel register the name Robert Grossmith. He had not been observed to speak to any one except the hotel clerk. He seemed, indeed, singularly fond of his own company, or as the personnel of the advance expressed it, grossly addicted to evil associations. But then it should be said, in justice to the stranger, that the personnel was himself of a too convival disposition fairly to judge one differently gifted, and had, moreover, experienced a slight rebuff in an effort at an interview. "'I hate any kind of deformity in a woman,' said King, whether natural or acquired. I have a theory that any physical defect has its correlative mental and moral defect. I infer, then, said Rosser, gravely, that a lady lacking the moral advantage of a nose would find the struggle to become Mrs. King an arduous enterprise. Of course you may put it that way, was the reply. But, seriously, I once threw over a most charming girl on learning quite accidentally that she had suffered amputation of a toe. My conduct was brutal, if you like, but if I had married that girl I should have been miserable for life, and should have made her so. Whereas, said Sancher, with a light laugh, by marrying a gentleman of more liberal views she escaped with a parted throat. Ah, you know to whom I refer. Yes, she married Manton, but I don't know about his liberality. I'm not sure, but he cut her throat because he discovered that she lacked that excellent thing in woman, the middle toe of the right foot. Look at that chap, said Rosser in a low voice, his eyes fixed upon the stranger. That chap was obviously listening intently to the conversation. Damn his impudence, muttered King. What ought we to do? That's an easy one, Rosser replied, rising. Sir, he continued, addressing the stranger, I think it would be better if you would remove your chair to the outer end of the veranda. The presence of gentlemen is evidently an unfamiliar situation to you. The man sprang to his feet and strode forward with clenched hands, his face white with rage. All were now standing. Sancher stepped between the belligerents. "'You are hasty and unjust,' he said to Rosser. "'This gentleman has done nothing to deserve such language.' But Rosser would not withdraw a word. By the custom of the country and the time there could be but one outcome to the quarrel. "'I demand the satisfaction due to a gentleman,' said the stranger, who had become more calm. I have not an acquaintance in this region. 
Perhaps you, sir, bowing to censure, will be kind enough to represent me in this matter. Censure accepted the trust, somewhat reluctantly it must be confessed, for the man's appearance and manner were not at all to his liking. King, who during the colloquy had hardly removed his eyes from the stranger's face and had not spoken a word, consented with a nod to act for Rosser, and the upshot of it was that, the principals having retired, a meeting was arranged for the next evening. The nature of the arrangements has been already disclosed. The duel with knives in a dark room was once a commoner feature of southwestern life than it is likely to be again. How thin a veneering of chivalry covered the essential brutality of the code under which such encounters were possible, we shall see. In the blaze of a midsummer noonday, the old Manton house was hardly true to its traditions. It was of the earth, earthy. The sunshine caressed it warmly and affectionately, with evident disregard of its bad reputation. The grass, greening all the expanse in its front, seemed to grow, not rankly, but with a natural and joyous exuberance, and the weeds blossomed quite like plants. Full of charming lights and shadows, and populous with pleasant-voiced birds, the neglected shade-trees no longer struggled to run away, but bent reverently beneath their burden of sun and song. Even in the glassless upper windows was an expression of peace and contentment due to the light within. Over the stony fields the visible heat danced with a lively tremor incompatible with the gravity which is an attribute of the supernatural. Such was the aspect under which the place presented itself to Sheriff Adams and two other men who had come out from Marshall to look at it. One of these men was Mr. King, the sheriff's deputy. The other, whose name was Brewer, was a brother of the late Mrs. Manton. Under a beneficent law of the state relating to property which had been for a certain period abandoned by an owner whose residence cannot be ascertained, the sheriff was the legal custodian of the Manton farm and appurtenances thereunto belonging. His present visit was in mere perfunctory compliance with some order of a court in which Mr. Brewer had an action to get possession of the property as heir to his deceased sister. By a mere coincidence, the visit was made on the day after the night that Deputy King had unlocked the house for another and very different purpose. His presence now was not of his own choosing. He had been ordered to accompany his superior, and at the moment could think of nothing more prudent than simulated alacrity in obedience to the command. Carelessly opening the front door, which to his surprise was not locked, the sheriff was amazed to see, lying on the floor of the passage into which it opened, a confused heap of men's apparel. Examination showed it to consist of two hats, and the same number of coats, waistcoats, and scarves, all in a remarkably good state of preservation, albeit somewhat defiled by the dust in which they lay. Mr. Brewer was equally astonished, but Mr. King's emotion is not on record. With a new and lively interest in his own actions, the sheriff now unlatched and pushed open the door on the right, and the three entered. The room was apparently vacant. No, as their eyes became accustomed to the dimmer light, something was visible in the farthest angle of the wall. It was a human figure, that of a man crouching close in the corner. Something in the attitude made the intruders halt when they had barely passed the threshold. The figure more and more clearly defined itself. The man was upon one knee, his back in the angle of the wall, his shoulders elevated to the level of his ears, his hands before his face, palms outward, the fingers spread and crooked like claws. The white face turned upward on the retracted neck had an expression of unutterable fright, the mouth half open, the eyes incredibly expanded. He was stone dead. Yet, with the exception of a bowie knife, which had evidently fallen from his own hand, not another object was in the room. In thick dust that covered the floor were some confused footprints near the door and along the wall through which it opened. Along one of the adjoining walls, too, past the boarded-up windows, was the trail made by the man himself in reaching his corner. Instinctively, in approaching the body, the three men followed that trail. The sheriff grasped one of the outthrown arms. It was as rigid as iron, and the application of a gentle force rocked the entire body, without altering the relation of its parts. Brewer, pale with excitement, gazed intently into the distorted face. "'God of mercy!' he suddenly cried. 
It is Manton. You are right, said King, with an evident attempt at calmness. I knew Manton. He then wore a full beard and his hair long, but this is he. He might have added, I recognized him when he challenged Rosser. I told Rosser and Sancher who he was before we played him this horrible trick. When Rosser left this dark room at our heels, forgetting his outer clothing in the excitement, and driving away with us in his shirt-sleeves, all through the discreditable proceedings we knew whom we were dealing with, murderer and coward that he was. But nothing of this did Mr. King say. With his better light he was trying to penetrate the mystery of the man's death that he had not once moved from the corner where he had been stationed, that his posture was that of neither attack nor defense, that he had dropped his weapon, that he had obviously perished of sheer horror of something that he saw, these were circumstances which Mr. King's disturbed intelligence could not rightly comprehend. Groping in intellectual darkness for a clue to his maze of doubt, his gaze, directed mechanically downward in the way of one who ponders momentous matters, fell upon something which there in the light of day and in the presence of living companions affected him with terror in the dust of years that lay thick upon the floor leading from the door by which they had entered straight across the room to within a yard of manton's crouching corpse were three parallel lines of footprints light but definite impressions of bare feet the outer ones those of small children the inner a woman's from the point at which they ended they did not return. They pointed all one way. Brewer, who had observed them at the same moment, was leaning forward in an attitude of rapt attention, horribly pale. "'Look at that!' he cried, pointing with both hands at the nearest print of the woman's right foot, where she had apparently stopped and stood. "'The middle toe is missing. It was Gertrude!' Gertrude was the late Mrs. Manton, sister of Mr. Brewer. End of The Middle Toe of the Right Foot by Ambrose Bierce Three and One Are One by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tanya Three and One Are One by Ambrose Bierce In the year 1861, Bar Lassiter, a young man of twenty-two, lived with his parents and an elder sister near Carthage, Tennessee. The family were in somewhat humble circumstances, subsisting by cultivation of a small and not very fertile plantation, Owning no slaves, they were not rated among the best people of their neighborhood, but they were honest persons of good education, fairly well-mannered, and as respectable as any family could be if uncredentialed by personal dominion over the sons and daughters of Ham. The elder Lassiter had that severity of manner that so frequently affirms an uncompromising devotion to duty and conceals a warm and affectionate disposition. He was of the iron of which martyrs are made, but in the heart of the matrix had lurked a nobler metal, fusible at a milder heat, yet never coloring nor softening the hard exterior. By both heredity and environment, something of the man's inflexible character had touched the other members of the family. The Lassiter home, though not devoid of domestic affection, was a veritable citadel of duty, and duty, ah, duty, is as cruel as death. When the war came on, it found in the family, as in so many others in that state, a divided sentiment. The young man was loyal to the Union, the others savagely hostile. This unhappy division begot an insupportable domestic bitterness, and when the offending son and brother left home with the avowed purpose of joining the Federal Army, not a hand was laid in his, not a word of farewell was spoken, not a good wish followed him out into the world whether he went to meet with such spirit as he might whatever fate awaited him. Making his way to Nashville, already occupied by the army of General Buell, he enlisted in the first organization that he found, a Kentucky regiment of cavalry, and in due time passed through all the stages of military evolution, from raw recruit to experienced trooper. A right good trooper he was, too, although in his oral narrative from which this tale is made there was no mention of that. 
The fact was learned from his surviving comrades, for Bar Lassiter has answered here to the sergeant whose name is Death. Two years after he had joined it, his regiment passed through the region whence he had come. The country thereabout had suffered severely from the ravages of war, having been occupied alternately and simultaneously by the belligerent forces, and a sanguinary struggle had occurred in the immediate vicinity of the Lassiter homestead, but of this the young trooper was not aware. Finding himself in camp near his home, he felt a natural longing to see his parents and sister, hoping that in them, as in him, the unnatural animosities of the period had been softened by time and separation. Obtaining a leave of absence, he set foot in the late summer afternoon, and soon after the rising of the full moon was walking up the gravel path leading to the dwelling in which he had been born. Soldiers in war age rapidly, and in youth two years are a long time. Bar Lassiter felt himself an old man and had almost expected to find the place a ruin and a desolation. Nothing, apparently, was changed. At the sight of each dear and familiar object he was profoundly affected. His heart beat audibly. His emotion nearly suffocated him. An ache was in his throat. Unconsciously he quickened his pace until he almost ran, his long shadow making grotesque efforts to keep its place beside him. The house was unlighted, the door open. As he approached and paused to recover control of himself, his father came out and stood bareheaded in the moonlight. "'Father!' cried the young man, springing forward with outstretched hand. "'Father!' The elder man looked him sternly in the face, stood a moment motionless, and without a word withdrew into the house. Bitterly disappointed, humiliated, inexpressibly hurt and altogether unnerved, the soldier dropped upon a rustic seat in deep dejection, supporting his head upon his trembling hand. But he would not have it so. He was too good a soldier to accept repulse as defeat. He rose and entered the house, passing directly to the sitting-room. It was dimly lighted by an uncurtained east window. On a low stool by the hearth-side, the only article of furniture in the place, sat his mother, staring into a fireplace strewn with blackened embers and cold ashes. He spoke to her, tenderly, interrogatively, and with hesitation, but she neither answered, nor moved, nor seemed in any way surprised. True, there had been time for her husband to apprise her of their guilty son's return. He moved nearer, and was about to lay his hand upon her arm, when his sister entered from an adjoining room, looked him full in the face, passed him without a sign of recognition, and left the room by a door that was partly behind him. He had turned his head to watch her, but when she was gone his eyes again sought his mother. She, too, had left the place. Bar Lassiter strode to the door by which she had entered. The moonlight on the lawn was tremulous as if the sward were a rippling sea. The trees in their black shadows shook as in a breeze. Blended with its borders, the gravel walk seemed unsteady and insecure to step on. This young soldier knew the optical illusions produced by tears. He felt them on his cheek, and saw them sparkle on the breast of his trooper's jacket. He left the house and made his way back to camp. The next day, with no very definite intention, with no dominant feeling that he could rightly have named, he again sought the spot. Within a half-mile of it he met Bushrod Albro, a former playfellow and a schoolmate who greeted him warmly. "'I'm going to visit my home,' said the soldier. The other looked at him rather sharply, but said nothing. I know, continued Lassiter, that my folks have not changed, but— There have been changes, Albro interrupted. Everything changes. I'll go with you, if you don't mind. We can talk as we go. But Albro did not talk. Instead of a house they found only fire-blackened foundations of stone enclosing an area of compact ashes pitted by rains. Lassiter's astonishment was extreme. I could not find the right way to tell you, said Albro. In the fight a year ago your house was burned by a federal shell. And my family? Where are they? In heaven, I hope. All were killed by the shell. End of Three and One Are One by Ambrose Bierce Recording by Tanya March twenty fifth, 2011《Mr. Tilly's Seance》by E. F. Benson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lewis Richardson. Mr. Tilly's Seance by E. F. Benson. Mr. Tilly had only the briefest moment for reflection when, as he slipped and fell on the greasy wood pavement at Hyde Park Corner, which he was crossing at a smart trot, he saw the huge traction engine with its grooved ponderous wheels towering high above him. Oh dear, oh dear, he said petulantly, it will certainly crush me quite flat, and I shan't be able to be at Mrs. Cumberbatch's seance. Most provoking. Ow! The words were hardly out of his mouth when the first half of his horrid anticipations was thoroughly fulfilled. The heavy wheels passed over him from head to foot and flattened him completely out. Then the driver, too late, reversed his engine and passed over him again, and finally lost his head, whistled loudly, and stopped. The policeman on duty at the corner turned quite faint at the sight of the catastrophe, but presently recovered sufficiently to hold up the traffic and ran to see what on earth could be done. It was all so much up with Mr. Tilly that the only possible thing was to get the hysterical engine driver to move clear. Then the ambulance from the hospital was sent for, and Mr. Tilly's remains, detached with great difficulty from the road so firmly had they been pressed into it, were reverently carried away to the mortuary. Mr. Tilly during this had experienced one moment's excruciating pain, resembling the severest neuralgia, as his head was ground beneath the wheel. But almost before he realised it, the pain was past, and he found himself, still rather dazed, floating or standing, he did not know which, in the middle of the road. There had been no break in his consciousness, he perfectly recollected slipping, and wondered how he had managed to save himself. He saw the arrested traffic, the policeman with white one face making suggestions to the gibbering engine driver, and he received the very puzzling impression that the traction engine was all mixed up with him. He had a sensation of red-hot coals and boiling water and rivets all around him, but yet no feeling of scalding or burning or confinement. He was, on the contrary, extremely comfortable, and had the most pleasant consciousness of buoyancy and freedom. Then the engine puffed, and the wheels went round, and immediately, to his immense surprise, he perceived his own crushed remains, flat as a biscuit, lying on the roadway. He identified them for certain by his clothes, which he had put on for the first time that morning, and one patent leather boot, which had escaped demolition. But what on earth has happened, he said. Here am I, and yet that poor press flower of arms and legs is me, or rather I also. And how terribly upset the driver looks. Why, I do believe that I've been run over. It did hurt for a moment, now I come to think of it. My good man, where are you shoving to? Don't you see me? He addressed these two questions to the policeman, who appeared to walk right through him. But the man took no notice and calmly came out on the other side. It was quite evident that he did not see him or apprehend him in any way. Mr. Tilly was still feeling rather at sea amid these unusual occurrences, and there began to steal into his mind a glimpse of the fact, which was so obvious to the crowd, which formed an interested but respectful ring around his body. Men stood with bared heads, women screamed and looked away, and then looked back again. I really believe I'm dead, said he. That's the only hypothesis which will cover the facts. But I must feel more certain of it before I do anything. Ah, here they come with the ambulance to look at me. I must be terribly hurt. And yet I don't feel hurt. I should feel hurt, surely, if I was hurt. Hmm. I must be dead. Certainly it seemed the only thing for him to be. But he was far from realising it yet. A lane had been made through the crowd for the stretcher-bearers, and he found himself wincing when they began to detach him from the road. "'Oh, do take her,' he said. "'That's the sciatic nerve protruding there, surely, isn't it?' "'Ow! But no, it didn't hurt after all. "'My new clothes, too. "'I put them on today for the first time. "'What bad luck. "'Now you're holding my leg upside down. "'Of course all my money comes out of my trouser pocket. "'And there's my ticket for the seance. "'I must have that. "'I may use it after all.' He tweaked it out of the fingers of the man who had picked it up, and laughed to see the expression of amazement on his face as the card suddenly vanished. That gave him something fresh to think about, and he pondered for a moment over some touch of association set up by it. I have it, he thought. It is clear that the moment I came into connection with that card it became invisible. I'm invisible myself. 
of course to the grosser sense, and everything I hold becomes invisible, most interesting. That accounts for the sudden appearances of small objects at a seance. The spirit has been holding them, and as long as he holds them, they are invisible. Hmm. Then he lets go, and there's the flower or the spirit photograph on the table. It accounts too for the sudden disappearances of such objects. The spirit has taken them, though the scoffers say that the medium has secreted them about his person. It is true that when searched he sometimes appears to have done so, but after all that may be a joke on the part of the spirit. Now, what am I to do with myself? Let me see, there's the clock. It's just half past ten. All this has happened in a few minutes, for it's quarter past when I left my house. Half past ten now? Huh. What does that mean exactly? I used to know what it meant, but now it seems nonsense. Ten what? Hours, is it? What's an hour? This was very puzzling. He felt that he used to know what an hour and a minute meant, but the perception of that, naturally enough, had ceased with his emergence from time and space into eternity. The conception of time was like some memory which, refusing to record itself on the consciousness, lies perdu in some dark corner of the brain, laughing at the efforts of the owner to ferret it out. While he still interrogated his mind over this lapsed perception, he found that space, as well as time, had similarly grown obsolete for him, for he caught sight of his friend, Miss Ida Soulsby, who he knew was to be present at the séance for which he was bound hurrying with bird-like steps down the pavement opposite. Forgetting for the moment that he was a disembodied spirit, he made the effort of will which in his past human existence would have set his legs in pursuit of her, and found that the effort of will alone was enough to place him at her side. My dear Miss Soulsby, he said, I was on my way to Mrs. Cumberbatch's house when I was knocked down and killed. It was far from unpleasant, a moment's headache, so far his natural volubility had carried him before he recollected that he was invisible and inaudible to those still closed in by the muddy vesture of decay and stopped short. But though it was clear that what he said was inaudible to Miss Soulsby's rather large, intelligent-looking ears, it seemed that some consciousness of his presence was conveyed to her finer sense, for she looked suddenly startled. A flush rose to her face, and he heard her murmur, very odd. I wonder why I received so vivid an impression of dear Teddy. That gave Mr. Tilly a pleasant shock. He had long admired the lady, and here she was, alluding to him in her supposed privacy as dear Teddy. That was followed by a momentary regret that he had been killed. He would have liked to have been possessed of this information before, and have pursued the primrose path of dalliance down which it seemed to lead. His intentions, of course, would, as always, have been strictly honourable. The path of dalliance would have conducted them both, if she consented, to the altar, where the primroses would have been exchanged for orange blossom. But his regret was quite short-lived. Though the altar seemed inaccessible, the primrose path might still be open, for many of the spiritualistic circle in which he lived were on the most affectionate terms with the spiritual guides and friends who, like himself, had passed over. From a human point of view, these innocent and even elevating flirtations had always seemed to him rather bloodless, but now looking on them from the far side, he saw how charming they were, for they gave him the sense of still having a place and an identity in the world he had just quitted. He pressed Miss Ida's hand, or rather put himself into the spiritual condition of doing so, and could vaguely feel that it had some hint of warmth and solidity about it. From a human point of view, these innocent and even elevating flirtations had always seemed to him rather bloodless. But now, looking on them from the far side, he saw how charming they were, for they gave him the sense of still having a place and an identity in the world he had just quitted. He pressed Miss Ida's hand, or rather put himself into the spiritual condition of doing so, and could vaguely feel that it had some hint of warmth and solidity about it. This was gratifying, for it showed that though he had passed out of the material plane, he could still be in touch with it. Still more gratifying was it to observe that a pleased and secret smile overspread Miss Ida's fine features as he gave this token of his presence. Perhaps she smiled at her own thoughts, but in any case it was he who had inspired them. Encouraged by this, he indulged in a slightly more intimate token of affection, and permitted himself a respectful salute and saw that he had gone too far, 
for she said to herself, Hush, hush, and quickened her pace, as if to leave these amorous thoughts behind. He felt that he was beginning to adjust himself to the new conditions in which he would now live, or, at any rate, was getting some sort of inkling as to what they were. Time existed no more for him, nor yet did space, since the wish to be at Miss Ida's side had instantly transported him there and, with a view to testing this further, he wished himself back in his flat. As swiftly as the change of a scene in a cinematograph show, he found himself there, and perceived that the news of his death must have reached his servants, for the cook and parlour-maid, with excited faces, were talking over the event. "'Poor little gentleman,' said the cook. "'It seems such a shame it does. He never hurt a fly, and to think of one of those great engines laying him out flat.' I hope they'll take him to the cemetery from the hospital. I never could bear a corpse in the house. The great strapping parlour maid tossed her head. Well, I'm not sure that it doesn't serve him right, she observed. Always messing about with spirits he was, and the knockings and concertinas was awful sometimes when I'd been laying out supper in the dining room. Now perhaps he'll come himself and visit the rest of the loonies. But I'm sorry all the same. A less troublesome little gentleman never stepped. Always pleasant too, and wages paid to the day. These regretful comments and echaminiums were something of a shock to Mr. Tilly. He had imagined that his excellent servants regarded him with a respectful affection, as befitted some sort of demigod, and the role of the poor little gentleman was not at all to his mind. This revelation of their true estimate of him, although what they thought of him could no longer have the smallest significance, irritated him profoundly. I never heard such impertinence, he said, so he thought, quite out loud, and still intensely earthbound, was astonished to see that they had no perception whatever of his presence. He raised his voice, replete with extreme irony, and addressed his cook. You may reserve your criticism on my character for your saucepans, he said. They will no doubt appreciate them. As regards the arrangements for my funeral, I have already provided for them in my will, and do not propose to consult your convenience. Law, said Mrs. Inglis, I declare I can almost hear his voice, poor little fellow. Husky it was, as if he would do better by clearing his throat. I suppose I better be making a black bow for my cap, his lawyers and what not will be here presently. Mr. Tilly had no sympathy with this suggestion. He was immensely conscious of being quite alive, and the idea of his servants behaving as if he were dead, especially after the way in which they had spoken about him, was very vexing. He wanted to give them some striking evidence of his presence and his activity, and he banged his hand angrily on the dining-room table, from which the breakfast equipage had not yet been cleared. Three tremendous blows he gave it, and was rejoiced to see that his parlour-maid looked startled. Mrs. Inglis's face remained perfectly placid. "'Why, if I didn't hear a sort of rapping sound,' said Miss Tolton, "'where did it come from?' "'Nonsense! You've got the jump, dear,' said Mrs. Inglis, picking up a remaining rasher of bacon on a fork and putting it into her capacious mouth. Mr. Tilly was delighted at making any impression at all on either of these impercipient females. "'Tolton!' he called at the top of his voice. "'Why, what's that?' said Tolton. "'Almost hear his voice. Do you say, Mrs. Inglis? I declare I did hear his voice then.' "'A pack of nonsense, dear,' said Mrs. Inglis, placidly. "'That's a prime bit of bacon, and there's a good cut of it left. "'Why, you all of a tremble. It's your imagination.' Suddenly it struck Mr. Tilly that he might be employing himself much better than, with such extreme exertion, managing to convey so slight a hint of his presence to his parlour-maid, and that the seance at the house of the medium, Mrs. Cumberbatch, would afford him much easier opportunities of getting through to the earth plane again.' He gave a couple more thumps to the table, and, wishing himself at Mrs. Cumberbatch's nearly a mile away, scarcely heard the faint scream of Talton at the sound of his blows, before he found himself in West Norfolk Street. He knew the house well, and went straight to the drawing-room, which was the scene of the seances he had so often and so eagerly attended. Mrs. Cumberbatch, who had a long, spoon-shaped face, had already pulled down the blinds, leaving the room in total darkness, except for the glimmer of a Thai nightlight, which, under a shade of ruby glass, stood on the chimney-piece in front of the coloured photograph of Cardinal Newman. Round the table were seated Miss Ida Soulsby, Mr. and Mrs. Marriott, who paid their guineas at least twice a week in order to consult with their spiritual guide, Ababel, and received mysterious advice about their 
indigestion and investments. And Sir John Place, who was much interested in learning the details of his previous incarnation as a Chaldean priest, completed the circle. His guide, who revealed to him his sacerdotal career, was playfully called Messpot. Naturally, many other spirits visited them, for Miss Ilsby had no less than three guides in her spiritual household, Sapphire, Semiramis, and Sweet William. While Napoleon and Plato were not infrequent guests, Cardinal Newman too was a great favourite, and they encouraged his presence by the singing in unison of Lead Kindly Light. He could hardly ever resist that. Mr. Tilly observed with pleasure that there was a vacant seat by the table, which no doubt had been placed there for him. As he entered, Mrs. Cumberbatch peered at her watch. Eleven o'clock already, she said, and Mr. Tilly is not here yet. I wonder what can have kept him. What shall we do, dear friends? Abbebel gets very impatient sometimes if we keep him waiting. Mr. and Mrs. Marriott were getting impatient too, for he terribly wanted to ask about Mexican oils, and she had a very vexing heartburn. And Messpot doesn't like waiting either, said Sir John, jealous for the prestige of his protector. Not to mention Sweet William. Miss Soulsby gave a little silvery laugh. Oh, but my Sweet William's so good and kind, she said. Besides, I have a feeling, quite a psychic feeling, Mrs. Cumberbatch, that Mr. Tilly is very close. So I am, said Mr. Tilly. Indeed, as I walked here, continued Miss Soulsby, I felt that Mr. Tilly was somewhere quite close to me. Dear me, what's that? Mr. Tilly was so delighted at being sensed that he could not resist giving a tremendous tap on the table in a sort of pleased applause. Mrs. Cumberbatch heard it too. I'm sure that's Abibel come to tell us he is ready, she said. I know Abibel's knock. A little patience, Abibel. Let's give Mr. Tilly three minutes more and then begin. Perhaps if we put up the blinds, Abibel will understand we haven't begun. This was done, and Miss Soulsby glided to the window in order to make known Mr. Tilly's approach, for he always came along the opposite pavement and crossed over by the little island in the river of traffic. There was evidently some lately published news, for the readers of early editions were busy, and she caught sight of one of the advertisement boards bearing in large letters the announcement of a terrible accident at Hyde Park Corner. She drew in her breath with a hissing sound and turned away, unwilling to have her psychic tranquillity upset by the intrusion of painful incidents. But Mr. Tilly, who had followed her to the window and saw what she had seen, could hardly restrain a spiritual whoop of exultation. Why, it's about me, he said. Such large letters, too. Very gratifying. Subsequent editions will no doubt contain my name. He gave another loud rap to call attention to himself, and Mrs. Cumberbatch, sitting down in her antique chair, which had once belonged to Madame Blavatsky, again heard. Well, if that isn't Abibel again, she said, be quiet, naughty. Perhaps we had better begin. She recited the usual invocation to guides and angels, and leaned back in her chair. Presently she began to twitch and mutter, and shortly afterwards, with several loud snorts, relapsed into cataleptic immobility. There she lay, stiff as a poker, a port of call, so to speak, for any voyaging intelligence. With pleased anticipation, Mr. Tilly awaited their coming. How gratifying if Napoleon, with whom he had so often talked, recognised him and said, Pleased to see you, Mr. Tilly. I perceive you have joined us. The room was dark except for the ruby-shaded lamp in front of Cardinal Newman, but to Mr. Tilly's emancipated perceptions the withdrawal of mere material light made no difference, and he idly wondered why it was generally supposed that disembodied spirits like himself produce their most powerful effects in the dark. He could not imagine the reason for that, and what puzzled him still more, there was not to his spiritual perception any sign of those colleagues of his, for so he might now call them, who usually attended Mrs. Cumberbatch's seance in such gratifying numbers. Though she had been moaning and muttering a long time now, Mr. Tilly was in no way conscious of the presence of Abibel and Sweet William and Sapphire and Napoleon. They ought to be here by now, he said to himself. But while he still wondered at their absence, he saw to his amazed disgust that Medium's hand, now covered with a black glove, and thus invisible to ordinary human vision in the darkness, was groping about under the table and clearly searching for the megaphone trumpet which lay there. He found that he could read her mind with the same ease, though far less satisfaction, 
as he had read Miss Ida's half an hour ago, and knew that she was intending to apply the trumpet to her own mouth and pretend to be Abibel or Semirantis or somebody, whereas she affirmed that she never touched the trumpet herself. Much shocked at this, he snatched up the trumpet himself and observed that she was not in trance at all, for she opened her sharp black eyes, which always reminded him of buttons covered with American cloth, and gave a great gasp. Why, Mr. Tilly, she said, on the spiritual plane too. The rest of the circle was now singing Lee Kindly Light in order to encourage Cardinal Newman, and this conversation was conducted under cover of the hoarse, crooning voices. But Mr. Tilly had the feeling that though Mrs. Cumberbatch saw and heard him as clearly as he saw her, he was quite imperceptible to the others. Yes, I've been killed, he said, and I want to get in touch with the material world, that's why I came here. But I want to get in touch with other spirits too, and surely Abibel or Messpot ought to be here by this time. He received no answer and her eyes fell before his like those of a detected charlatan. A terrible suspicion invaded his mind. "'What, are you a fraud, Mrs. Cumberbatch?' he asked. "'Oh, for shame! Think of all the guineas I paid you.' "'You shall have them back,' said Mrs. Cumberbatch. "'But don't tell of me.' She began to whimper, and he remembered that she often made that sort of sniffling noise when Abibel was taking possession of her. "'That usually means that Abibel is coming,' he said with withering sarcasm. Come along, Amberbell, we're waiting. Give me the trumpet, whispered the miserable medium. Oh, please give me the trumpet. I shall do nothing of the kind, said Mr. Tilly indignantly. I would sooner use it myself. Ha! Ah, she gave a sob of relief. Oh, do, Mr. Tilly, she said. What a wonderful idea. It would be most interesting to everybody to hear you talk just after you've been killed. And before they know, it would be the making of me. And I'm not a fraud, at least not altogether. I do have spiritual perception sometimes. Spirits do communicate through me, and when they won't come through, it's a dreadful temptation to a poor woman to, to supplement them by human agency. And how could I be seeing and hearing you now, and be able to talk to you so pleasantly, I'm sure, if I hadn't supernormal powers? You've been killed, so you assure me, and yet I can see and hear you, quite plainly. Where did it happen, may I ask, if it's not a painful subject? Hyde Park Corner half an hour ago said Mr. Tilly. No, it only hurt for a moment, thanks. But what about your other suggestion? While the third verse of Lead Kindly Light was going on, Mr. Tilly applied his mind to this difficult situation. It was quite true that if Mrs. Cumberbatch had no power of communication with the unseen, she could not possibly have seen him. But she evidently had, and had heard him too, for the conversation had certainly been conducted on the spirit plane with perfect lucidity. Naturally, now that he was a genuine spirit, he did not want to be mixed up in a fraudulent mediumship, for he felt that such a thing would seriously compromise him on the other side, where, probably, it was widely known that Mrs. Cumberbatch was a person to be avoided. But on the other hand, having so soon found a medium through whom he could communicate with his friends, it was hard to take a high moral view, and say that he would have nothing whatever to do with her. I don't know if I trust you, he said. I shouldn't have a moment's peace if I thought that you were sending all sorts of bogus messages from me to the circle, which I wasn't responsible for at all. You've done it with Abibel and Messpot. How can I know that when I don't choose to communicate through you, you won't make up all sorts of piffle on your own account? She positively squirmed in her chair. Oh, I'll turn over a new leaf, she said. I will leave all that sort of thing behind me. And I am a medium. Look at me. Aren't I more real to you than any of the others? Don't I belong on your plane in a way that none of the others do? I may be occasionally fraudulent, and I can no more get Napoleon here than I can fly, but I'm genuine as well. Oh, Mr. Tilly, be indulgent to us poor human creatures. It isn't so long since you were one of us yourself. The mention of Napoleon, with the information that Mrs. Cumberbatch had never been controlled by that great creature, wounded Mr. Tilly again. Often in this darkened room he had held long colloquies with him, and Napoleon had given him most interesting details of his life on St. Helena, which, so Mr. Tilly had found, were often borne out by Lord Rosebery's pleasant volume, The Last Phase. But now the whole thing wore a more sinister aspect, and suspicion as solid as certainty bumped against his mind. Confess, he said, where did you get all that Napoleon talk from? You told us you had never read Lord Rosebery's book and allowed us to look through your library to see that it wasn't there. Be honest for once, Mrs. Cumberbatch. She suppressed a sob. I will, she said. The book was there all the time. I put it in an old cover called 
elegant extracts. But I'm not wholly a fraud. We are talking together. You are spirit, and I am mortal female. They can't hear us talk, but only look at me and you'll see. You can talk to them through me, if you'll only be so kind. I don't often get in touch with a genuine spirit like yourself. Mr. Tilly glanced at the other sitters and then back to the medium, who, to keep the others interested, was making weird gurgling sounds like an undervitalized siphon. Certainly she was far clearer to him than were the others, and her argument that she was able to see and hear him had great weight. And then a new and curious perception came to him. Her mind seemed to spread out before him like a pool of slightly muddy water, and he figured himself as standing on a headerboard above it, perfectly able, if he chose, to immerse himself in it. The objection to so doing was its muddiness, its materiality. The reason for so doing was that then he felt he would be able to be heard by the others, possibly to be seen by them. As it was, the loudest bangs on the table were only faintly perceptible. I'm beginning to understand, he said. Oh, Mr. Tilly, just jump in like a kind good spirit, she said. Make your own test conditions. Put your hand over my mouth to make sure that I'm not speaking, and keep hold of the trumpet. And you'll promise not to cheat me any more? he asked. Never. He made up his mind. All right, then, he said, and, so to speak, dived into her mind. He experienced the oddest sensation. It was like passing out of some fine, sunny air into the stuffiest of unventilated rooms. Space and time closed over him again. His head swam. His eyes were heavy. Then, with the trumpet in one hand, he laid the other firmly over her mouth. Looking round, he saw that the room seemed almost completely dark, but that the outline of the figures sitting round the table had vastly gained in solidity. Here I am, he said briskly. Miss Soulsby gave a startled exclamation. That's Mr. Tilly's voice, she whispered. Why, of course it is, said Mr. Tilly. I've just passed over at Hyde Park Corner, under a traction engine. He felt the dead weight of the medium's mind, her conventional conceptions, her mild, unreal piety pressing in on him from all sides, stifling and confusing him. Whatever he said had to pass through muddy water. There's a wonderful feeling of joy and lightness, he said. I can't tell you of the sunshine and happiness. We're all very busy and active, helping others, and it's such a pleasure, dear friends, to be able to get in touch with you all again. Death is not death, it is the gate of life. He broke off suddenly. Oh, I can't stand this, he said to the medium. You make me talk such twaddle. Do get your stupid mind out of the way. Can't we do anything in which you won't interfere with me so much? Can you give us some spirit lights round the room? Suggested Mrs. Cumberbatch in a sleepy voice. You have come through beautifully, Mr. Tilly. It is too dear of you. Are you sure you haven't arranged some phosphorescent patches already? Asked Mr. Tilly suspiciously. Yes, there are one or two near the chimney piece, said Mrs. Cumberbatch, but none anywhere else. Dear Mr. Tilly, I swear they're not. Just give us a nice star with long rays on the ceiling. Mr. Tilly was the most good-natured of men, always willing to help an unattractive female in distress, and whispering to her, I shall require the phosphorescent patches to be given into my hands after the seance. He proceeded, by the mere effort of his imagination, to light a beautiful big star with red and violet rays on the ceiling. Of course, it was not nearly as brilliant as his own conception of it, for its light had to pass through the opacity of the medium's mind, but it was still a most striking object, and elicited gasps of applause from the company. To enhance the effect of it, he intoned a few very pretty lines about a star by Adelaide Anne Proctor, whose poems had always seemed to him to emanate from the topmost peak of Parnassus. Oh, thank you, Mr. Tilly, whispered the medium. It was lovely. Would a photograph of it be permitted on some future occasion if you would be so kind to reproduce it again? Oh, I don't know, said Mr. Tilly irritably. I want to get out. I'm very hot and uncomfortable. And it's all so cheap. Cheap, ejaculated Mrs. Cumberbatch. Why, there's not a medium in London whose future wouldn't be made by a real, genuine star like that, say, twice a week? But I wasn't run over in order that I might make the fortunes of mediums, said Mr. Tilly. I want to go. It's all rather degrading. And I want to see something of my new world. I don't know what it's like yet. Oh, but Mr. Tilly, she said, you told us lovely things about it, how busy and happy you were. No, I didn't. It was you who said that. At least it was you who put it into my head. Even as he wished, he found himself emerging from the dull waters of Mrs. Cumberbatch's mind. There's a whole new world waiting for me, he said. I must go and see it. I'll come back and tell you, for it must be full of marvellous revelations. Suddenly, 
He felt the hopelessness of it. There was that thick fluid of materiality to pierce, and as it tripped off him again, he began to see that nothing of that fine, rare quality of life, which he had just begun to experience, could penetrate these opacities. That was why, perhaps, all that thus came across from the spirit world was so stupid, so banal. They of whom he now was one could tap on furniture, could light stars, could abound with commonplace, could read as in a book the mind of medium or sitters, but nothing more. They had to pass into the region of gross perceptions in order to be seen of blind eyes and be heard of deaf ears. Mrs. Cumberbatch stared. The power is failing, she said in a deep voice which Mr. Tilly felt was meant to imitate his own. I must leave you now, dear friends. He felt much exasperated. The power isn't failing, he shouted. It wasn't I who said that. Besides, I've got to see if it's true. Goodbye. Don't cheat any more. He dropped his card of admittance to the seance on the table and heard murmurs of excitement as he floated off. The news of the wonderful star and the presence of Mr. Tilly at the seance within half an hour of his death, which at the time was unknown to any of the sitters, spread swiftly through spiritualistic circles. The Psychical Research Society sent investigators to take independent evidence from all those present, but were inclined to attribute the occurrences to a subtle mixture of thought transference and unconscious visual impression when they heard that Miss Soulsby had, a few minutes previously, seen a newsboard in the street outside recording the accident at Hyde Park Corner. This explanation was rather elaborate, for it postulated that Miss Soulsby, thinking of Mr. Tilly's non-arrival, had combined that with the accident at Hyde Park Corner, and had probably, though unconsciously, seen the name of the victim on another newsboard, and had transferred the whole thing by telepathy to the mind of the medium. As for the star in the ceiling, though they could not account for it, they certainly found remains of phosphorescent paint on the panels of the wall above the chimney piece, and came to the conclusion that the star had been produced by some similar contrivance. So they rejected the whole thing, which was a pity, since for once the phenomena were absolutely genuine. Miss Soulsby continued to be a constant attendant at Mrs. Cumberbatch's seances, but never experienced the presence of Mr. Tilly again. On that the reader may put any interpretation he pleases. It looks to me somewhat as if he had found something else to do. But he had emerged too far, and perceived that nobody except the medium heard him. Oh, don't be vexed, Mr. Tilly, she said. That's only a formula, but you're leaving us very soon. Not time for just one materialization? They are more convincing than anything to most inquirers. Not one, said he. You don't understand how stifling it is even to speak through you. And make stars. But I'll come back as soon as I find there's anything new that I can get through to you. What's the use of my repeating all that stale stuff about being busy and happy? They've been told that often enough already. End of Mr. Tilly's Seance Recording by David Lewis Richardson, Lancashire, England. Beyond the Wall of Sleep by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beyond the Wall of Sleep by H. P. Lovecraft I have often wondered if the majority of mankind ever pause to reflect upon the occasionally titanic significance of dreams and of the obscure world to which they belong. Whilst the greater number of our nocturnal visions are perhaps no more than faint and fantastic reflections of our waking experiences, Freud, to the contrary, with his puerile symbolism, there are still a certain remainder whose immundane and ethereal character permit of no ordinary interpretation 
and whose vaguely exciting and disquieting effect suggests possible minute glimpses into a sphere of mental existence no less important than physical life, yet separated from that life by an all but impassable barrier. From my experience I cannot doubt but that man, when lost to terrestrial consciousness, is indeed sojourning in another and uncorporeal life of far different nature from the life we know, and of which only the slightest and most indistinct memories linger after waking. From those blurred and fragmentary memories we may infer much, yet prove little. We may guess that in dreams, life, matter, and vitality, as the earth knows such things, are not necessarily constant, and that time and space do not exist as our waking selves comprehend them. Sometimes I believe that this less material life is our truer life, and that our vain presence on the terraqueous globe is itself the secondary or merely virtual phenomenon. It was from a youthful reverie, filled with speculations of this sort, that I arose one afternoon in the winter of 1900-01. When to the State Psychopathic Institution in which I served as an intern was brought the man whose case has ever since haunted me so unceasingly. His name, as given on the records, was Joe Slater, or Slarder and his appearance was that of the typical denizen of the Catskill Mountain region, one of those strange, repellent scions of a primitive colonial peasant stock whose isolation for nearly three centuries in the hilly fastnesses of a little travelled countryside has caused them to sink to a kind of barbaric degeneracy rather than advance with their more fortunately placed brethren of the thickly settled districts. Among these odd folk, who correspond exactly to the decadent element of white trash in the South, law and morals are non-existent, and their general mental status is probably below that of any other section of Native American people. Joe Slater, who came to the institution in the vigilant custody of four state policemen, and who was described as a highly dangerous character, certainly presented no evidence of his perilous disposition when I first beheld him. Though well above middle stature, and of somewhat brawny frame, he was given an absurd appearance of harmless stupidity by the pale, sleepy blueness of his small, watery eyes, the scantiness of his neglected and never-shaven growth of yellow beard, and the listless drooping of his heavy nether lip. His age was unknown, since among his kind neither family records nor permanent family ties exist, but from the baldness of his head in front, and from the decayed condition of his teeth, the head surgeon wrote him down as a man of about forty. From the medical and court documents we learned all that could be gathered of his case. This man, a vagabond, hunter, and trapper, had always been strange in the eyes of his primitive associates. He had habitually slept at night beyond the ordinary time, and upon waking would often talk of unknown things in a manner so bizarre as to inspire fear even in the hearts of an unimaginative populace. Not that his form of language was at all unusual, for he never spoke save in the debased patois of his environment, but the tone and tenor of his utterance were of such mysterious wildness that none might listen without apprehension. He himself was generally as terrified and baffled as his auditors, and within an hour after awakening would forget all that he had said, or at least all that had caused him to say what he did, relapsing into a bovine, half-amiable normality, like that of the other hill-dwellers. As Slater grew older, 
It appeared his matutinal aberrations had gradually increased in frequency and violence, till about a month before his arrival at the institution had occurred the shocking tragedy which caused his arrest by the authorities. One day, near noon, after a profound sleep begun in a whisky debauch at about five of the previous afternoon, the man had aroused himself most suddenly with ululations so horrible and unearthly that they brought several neighbours to his cabin, a filthy sty where he dwelt with a family as indescribable as himself. Rushing out into the snow, he had flung his arms aloft and commenced a series of leaps directly upward in the air, the while shouting his determination to reach some big, big cabin with brightness in the roof and walls and floor and the loud, queer music far away. As two men of moderate size sought to restrain him, he had struggled with maniacal force and fury, screaming of his desire and need to find and kill a certain thing that shines and shakes and laughs. At length, after temporarily felling one of his detainers with a sudden blow, he had flung himself upon the other in a demoniac ecstasy of bloodthirstiness, shrieking fiendishly that he would jump high in the air and burn his way through anything that stopped him. Family and neighbours had now fled in a panic, and when the most courageous of them returned, Slater was gone leaving behind an unrecognisable, pulp-like thing that had been a living man but an hour before. None of the mountaineers had dared to pursue him, and it is likely that they would have welcomed his death from the cold, but when several mornings later they heard his screams from a distant ravine, they realised that he had somehow managed to survive and that his removal in one way or another would be necessary. They had followed an armed searching party, whose purpose, whatever it may have been originally, became that of a sheriff's posse, after one of the seldom popular state troopers had by accident observed, then questioned, and finally joined the seekers. On the third day, Slater was found unconscious in the hollow of a tree, and taken to the nearest jail, where alienists from Albany examined him as soon as his senses returned. To them he told a simple story. He had, he said, gone to sleep one afternoon about sundown, after drinking much liquor. He had awakened to find himself standing, bloody-handed in the snow, before his cabin, the mangled corpse of his neighbour, Peter Slader, at his feet. Horrified, he had taken to the woods in a vague effort to escape from the scene of what must have been his crime. Beyond these things he seemed to know nothing, nor could the expert questioning of his interrogators bring out a single additional fact. That night Slater slept quietly, and the next morning he awakened with no singular feature save a certain alteration of expression. Dr. Barnard, who had been watching the patient, thought he noticed in the pale blue eyes a certain gleam of peculiar quality, and in the flaccid lips an all but imperceptible tightening, as if of intelligent determination. But, when questioned, Slater relapsed into the habitual vacancy of the mountaineer, and only reiterated what he had said on the preceding day. On the third morning occurred the first of the man's mental attacks. After some show of uneasiness in sleep, he burst forth into a frenzy so powerful that the combined efforts of four men were needed to bind him in a straitjacket. The alienists listened with keen attention to his words, 
since their curiosity had been aroused to a high pitch by the suggestive yet mostly conflicting and incoherent stories of his family and neighbours. Slater raved for upward of fifteen minutes, babbling in his backwoods dialect of green edifices of light, oceans of space, strange music, and shadowy mountains and valleys. But most of all did he dwell upon some mysterious blazing entity that shook and laughed and mocked at him. This vast, vague personality seemed to have done him a terrible wrong, and to kill it in a triumphant revenge was his paramount desire. In order to reach it, he said, he would soar through abysses of emptiness, burning every obstacle that stood in his way. Thus ran his discourse, until with the greatest suddenness he ceased. The fire of madness died from his eyes, and in dull wonder he looked at his questioners, and asked why he was bound. Dr. Barnard unbuckled the leather harness, and did not restore it till night, when he succeeded in persuading Slater to don it of his own volition, for his own good. The man had now admitted that he sometimes talked queerly, though he knew not why. Within a week two more attacks appeared, but from them the doctors learned little. On the source of Slater's visions they speculated at length, for, since he could neither read nor write, and had apparently never heard a legend or fairy tale, his gorgeous imagery was quite inexplicable. That it could not come from any known myth or romance was made especially clear by the fact that the unfortunate lunatic expressed himself only in his own simple manner. He raved of things he did not understand and could not interpret, things which he claimed to have experienced, but which he could not have learned through any normal or connected narration. The alienists soon agreed that abnormal dreams were the foundation of the trouble, dreams whose vividness could for a time completely dominate the waking mind of this basically inferior man. With due formality, Slater was tried for murder, acquitted on the ground of insanity, and committed to the institution wherein I held so humble a post. I have said that I am a constant speculator concerning dream life, and from this you may judge of the eagerness with which I applied myself to the study of the new patient as soon as I had fully ascertained the facts of his case. He seemed to sense a certain friendliness in me, born, no doubt, of the interest I could not conceal, and the gentle manner in which I questioned him. Not that he ever recognised me during his attacks, when I hung breathlessly to his chaotic but cosmic word pictures, but he knew me in his quiet hours, when he would sit by his barred window, weaving baskets of straw and willow, and perhaps pining for the mountain freedom he could never again enjoy. His family never called to see him. Probably it had found another temporary head, after the manner of decadent mountain folk. By degrees I commenced to feel an overwhelming wonder at the mad and fantastic conceptions of Joe Slater. The man himself was pitiably inferior in mentality and language alike, but his glowing titanic visions, though described in a barbarous, disjointed jargon, were assuredly things which only a superior, or even exceptional brain, could conceive. How, I often ask myself, could the stolid imagination of a Catskill degenerate conjure up sights whose very possession argued a lurking spark of genius? 
How could any backwoods dullard have gained so much as an idea of those glittering realms of supernatural radiance and space about which Slater ranted in his furious delirium? More and more I inclined to the belief that in the pitiful personality who cringed before me lay the disordered nucleus of something beyond my comprehension, something infinitely beyond the comprehension of my more experienced but less imaginative medical and scientific colleagues. And yet I could extract nothing definite from the man. The sum of all my investigation was that in a kind of semi-corporeal dream life Slater wandered or floated through resplendent and prodigious valleys, meadows, gardens, cities, and palaces of light in a region unbounded and unknown to man, that there he was no peasant or degenerate, but a creature of importance and vivid life, moving proudly and dominantly, and checked only by a certain deadly enemy, who seemed to be a being of visible yet ethereal structure, and who did not appear to be of human shape, since Slater never referred to it as a man, or as out save a thing. This thing had done Slater some hideous but unnamed wrong, which the maniac, if maniac he were, yearned to avenge. From the manner in which Slater alluded to their dealings, I judged that he and the luminous thing had met on equal terms, that in his dream existence the man was himself a luminous thing of the same race as his enemy. This impression was sustained by his frequent references to flying through space and burning all that impeded his progress. Yet these conceptions were formulated in rustic words wholly inadequate to convey them a circumstance which drove me to the conclusion that if a dream world indeed existed, oral language was not its medium for the transmission of thought. Could it be that the dream soul, inhabiting this inferior body, was desperately struggling to speak things which the simple and halting tongue of dullness could not utter? Could it be that I was face to face with intellectual emanations which would explain the mystery if I could but learn to discover and read them? I did not tell the older physicians of these things, for middle age is sceptical, cynical, and disinclined to accept new ideas. Besides, the head of the institution had but lately warned me, in his paternal way, that I was overworking, that my mind needed rest. It had long been my belief that human thought consists, basically, of atomic or molecular motion, convertible into either waves or radiant energy like heat, light, and electricity. This belief had early led me to contemplate the possibility of telepathy, or mental communication, by means of suitable apparatus, and I had, in my college days, prepared a set of transmitting and receiving instruments somewhat similar to the cumbrous devices employed in wireless telegraphy at that crude pre-radio period. These I had tested with a fellow student, but achieving no result had soon packed them away with other scientific odds and ends for possible future use. Now, in my intense desire to probe into the dream life of Slater, 
I sought these instruments again, and spent several days in repairing them for action. When they were complete, once more, I missed no opportunity for their trial. At each outburst of Slater's violence, I would fit the transmitter to his forehead and the receiver to my own, constantly making delicate adjustments for various hypothetical wavelengths of intellectual energy. I had but little notion of how the thought impressions would, if successfully conveyed, arouse an intelligent response in my brain. But I felt certain that I could detect and interpret them. Accordingly, I continued my experiments, though informing no one of their nature. It was on the 21st of February, 1901, that the thing occurred. As I look back across the years, I realize how unreal it seems, and sometimes wonder if old Dr. Fenton was not right when he charged it all to my excited imagination. I recall that he listened with great kindness and patience when I told him, but afterward gave me a nerve powder, and arranged for the half-year's vacation on which I departed the next week. That fateful night I was wildly agitated and perturbed, for despite the excellent care he had received, Joe Slater was unmistakably dying. Perhaps it was his mountain freedom that he missed, or perhaps the turmoil in his brain had grown too acute for his rather sluggish physique. But, at all events, the flame of his vitality flickered low in the decadent body. He was drowsy near the end, and as darkness fell, he dropped off into a troubled sleep. I did not strap on the straight jacket, as was customary when he slept, since I saw that he was too feeble to be dangerous, even if he woke in mental disorder once more before passing away. But I did place upon his head and mine the two ends of my cosmic radio, hoping against hope for a first and last message from the dream world in the brief time remaining. In the cell with us was one nurse, a mediocre fellow, who did not understand the purpose of the apparatus, or think to inquire into my course. As the hours wore on, I saw his head droop awkwardly in sleep, but I did not disturb him. I myself, lulled by the rhythmical breathing of the healthy and the dying man, must have nodded a little later. The sound of weird lyric melody was what aroused me. Chords, vibrations, and harmonic ecstasies echoed passionately on every hand, while on my ravished sight burst the stupendous spectacle of ultimate beauty. Walls, columns, and architraves of living fire blazed effulgently around the spot where I seemed to float in air, extending upward to an infinitely high vaulted dome of indescribable splendour. Blending with this display of palatial magnificence, or rather supplanting it at times in kaleidoscopic rotation, were glimpses of wide plains and graceful valleys, high mountains and inviting grottoes, covered with every lovely attribute of scenery which my delighted eyes could conceive of, yet formed wholly of some glowing, ethereal, plastic entity, which in consistency partook as much of spirit as of matter. As I gazed, I perceived that my own brain held the key to these enchanting metamorphoses, for each vista which appeared to me 
was the one my changing mind most wished to behold. Amidst this Elysian realm I dwelt not as a stranger, for each sight and sound was familiar to me, just as it had been for uncounted eons of eternity before, and would be for like eternities to come. Then the resplendent aura of my brother of light drew near, and held colloquy with me, soul to soul, with silent and perfect interchange of thought. The hour was one of approaching triumph, for was not my fellow-being escaping at last from a degrading periodic bondage? escaping for ever, and preparing to follow the accursed oppressor even unto the uttermost fields of ether, that upon it might be wrought a flaming cosmic vengeance which would shake the spheres. We floated thus for a little time, when I perceived a slight blurring and fading of the objects around us, as though some force were recalling me to earth, where I least wished to go. The form near me seemed to feel a change also, for it gradually brought its discourse toward a conclusion, and itself prepared to quit the scene, fading from my sight at a rate somewhat less rapid than that of the other objects. A few more thoughts were exchanged, and I knew that the Luminous One and I were being recalled to bondage, though for my brother of light it would be the last time. The sorry planet shell being well nigh spent, in less than an hour my fellow would be free to pursue the oppressor along the Milky Way and pass the hither stars to the very confines of infinity. A well-defined shock separates my final impression of the fading scene of light from my sudden and somewhat shame-faced awakening and straightening up in my chair as I saw the dying figure on the couch move hesitantly. Joe Slater was indeed awakening, though probably for the last time. As I looked more closely, I saw that in the sallow cheeks shone spots of colour which had never before been present. The lips, too, seemed unusual, being tightly compressed, as if by the force of a stronger character than had been Slater's. The whole face finally began to grow tense, and the head turned restlessly with closed eyes. I did not rouse the sleeping nurse, but readjusted the slightly disarranged headband of my telepathic radio, intent to catch any parting message the dreamer might have to deliver. All at once the head turned sharply in my direction, and the eyes fell open, causing me to stare in blank amazement at what I beheld. The man who had been Joe Slater, the Catskill decadent, was gazing at me with a pair of luminous, expanding eyes, whose blue seemed subtly to have deepened. Neither mania nor degeneracy was visible in that gaze, and I felt beyond a doubt that I was viewing a face behind which lay an active mind of high order. At this juncture, my brain became aware of a steady external influence operating upon it. I closed my eyes to concentrate my thoughts more profoundly, and was rewarded by the positive knowledge that my long-sought mental message had come at last. Each transmitted idea 
formed rapidly in my mind, and though no actual language was employed, my habitual association of conception and expression was so great that I seemed to be receiving the message in ordinary English. Joe Slater is dead, came the sole petrifying voice of an agency from beyond the wall of sleep. My opened eyes sought the couch of pain in curious horror, but the blue eyes were still calmly gazing, and the countenance was still intelligently animated. He is better dead, for he was unfit to bear the active intellect of cosmic entity. His gross body could not undergo the needed adjustments between ethereal life and planet life. He was too much an animal, too little a man. Yet it is through his deficiency that you have come to discover me. For the cosmic and planet souls rightly should never meet. He has been my torment and diurnal prison for forty-two of your terrestrial years. I am an entity like that which you yourself become in the freedom of dreamless sleep. I am your brother of light, and have floated with you in the effulgent valleys. It is not permitted me to tell your waking earth self of your real self. But we are all roamers of vast spaces, and travellers in many ages. Next year I may be dwelling in the Egypt which you call ancient, or in the cruel empire of Tsan Chan, which is to become three thousand years hence. You and I have drifted to the worlds that reel about the red Arcturus, and dwelt in the bodies of the insect philosophers that crawl proudly over the fourth moon of Jupiter. How little does the earth self know life and its extent! <laughs> How little indeed ought it to know for its own tranquillity! Of the oppressor, I cannot speak. You on earth have unwittingly felt its distant presence. You, without knowing idly, gave the blinking beacon the name of Algol, the demon star. It is to meet and conquer the oppressor that I have vainly striven for eons, held back by bodily encumbrances. Tonight I go as a nemesis, bearing just and blazingly cataclysmic vengeance. Watch me in the sky, close by the demon star. I cannot speak longer, for the body of Joe Slater grows cold and rigid, and the coarse brains are ceasing to vibrate as I wish. You have been my only friend on this planet, the only soul to sense and seek for me within the repellent form which lies on this couch. We shall meet again, perhaps in the shining mists of Orion's sword, 
perhaps on a bleak plateau in prehistoric Asia, perhaps in unremembered dreams to-night, perhaps in some other form, an eon hence, when the solar system shall have been swept away. At this point the thought-waves abruptly ceased. The pale eyes of the dreamer, or, or can I say dead man, commenced to glaze fishily. In a half-stupor I crossed over to the couch and felt of his wrist, but found it cold, stiff, and pulseless. The sallow cheeks paled again, and the thick lips fell open disclosing the repulsively rotten fangs of the degenerate Joe Slater. I shivered, pulled a blanket over the hideous face, and awakened the nurse. Then I left the cell and went silently to my room. I had an instant and unaccountable craving for a sleep whose dreams I should not remember. The climax? What plain tale of science can boast of such rhetorical effect? I have merely set down certain things appealing to me as facts, allowing you to construe them as you will. As I have already admitted, my superior, old Dr. Fenton, denies the reality of everything I have related. He vows that I was broken down with nervous strain, and badly in need of a long vacation, on full pay which he so generously gave me. He assures me, on his professional honour, that Joe Slater was but a low-grade paranoic, whose fantastic notions must have come from the crude hereditary folk-tales which circulated in even the most decadent of communities. All this he tells me, yet I cannot forget what I saw in the sky on the night after Slater died. Lest you think me a biased witness, Another pen must add this final testimony, which may perhaps supply the climax you expect. I will quote the following account of the star Nova Persei, verbatim, from the pages of that eminent astronomical authority, Professor Garrett P. Service. On February 22nd, 1901, a marvellous new star was discovered by Dr. Anderson of Edinburgh, not very far from Algol. No star had been visible at that point before. Within twenty-four hours the stranger had become so bright that it outshone Capella. In a week or two it had visibly faded, and in the course of a few months it was hardly discernible with the naked eye. End of Beyond the Wall of Sleep Recording by Jesse P. Watson j.p.watson at hotmail.co.uk The Toll House by W. W. Jacobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jesse P. Watson The Toll House by W. W. Jacobs It's all nonsense, said Jack Barnes. Of course people have died in the house. People die in every house. As for the noises... Wind in the chimney and rats in the wainscot are very convincing to a nervous man. Give me another cup of tea, Meagle. Lester and Weiser first, said Meagle, 
who was presiding at the tea table of the Three Feathers Inn. You've had to. Lester and White finished their cups with irritating slowness, pausing between sips to sniff the aroma and to discover the sex and dates of arrival of the strangers which floated in some numbers in the beverage. And Mr. Meagle served them to the brim, and then, turning to the grimly expectant Mr. Barnes, blandly requested him to ring for hot water. "'We'll try and keep your nerves in their present healthy condition,' he remarked. "'For my part, I have a sort of half-and-half -half belief in the supernatural.' "'All sensible people have,' said Lester. "'An aunt of mine saw a ghost once.' <laughs> White nodded. "'I had an uncle that saw one,' he said. "'It always is somebody else that sees them,' said Barnes. "'Well, there is a house,' said Meagle, "'a large house at an absurdly low rent, and nobody will take it. "'It has taken toll of at least one life of every family that has lived there, "'however short the time, and since it has stood empty, "'caretaker after caretaker has died there. "'The last caretaker died fifteen years ago.' "'Exactly,' said Barnes. "'Long enough ago for legends to accumulate.' "'I'll bet you a sovereign you won't spend the night there alone, for all you talk,' said White, suddenly. "'And I,' said Lester. "'No,' said Barnes, slowly. "'I don't believe in ghosts, nor in any supernatural things, whatever. "'All the same, I admit that I should not care to pass a night there alone. "'But why not?' inquired White. "'Went in the chimney,' said Meagle, with a grin. "'Rats in the wainscoat, chimed in Lester. "'As you like,' said Barnes, colouring. "'Suppose we all go,' said Meagle. "'Start after supper, and get there about eleven. "'We have been walking for ten days now without an adventure, "'except Barnes' discovery that ditch water smells longest. "'It will be a novelty at any rate, "'and if we break the spell by all surviving, "'the grateful owner ought to come down handsome. "'Let's see what the landlord has to say about it first, said Lester. "'There is no fun in passing a night in an ordinary empty house. "'Let us make sure that it is haunted.' He rang the bell, and, sending for the landlord, appealed to him in the name of our common humanity not to let them waste a night watching in a house in which spectres and hobgoblins had no part. The reply was more than reassuring, and the landlord, after describing with considerable art the exact appearance of a head which had been seen hanging out of a window in the moonlight, wound up with a polite but urgent request that they would settle his bill before they went. "'It's all very well for you young gentlemen to have your fun,' he said indulgently. "'But supposing as how you are all found dead in the morning, what about me? <laughs> it ain't called the Toll House for nothing, you know.' "'Who died there last?' inquired Barnes, with an air of polite derision. "'A tramp,' was the reply. "'He went there for the sake of half a crown, and they found him next morning hanging from the balusters, dead.' "'Suicide,' said Barnes. "'On sound mind.' The landlord nodded. "'That's what the jury brought in,' he said slowly. "'But... His mind was sound enough when he went in there. I'd known him, off and on, for years. I'm a poor man, but I wouldn't spend the night in that house for a hundred pounds. He repeated this remark as they started on their expedition a few hours later. They left as the inn was closing for the night. Bolts shot noisily behind them, and as their regular customers trudged slowly homewards, they set off at a brisk pace in the direction of the house. Most of the cottages were already in darkness, 
and lights in others went out as they passed. It seems rather hard that we have got to lose a night's rest in order to convince Barnes of the existence of ghosts, said White. It's in a good cause, said Meagle. A most worthy object, and something seems to tell me that we shall succeed. You didn't get forget the candles, Lester? I have brought two, was the reply. All the old man could spare. <laughs> there was but little moon, and the night was cloudy. The road between high hedges was dark, and, in one place, where it ran through a wood, so black that they twice stumbled in the uneven ground at the side of it. "'Fancy leaving our comfortable beds for this,' said White again. "'Let me see. Uh, this desirable residential sepulchre lies to the right, doesn't it?' <laughs> "'Farther on,' said Meagle. They walked on for some time in silence, broken only by White's tribute to the softness, the cleanliness, and the comfort of the bed which was receding farther and farther into the distance. Under Meagle's guidance they turned off at last to the right, and after a walk of quarter of a mile saw the gates of the house before them. The lodge was almost hidden by overgrowth shrubs, and the drive was choked with rank growths. Meagle leading, they pushed through it until the dark pile of the house loomed above them. There is a window at the back where we can get in, so the landlord says, said Lester, as they stood before the hall door. Window, said Meagle. <laughs> Nonsense! Let's do the thing properly. Where's the knocker? He felt for it in the darkness, and gave a thundering rat-tat-tat at the door. "'Don't play the fool,' said Barnes crossly. "'Ghostly servants are all asleep,' said Meagle gravely. "'But I'll wake them up before I've done with them. It's scandalous keeping us out here in the dark.' He plied the knocker again, and the noise volleyed in the emptiness beyond. Then. With a sudden exclamation, he put out his hands and stumbled forward. "'Why, it was open all the time,' he said, with an odd catch in his voice. "'Come on!' "'I don't believe it was open,' said Lester, hanging back. "'Somebody is playing us a trick!' "'Nonsense!' said Meagle sharply. "'Give us a candle, thanks. Who's got a match?' Barnes produced a box and struck one, and Meagle— Shielding the candle with his hand, led the way forward to the foot of the stairs. "'Shut the door, somebody,' he said. "'There's too much draught.' "'It is shut,' said White, glancing behind him. Meagle fingered his chin. "'Who shut it?' he inquired, looking from one to the other. "'Who came in last?' "'I did,' said Lester. "'But I don't remember shutting it. <laughs> oh, "'Perhaps I did, though.' Meagle, about to speak, thought better of it, and still carefully guarding the flame, began to explore the house with the others close behind. Shadows danced on the walls, and lurked in the corners as they proceeded. At the end of the passage they found a second staircase, and ascended it slowly, gaining the first floor. "'Careful!' said Meagle, as they gained the landing. He held the candle forward, and showed where the balusters had broken away. Then he peered curiously into the void beneath. "'This is where the tramp hanged himself, I suppose,' he said thoughtfully. "'You've got an unwholesome mind,' said White, as they walked on. "'This place is quite creepy enough without your remembering that.' Now let's find a comfortable room and have a little nip of whisky apiece and a pipe. How will this do? He opened a door at the end of the passage and revealed a small square room. Meagle led the way with the candle, and, first melting a drop or two of tallow, stuck it on the mantelpiece. The others seated themselves on the floor and watched pleasantly as White drew from his pocket a small bottle of whisky and a tin cup. "'Hm! I've forgotten the water!' he exclaimed. 
I'll soon get some, said Meagle. He tugged violently at the bell handle, and the rusty jangling of a bell sounded from a distant kitchen. He rang again. Don't play fool, said Barnes roughly. Meagle laughed. I only wanted to convince you, he said kindly. There ought to be, at any rate, one ghost in the servants' hall. Barnes held up his hand for silence. Yes, said Meagle, with a grin at the other two. Is somebody coming? Suppose we drop this game and, and go back, said Barnes suddenly. I don't believe in spirits, but nerves are outside anybody's command. You may laugh as you like, but it really seemed to me that I heard a door open below and steps on the stairs. His voice was drowned in a roar of laughter. He's coming round, said Meagle with a smirk. By the time I have done with him, he will be a confirmed believer. Well, who will go and get some water? Will you, Barnes? No, was the reply. If there is any, it might not be safe to drink after all these years, said Lester. We must do without it. Meagle nodded, and taking a seat on the floor, held out his hand for the cup. The pipes were lit, and the clean, wholesome smell of tobacco filled the room. White produced a pack of cards. Talk and laughter rang through the room, and died away reluctantly in distant corridors. Empty rooms always delude me into the belief that I possess a deep voice, said Meagle. Tomorrow, he started up with a smothering exclamation as the light went out suddenly and something struck him on the head. The others sprang to their feet. Then Meagle laughed. It's the candle, <laughs> he explained. I didn't stick it enough. Barnes struck a match, and relighting the candle, stuck it on the mantelpiece, and, sitting down, took up his cards again. "'What was I going to say?' uh, said Meagle. "'Oh, I know. Tomorrow I—' "'Listen,' said White, laying his hand on the other's sleeve. "'Upon my word, I really thought I heard a laugh.' "'Look here,' said Barnes. "'What do you say to going back? I've had enough of this. I keep fancying that I hear things too, sounds of something moving about in the passage outside. I know it's only fancy, but it's uncomfortable.' "'You go if you want to,' said Meagle, "'and we will play dummy, or you might ask the tramp to take your hand for you as you go downstairs.' Barnes shivered and exclaimed angrily. He got up, and— Walking to the half-closed door, listened. "'Go outside,' said Meagle, winking at the other two. "'I'll dare you to go down to the hall door and back by yourself.' Barnes came back and, bending forward, lit his pipe at the candle. "'I am nervous, but rational,' he said, blowing out a thin cloud of smoke. My nerves tell me that there is something prowling up and down the long passage outside. My reason tells me that it is all nonsense. Now, where are my cards? He sat down again, and, taking up his hand, looked through it carefully, and led. Your play, White, he said, after a pause. White made no sign. Why, he is asleep said Meagle. Wake up, old man. Wake up and play. Lester, who was sitting next to him, took the sleeping man by the arm and shook him, gently at first, and then with some roughness, but White, with his back against the wall and his head bowed, made no sign. Meagle bawled in his ear, and then turned a puzzled face to the other. He sleeps like the dead, he said, grimacing. Well, uh, there are still three of us to keep each other company. Yes, said Lester, nodding. Unless, good Lord, suppose... He broke off, and eyed them trembling. Suppose what? inquired Meagle. Nothing, <laughs> stammered Lester. Let's wake him. Try him again. White, wake! It's no good, 
said Meagle, seriously. There's something wrong about that sleep. That's what I meant, said Lester. And if he goes to sleep like that, why shouldn't... Meagle sprang to his feet. Nonsense, he said roughly. He's tired out, that's all. Still, uh, let's take him up and clear out. You take his legs and Barnes will lead the way with the candle. Yes? Who's that? He looked up quickly towards the door. I thought I heard somebody tap, he said with a shamefaced laugh. Now, uh, Lester, up with him. One, two... Lester? Lester! He sprang forward too late. Lester, with his face buried in his arms, had rolled over on the floor fast asleep, and his utmost efforts failed to awaken him. He is asleep, he stammered. Asleep! <laughs> Barnes, who had taken the candle from the mantelpiece, stood peering at the sleepers in silence and dropping tallow over the floor. We must get out of this, said Meagle. Quick! Barnes hesitated. We can't leave them here, he said. We must, said Meagle, in strident tones. If you go to sleep, I shall go. Quick, come! He seized the other by the arm and strove to drag him to the door. Barnes shook him off, and putting the candle back on the mantelpiece, tried again to arouse the sleepers. It's no good, he said at last, and turning from them watched Meagle. Don't you go to sleep, he said anxiously. Meagle shook his head, and they stood for some time in uneasy silence. May as well shut the door, said Barnes at last. He crossed over and closed it gently. Then, at a scuffling noise behind him, he turned and saw Meagle in a heap on the hearthstone. With a sharp catch in his breath, he stood motionless. Inside the room, the candle, fluttering in the draught, showed dimly the grotesque attitudes of the sleepers. Beyond the door, there seemed to his overwrought imagination a strange and stealthy unrest. He tried to whistle, but his lips were parched, and in a mechanical fashion he stooped and began to pick up the cards which littered the floor. He stopped once or twice and stood with bent head, listening. The unrest outside seemed to increase. A loud creaking sounded from the stairs. "'Who is there?' he cried loudly. The creaking ceased. He crossed to the door, and, flinging it open, strode out into the corridor. As he walked, his fears left him suddenly. "'All of you! All of you! Show your faces, your infernal ugly faces! Don't skulk!' He laughed again and walked on, and the heap in the fireplace put out his head, tortoise fashion, and listened in horror to the retreating footsteps. Not until they had become inaudible in the distance did the listener's features relax. "'Good Lord, Lester! We've driven him mad!' he said in a frightened whisper. "'We must go after him!' There was no reply. Meagle sprung to his feet. "'Do you hear?' he cried. "'Stop your fooling now! This is serious! What? Lester, do you hear?' He bent and surveyed them in angry bewilderment. "'All right,' he said, in a trembling voice. "'You won't frighten me, you know.' <laughs> he turned away, and walked with exaggerated carelessness in the direction of the door. He even went outside and peeped through the crack, but the sleepers did not stir. He glanced into the blackness behind, and then came hastily into the room again. He stood for a few seconds regarding them. The stillness in the house was horrible. He could not even hear them breathe. With a sudden resolution he snatched the candle from the mantelpiece and held the flame to White's finger. Then, as he reeled back, stupefied, the footsteps again became audible. He stood with the candle in his shaking hand, listening. He heard them ascending the further staircase, but they stopped suddenly as he went to the door. He walked a little way along the passage. 
and they went scurrying down the stairs, and then at a jog trot along the corridor below. He went back to the main staircase, and they ceased again. For a time he hung over the balusters, listening and trying to pierce the blackness below. Then, slowly, step by step, he made his way downstairs, and, holding the candle above his head, peered about him. Barnes, he called. Where are you? Shaking with fright, he made his way along the passage, and, summoning up all his courage, pushed open the doors and gazed fearfully into the empty rooms. Then, quite suddenly, he heard the footsteps in front of him. He followed slowly, for fear of extinguishing the candle, until they led him at last into a vast, bare kitchen with damp walls and a broken floor. In front of him a door leading into an inside room had just closed. He ran towards it and flung it open, and a cold air blew out the candle. He stood aghast. Barnes! he cried again. Don't be afraid! It is I, Meagle! There was no answer. He stood, gazing into the darkness, and all the time the idea of something close at hand watching was upon him. Then, suddenly, the steps broke out overhead again. He drew back hastily, and passing through the kitchen, groped his way along the narrow passages. He could now see better in the darkness, and, finding himself at last at the foot of the staircase, began to ascend it noiselessly. He reached the landing just in time to see a figure disappear round the angle of a wall. Still careful to make no noise, he followed the sound of the steps until they led him to the top floor, and he cornered the chase at the end of a short passage. Barnes, he whispered. Barnes! Something stirred in the darkness. A small, circular window at the end of the passage just softened the blackness and revealed the dim outlines of a motionless figure. Meagle, in place of advancing, stood almost as still as a sudden horrible doubt took possession of him. With his eyes fixed on the shape in front, he fell back slowly, and, as it advanced upon him, burst into a terrible cry. Barnes, for God's sake, is it you? The echoes of his voice left the air quivering, but the figure before him paid no heed. For a moment he tried to brace his courage up to endure its approach. Then, with a smothered cry, he turned and fled. The passages wound like a maze, and he threaded them blindly in a vain search for the stairs. If he could get down and open the hall door! He caught his breath in a sob. The steps had begun again. At a lumbering trot they clattered up and down the bare passages, in and out, up and down, as though in search of him. He stood, appalled, and then, as they drew near, entered a small room and stood behind the door as they rushed by. He came out and ran swiftly and noiselessly in the other direction, and in a moment the steps were after him. He found the long corridor and raced along it at top speed. The stairs he knew were at the end, and with the steps close behind he descended them in blind haste. The steps gained on him, and he shrank to the side to let them pass, still continuing his headlong flight. Then suddenly he seemed to slip off the earth into space. Lester awoke in the morning to find the sunshine streaming into the room, and White sitting up and regarding with some perplexity a badly blistered finger. "'Where are the others?' inquired Lester. "'Gone, I suppose,' said White. We must have been asleep. <laughs> Lester arose, and, stretching his stiffened limbs, dusted his clothes with his hands, and went out into the corridor. White followed. At the noise of their approach, 
a figure which had been lying asleep at the other end sat up and revealed the face of Barnes. "'Why, <laughs> I've been asleep,' he said in surprise. "'I don't re remember coming here. How did I get here?' "'Nice place to come for a nap,' said Lester, severely, as he pointed to the gap in the balusters. "'Look here, another yard, and where would you have been?' He walked carelessly to the edge and looked over. In response to his startled cry, the others drew near, and all three stood gazing at the dead man below. End of The Toll House Recording by Jesse P. Watson j.p.watson at hotmail.co.uk Ex Oblivione by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ex Oblivione by H. P. Lovecraft. When the last days were upon me, and the ugly trifles of existence began to drive me to madness like the small drops of water that torture us that fall ceaselessly upon one spot of their victim's body. I loved the irradiate refuge of sleep. In my dreams I found a little of the beauty I had vainly sought in life, and wandered through old gardens and enchanted woods. Once, when the wind was soft and scented, I heard the south calling, and sailed endlessly and languorously under strange stars. Once, when the gentle rain fell, I glided in a barge down a sunless stream under the earth, till I reached another world of purple twilight, iridescent arbours, and undying roses. And once I walked through a golden valley that led to shadowy groves and ruins and ended in a mighty wall, green with antique vines and pierced by a little gate of bronze. Many times I walked through that valley, and longer and longer would I pause in the spectral half-light while the giant trees squirmed and twisted grotesquely and the grey ground stretched damply from trunk to trunk sometimes disclosing the mould-stained stones of buried temples, and always the goal of my fancies was the mighty vine-grown wall with a little gate of bronze therein. After a while, as the days of waking became less and less bearable from their greyness and sameness, I would often drift in opiate peace through the valley and the shadowy groves, and wonder how I might seize them from my eternal dwelling-place, so that I need no more crawl back to a dull world, stripped of interest and new colours. And as I looked upon the little gate in the mighty wall, I felt that beyond it lay a dream-country, from which, once it was entered, there would be no return. So each night in sleep I strove to find the hidden latch of the gate in the ivied antique wall, though it was exceedingly well hidden, and I would tell myself that the realm beyond the wall was not more lasting merely, but more lovely and radiant as well. Then, one night, in the dream city of Zacharion, I found a yellowed papyrus filled with the thoughts of dream sages who dwelt of old in that city and who were too wise ever to be born in the waking world. Therein were written many things concerning the world of dream, and among them was law of a golden valley and a sacred grove with temples and a high wall pierced by a little bronze gate. When I saw this law I knew that it touched on the scenes I had haunted, and I therefore read long in the yellowed papyrus. Some of the dream sages wrote gorgeously of the wonders beyond the irrepassable gate, and others told of horror and disappointment. I knew not which to believe, yet longed more and more to cross for ever into the unknown land, for doubt and secrecy are the lure of lures, and no new horror can be more terrible than the daily torture of the commonplace. So when I learned of the drug which would unlock the gate and drive me through, I resolved to take it when next I awaked. 
Last night I swallowed the drug and floated dreamily into the golden valley and the shadowy groves, and when I came this time to the antique wall I saw that the small gate of bronze was ajar. From beyond came a glow that weirdly lit the giant twisted trees and the tops of the buried temples, and I drifted on songfully, expectant of the glories of the land whence I should never return. But as the gate swung wider, and the sorcery of the drug and the dream pushed me through, I knew that all sights and glories were at an end, for in that new realm was neither land nor sea, but only the white void of unpeopled and illimitable space. So, happier than I had ever dared hope to be, I dissolved again into that native infinity of crystal oblivion from which the demon life had called me for one brief and desolate hour. End of Ex Oblivione The Life of a Murderer From The Shipwrecked Stranger By Hannah Maria Jones this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett The Life of a Murderer From the Shipwrecked Stranger by Hannah Maria Jones A murderer! God help me! Yes, time was when I shrunk affrighted from the very sound, when the name was spoken in whispers, little thought I then I should ever bear the name, or die ignominiously upon the scaffold. I was doomed in early life to lose both my parents. I was reared with more kindness than philosophy by an aunt, for all said I was a spoiled child. I was an unruly boy, but never wanted affection. I was sent to a charity school, but mischief had more charms for me than learning, and the apple orchard in reality to that stamped in the reading lesson in my spelling book. Rebuke followed rebuke. Chastisements without number were lavished upon me. I was the dunce of the school. Inspired by a sudden whim, I determined one night as I lay in my little cot to be so no longer. I would learn. For two years did I carry out this resolution with a heat and impetuosity that characterized all my little proceedings, at the expiration of this time I was acknowledged to be the first scholar in the school. My time was up, and the parish apprenticed me to a carpenter. My master was a stern, cruel man. I worked hard, lived hard, and was treated badly. For some error that I committed I was brutally punished and confined in a cellar below ground, for six and thirty hours was I confined there, and not a particle of nourishment passed my lips. I was famishing, and thought he had shut me there to die. Through that long dismal night, oh, the agony and fright that I suffered! I have often wondered since it did not turn my brain. Hideous visions, which naught but a crazed imagination could depict, arose before me. I shrieked with agony, and the drops of perspiration stood upon my brow like beads. Young as I was, so bitter was that night, I dashed myself upon the ground and prayed for death. Morning came, and I was liberated. They said how pale and ill I looked. He cursed me for a sulky hound, and swore to kill me or my temper. I thought a few more nights in his dismal cellar would do both. That night I determined to run away. I had no money, and my aunt's house was a good twenty miles off. There was a small box in my room in which my master kept his loose coin. At this time its contents were but a few shillings. The temptation was a strong one. I walked to and fro. God only knows the bitter struggle of good and bad within my breast. The latter triumphed. Alas, that it did! For to that hour all my subsequent crimes, degradation, and death can be traced. I took one, one shilling. I crept softly down the stairs, and even went back again to replace the stolen property, but the fear of want, for I had bitterly experienced the pangs of hunger, prevailed, and I became a thief. With hushed breath and noiseless step I crept stealthily away. On, on I flew, but a thief. Had the coin been red-hot, and scarred and burnt me as I went, I could have borne it better than that rankling thought. 
Fifteen miles had I walked. I feared to go near house or human being, though my hunger and thirst was excessive. I felt as if my brow, cane-like, had the crime written upon it. At length, wearied and fatigued, footsore and sick at heart, I crept into the hedge, and I suppose fell into a doze, for when I awoke my cruel master and the parish constable stood over me. I was terrified beyond measure. I threw myself at my master's feet, confessed the whole, sobbed out my contrition, and implored him for mercy's sake to spare and forgive me. I have never forgotten his reply to this, or the laugh that accompanied it. It was spiteful, fiendish, beyond compare. Oh, oh, you took to thieving then, did you, my runaway apprentice? Well done! Mercy! Oh, yes, after justice has been done, my lad, after justice. Constable, I charge this boy with robbery, and deliver him to your custody. I begged he would kill me, anything but send me to prison. The very officer joined his entreaties to mine. You cannot mean this, he said. Damn the boy, thrash him, punish him in any way you like, but don't ruin him for life. I give him into your custody. Refuse to take him at your peril. He's a damned young, whining, thievish hypocrite, and it's a mercy it's no hanging matter now, for by God if t'was, not one word would I say to save him from swinging. I can't refuse to take him, said the constable, or I would, that's flat. I only say, and think it, and thanks be for it, that you may do as you like, but I would rather have my right hand chopped off than the consequences of this sin resting on my soul and troubling my conscience. "'Damn your conscience,' said my master. "'With all my heart,' said the constable. "'Some people seem to have no consciences to curse.' "'Yours is a clear one, no doubt,' he answered with a sneer. "'Come along,' he said to me, and he dug his nails so deeply into my arm that my shirt was stained with blood, and I cried out, the pain it caused me was so great. "'Loose the lad,' said the constable, sternly. He is my prisoner, and I'll charge you with an assault if you lay another finger upon him. Let him alone. He turned to me, and I thought I saw a tear trembling on his eyelid as he spoke, for he was the father of a family, and bore a good name in the place, and said, Come, my poor boy. He took me gently by the hand, and soothed me with kind words as he led me along, but when he left me it was within the dreary walls of the cage, or watch-house. I threw myself upon the heap of straw and slept. Sleep, with thoughts of death and hideous forms and faces flitting to and fro. At morning dawn I was awakened. The jailer entered my cell. It was the constable who had taken me. He bid me silence, and, taking instruments fitting for the purpose, he sawed away, and two iron bars fell quickly to the ground. He stopped then and said these words. If you was a boy of mine, and any ill came of this prosecution, I would have the villain's heart's blood. As tis, my poor lad, I pity you from my soul, and have risked my all to save you, for if they knew I aided in your escape I should lose my character, my place, and every means of livelihood. I have a young family dependent upon me, and cannot afford to do this, yet I will strain a nerve, and risk something to save you. He pointed to the windows. This act will be imputed to you. It will be your own fault if they ever catch you again, and if they do not, there are plenty of names besides your own you can adopt. He opened the ponderous door. A horse and cart stood in waiting. He lifted me in, laid me at the bottom, covered me with a sack, and lashed the horse into a gallop. He checked it as we approached my native town, and jumping down, pulled me out, and, thrusting some money into my hand, bid me run then for dear life. Panting and breathless, I reached my old home, and throwing myself at my aunt's feet, revealed all. "'God help us, child,' she said. "'They shall have both or none.' For three days I lay there secure and undiscovered, but at last I was found out. I was dragged before a magistrate and searched. The money I had given me was found upon me. They questioned who gave me such a sum, and my master said he had missed the like amount. The liar! What could I say? I could not betray my friend and my very countenance, they all said, during the examination, betokened guilt. 
So thought the recorder, I presume, for from his merciless lips came the merciless words. The sentence of the court is that you be confined in his majesty's jail for twelve calendar months, and be twice privately whipped. Oh, that it had ended there! The wretch had my poor old aunt at the bar, and preferred a charge against her for aiding and abetting in the escape of a felon. Charged her with a crime, whose kind, gentle heart never harbored wicked thought. She was too noble to ask pardon of such a wretch, and too much a Christian to tell a lie. They sentenced her to be imprisoned for three months. God forgive them. She never came out alive. So great was the trouble that it snapped the fragile cords of life, and she had passed from this world into eternity ere her sentence was half completed. My young heart harbored thoughts of revenge, for I thought her a murdered woman. I came out, sadly altered for the worse. The consciousness of sin was gone, and I fancied I had suffered a martyrdom instead of paying a just penalty for a sin. My former friends shrunk from me as though I had contracted a loathsome, infectious disease. Some few pitied the young villain, but more denounced. There was an old playmate of mine, who had been reared within a few doors from my aunt's cottage. She was a gentle, kind girl. One day I overtook her. I was, I well recollect, footsore and hungered. I laid my hand upon her arm. My tremulous voice, my tearful eyes betrayed how full my heart was, as I said, "'And will you not speak to me, Jane? "'Not one parting word for him you may never see again?' "'They have threatened to beat me,' she replied timidly. "'If they ever knew I passed word with you again. "'But, oh, Jim, I never went upon my knees night or morning, "'but I prayed for you, prayed he would change your heart, "'and make you good and pure as I once knew you, "'and ever thought you even now, for you are not guilty. "'Jim, are you?' You cannot be. I buried my face in my hands and wept bitterly. Did you, dear Jim, break from the watch house? No. Have you been the naughty boy, he said? No. You did not break your poor aunt's heart? I was choking and could not answer. You are no thief, Jim, she continued. You did not rob your master? I arose and with uplifted hand said, as I am a living sinner, never but of one shilling, so help me heaven. She dropped her hand, seemingly in despair, and moved away. Be not merciless, I implored. Have you no pity for a misguided boy? Oh, yes, she answered. My heart is full of pity for my dear unfortunate friend, but friendship for a thief I have none. My last friend had left me. Years flew by. I married, and had one child. I struggled with her to live honestly, but struggled to live in vain. We had walked many miles that day, with little or no refreshment, for the want of which my wife's milk had dried, and the child was foodless. He sucked her dry breast, and then, apparently in utter helplessness, looked into our faces and uttered the moaning cry of starvation. My God! My sufferings were not compared to what I felt for my dear, patient, suffering wife, and my innocent, unhappy child. It almost drove me mad. I went to the overseer of the parish. I told him we were in the last stage of starvation, that my wife and child were dying by inches. He made me out an order for flour and potatoes. I asked him what I were to do with them, having no place to cook or prepare them. I wanted money to purchase medicine. Potatoes were no food for a dying woman. He told me to leave his house, called me insolent, and threatened to commit me to prison. At that moment all the bad passions that ever raged in human breast were struggling for the mastery in mine. I shook my clenched fist in the air, and my teeth gnashed together with rage. He drew back affrighted, and well he might, for had he known how near a dreadful death he stood, that haughty tone of his would have been humbled. I went back to my poor wife. She looked into my face. Great God, what a long tale of sorrow, suffering, and privation was exhibited in that one gaze, and all born without a murmur. Oh, I read in her pale face and sunken eye the fatal inroads want had made upon her otherwise strong constitution, and cursed myself in the bitterness of my agony as the author of it all. 
I knew she was ill, but she was so patient, so resigned, I never had idea how much so. She never saw day again. When morning broke, oh, misery dire and dread, the partner of my bosom was cold and lifeless as the ground on which she lay, the only one in this dark world that ever had kind wish or thought for me was dead. I had not tears. I rather thanked God he had removed my loved one from this place of torment to a brighter sphere. The last link that bound me to nature, and kept the man from springing from his nature into a devil, was broken and dead. My orphan child yet lived, but I, its father, had become an inveterate drinker, the vilest of drunkards. I leagued myself with bad men, and became famous for villainy. To drown thought, to stifle all reproaches of conscience, all memory of the past, all dread of the future. I had recourse to drink, drink, drink. Some friend placed my poor child in the workhouse, and I was left to my fate. I had become, in reality now, a thief and robber. So notorious did I become that a reward was offered for my apprehension, and I was eventually taken, and though convicted only of a trivial crime, the greater ones could not be proved against me, I was sentenced to fourteen years' transportation. I was sent to Van Diemen's land. Now that I was debarred from the use of those cursed intoxicating drinks, I could think, and bitter agonizing thoughts perplexed me. My poor son was present to my imagination night and day, as though I had murdered him, was he before me. My time was almost up, and I determined for his sake, if possible, to reach England again. We were working in gangs, and in one of our expeditions to band a raft of logs floating on the water, I, struggling with the load, more than my most strenuous exertions could support, stumbled and fell. Someone kindly assisted me to my feet again. I gazed in his face. Heavens above! It was my son. He, that I had left a mere child, in England fourteen years ago. So much agony, and so much joy was in the meeting, that I reeled and staggered like a drunken man. Happiness at meeting my son again, but bitter sorrow at meeting him there. He first found a tongue. Father dear, listen, he said. You think me guilty of sin, I read it in your face. But I swear, and he raised his hands toward heaven as he spoke, I wear this degrading garb, but am as innocent of the crime imputed to me, and that doomed to this fate as a child unborn. Father, I have been falsely accused, and most unjustly punished. They swore to lies, and by lies was I convicted. I was accused of highway robbery, when, at the time stated, I was miles away, and had witnesses to prove it. But yet they condemned me. Oh, had they eyes to read the human countenance, they would have seen innocence in mine, and guilt in his by whose evidence I was condemned. I asked his accuser's name. He said I could not know him. It was Baker. He lived at M. in Kent. It was the same man that ruined me when young, had made me what I was. At this moment our keeper noticed we were conversing. He approached and bid us with a curse, get to work. Night and day was his tale before me. Sleeping and waking, it was ever present. I heard our keeper whispering to another one day. He pointed to my son. The doctor says that boy's in a deep decline, and I think he bears every sign of it, for that flushed face, too bright for health, that harassing, distressing cough, that hard-drawn breath as surely tells as the sundial reveals the hour. The man's words wrought such an effect upon me that I threw myself at his feet and begged of him, as though my boy's life lay in his hands, that he would recall those dreadful words. What more I said, or what he replied, I know not, for so overpowered with excessive agony I fainted at his feet. The shock I had received threw me into a fever. I was delirious, frightfully so. My madness gave me strength, and in imagination I acted the bitter part in life I had fulfilled over and over again. I grew better, at length, daily. My son occasionally visited me, and then I watched the dreadful progress the blighting, incurable disease had made. At times when I noticed the bloom upon his cheeks, forgetting all, in apparent deep love and pride, I would picture to myself and tell him 
what a fine, smart fellow he would be, and what happy days we would yet pass together in the old world. Or in a better, he would add solemnly, though I little thought to what his words had reference then. Day by day he grew weaker. One morning a keeper came, and, bidding me prepare for the worst, told me my boy was dead. Not a tear, sigh, or groan escaped me. I bent over his lifeless body, and swore to have vengeance, bitter, bloody, terrible vengeance on his murderer. I nursed this thought as though it was the climax of all earthly bliss. Ha! Kept it in my heart's core, to the exclusion of every other thought. A ship came into our port which had been dismasted in a storm, and many of its crew were drowned. My time was up, they gladly accepted my offer, and I worked my passage home to England. I set foot upon my native shore again with a heart full of dreadful thoughts. Actuated by these, I hastened with all speed towards the place where my old master, he who destroyed me and murdered my poor son, resided. I have heard of men being possessed of a devil. I felt as if there was one gnawing at my heart and urging me on to deeds of darkness and of blood. I went into a public house. There were plenty there now, for the village had grown into a town. A party of men, who by their dress were of the lower order, were speaking of my enemy. One with glaring eyes and fearful words was telling the others how the old villain had distrained upon a neighbor of his, who had been long-suffering, and from the effects of want of employment and ill health had been unable to pay his demands, and through an old servant of his persecutor had been turned into the street to die like a dog. The man's furious pretensions found an echo in my troubled breast. Another, chiming in, said, He's as hard-hearted an old scoundrel as ever cussed mankind with his infernal life. Don't you recollect, mates, how he served poor Jim? He called it justice, but in my opinion, if ever a man in the world committed murder, he swore away the life of that poor boy. He was referring to my son. Mastering the agitation which unnerved me, by a violent effort I turned to him and said calmly, Were there any attempts made to prove his innocence? Oh, yes, answered the man. A cove named Curtis, Bob Curtis, swore he slept at his house the night in question, which was a good ten miles from the place where the old man said he was stopped and robbed. But Bob had been convicted once or twice of petty larceny, so his oath wasn't taken. Moreover, the old man swore point-blank he was the man that robbed him. People mustn't speak about such things, but more than one, to my certain knowledge, thought the prosecution a persecution. I know I did for one, though I ain't over-anxious any of you should say I said so. I paid my reckoning and went out into the air. How opposite to the fierce passions that burnt and consumed me was the placid scene that met my eye. The moon was at the full, and the spire of the old church, as it glittered in the solemn lustrous light, looked in good truth like a cross of grace. The very tombs in the quiet yard, those living records of the dead and withered past, looked more than usually awful in the silvery light. How many a tale of misery and crime, of sin and pain, lay hushed and silent there. Withered age, long suffering, and children early nipped, ere yet they had hardly entered into life. Sin and virtue, age and youth, the good and bad, the rich and poor, the morose and mirthful, the saint and sinner, the oppressor and the oppressed, the miser and the spendthrift, with all the various shades and form which human life presents, lay huddled side by side, all enmity stilled, all heart-burning hushed, in that one quiet bed. See yon pompous stone, that receptacle holds the ashes of one who in life was a powerful man, the manhood and the power, time's heavy hand had been at work upon, and all that remains is a heap of brown, unwholesome bones. Death, thou mystery of mysteries, which every one must learn, yet no man, with all his mighty reasoning in life, can imagine or fathom. One would have thought such a scene as this would have softened all the greater, and called forth all the finer feelings of my debased nature. But no, they only made the devil burn the more fierce. I went down to them, examined them minutely, traced letter after letter with my finger, in hope of discovering his name. 
the register of the death of a relative gone before him. I chuckled and rubbed my hands with demoniac joy at the thought of discovering a vacancy that I would soon fill up, of going there after he was dead, of treading down with my foot that mound under which his carcass lay rotting and festering. That is a fearful night for the memory to look back upon, a fearful one indeed. I thought of the difference in our situations. He had become a rich and powerful man, and look at me. I went to his house the next morning, under plea of requesting relief. I bound a handkerchief round my head to disguise myself. There was no need of that. Time and care had disguised me enough. He asked me what I wanted, in a stern and unfeeling tone. I answered in a tone as harsh and haughty as his own, Bread. He told me, I must earn it. Such lazy villains as I was, if we had our deserts, would be in prison. I answered him, until in his rage he called me an insolent dog, and struck me. One spring, like a tiger, thirsting for blood, upon his prey, my hand was upon his throat. All my bitter thoughts came into action now. I pressed. His face grew purple, his tongue hung from his mouth, and his eyes seemed staring from their sockets. The clammy sweat of death bedewed his forehead. One minute more, and he would have known the secret of death. But the door was burst open, and the domestics, alarmed by the uproar, entered the room. To release my victim, draw a large Spanish knife from my pocket, and to bear its fearful blade was the work of a moment. Alarmed by my fierce glaring eyes, and the deadly weapon I carried, they drew back, and gave me free egress. Oh, how I laughed! He had suffered the pangs of death, but would suffer death itself the next time. I lingered about the neighborhood for many months, still firmly bent upon carrying my damnable plot into execution. One day I was in a large, unfrequented wood. A narrow path ran at my feet, and, walking along with an enfeebled gait and tottering steps, came that devoted old man, alone. With a shout of delight I strode before him, seized him by the collar, and dragged him into the recesses of the wood. I then released him. Listen, said I, and I detailed to him who I was, and that I had purposely traveled hundreds of miles to execute justice upon the murderer of my son. With a face blanched with fear, with lips quivering from excessive agony, and pale and bloodless, he fell upon his knees, and, in tones that would have moved an iron heart to pity, begged I would not hurl him to the grave unprepared, and his past sins unrepented of, but that I would have mercy and not bathe my hands in the blood of an old man. Would to God I had listened to his prayer. I drew forth the fatal knife, bared its hideous blade, and brandished it in the air. The old man shrieked with agony. My God! I can dwell upon this scene no longer. One fierce curse, one deadly thrust, one loud cry of despair and agony, a gush of thick life-blood. The deed was done. He lay at my feet dead. Now the hideous fantasy had left me. I would have given the world, ah, even my own life, to have healed that gaping wound, and to have put breath into those motionless nostrils. It was too late, alas. Cain's curse was upon me. I was a murderer. I was arrested, tried, condemned. In two days I shall suffer the dread death that is executed upon him who sheddeth the blood of a fellow man. God pardon me. My heart is full of grief, overflowing with repentance. Have mercy, heaven, upon him who was merciless. My kind friend, farewell. The blessing of a grateful heart, and of a dying but repentant sinner, attend you, farewell, until the verges into eternity. Then, I humbly hope, we shall meet in the promised land of bliss. Once again, farewell, and, O oh, pray in your passage through life, tell the erring to take the path of rectitude, and forsake the path of death, and to the drunkard speak, Thousands beside myself have been untimely hurried into eternity by its instrumentality. Tell them it is the high road to ruin, misery, crime, and death. Farewell. The life of a murderer is finished. 
and in a few brief hours will be closed in frightful reality. End of The Life of a Murderer From the Shipwrecked Stranger By Hannah Maria Jones Gabriel Ernest by Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lewis Richardson. Gabriel Ernest by Saki. There is a wild beast in your woods, said the artist Cunningham as he was being driven to the station. It was the only remark he had made during the drive. But as Van Cheel had talked incessantly, his companion's silence had not been noticeable. A uh, stray fox or two and some resident weasels, nothing more formidable, said Van Cheel. The artist said nothing. Uh, what, what do you mean about a wild beast, said Van Cheel later when they were on the platform. Nothing. My imagination. Here is the train, said Cunningham. That afternoon Van Cheel went for one of his frequent rambles through his woodland property, he had a stuffed bitten in his study, and knew the names of quite a number of wildflowers, so his aunt had possibly some justification in describing him as a great naturalist. At any rate, he was a great walker. It was his custom to take mental notes of everything he saw during his walks, not so much for the purpose of assisting contemporary science as to provide topics for conversation afterwards. When the bluebells began to show themselves in flower, he made a point of informing everyone of the fact. The season of the year might have warned his hearers of the likelihood of such an occurrence, but at least they felt that he was being absolutely frank with them. What Van Cheel saw on this particular afternoon was, however, something far removed from his ordinary range of experience. On the shelf of a smooth stone overhanging a deep pool in the hollow of an oak coppice, a boy of about sixteen lay asprawl, drying his wet brown limbs luxuriously in the sun. His wet hair, parted by a recent dive, lay close to his head, and his light brown eyes, so light there was almost a tigerish gleam in them, were turned towards Van Cheel with a certain lazy watchfulness. It was an unexpected apparition, and Van Cheel found himself engaged in the novel process of thinking before he spoke. Where on earth could this wild-looking boy hail from? The miller's wife had lost a child some two months ago, supposed to have been swept away by the mill race, but that had been a mere baby not a half-grown lad. "'What are you doing there?' he demanded. "'Obviously. Sunning myself,' replied the boy. "'Where do you live?' "'Here, in the woods.' "'You can't live in the woods,' said Van Cheel. "'They are very nice woods,' said the boy with a touch of patronage in his voice. "'But where do you sleep at night?' "'I don't sleep at night. That's my busiest time.' Van Cheel began to have an irritated feeling that he was grappling with a problem that was eluding him. What do you feed on? he asked. Flesh, said the boy, and he pronounced the word with slow relish, as though he were tasting it. Flesh? What flesh? Since it interests you. Rabbits, wildfowl, hares, poultry, lambs in the season, children when I can get any. They're usually too well locked in at night when I do most of my hunting. It's quite two months since I tasted child flesh. Ignoring the chafing nature of the last remark, Van Cheel tried to draw the boy on the subject of possible poaching operations. You're talking rather through your hat when you speak of feeding on hares. Considering the nature of the boy's toilet, the simile was hardly an apt one. Our hillside hares aren't easily caught. At night, I hunt on forefeet, was the somewhat cryptic response. I suppose you mean you hunt with a dog, hazarded Van Cheel. The boy rolled slowly over onto his back and laughed a weird low laugh that was pleasantly like a chuckle and disagreeably like a snarl. I don't fancy any dog would be very anxious for my company, especially at night. Van Cheel began to feel that there was something positively uncanny about the strange-eyed, strange-tongued youngster. I can't have you staying in these woods, he declared authoritatively. I fancy you'd rather have me here than in your house, said the boy. The prospect of this wild, nude animal in Van Cheel's primly ordered house was certainly an alarming one. If you don't go, I shall have to make you, said Van Cheel. The boy turned like a flash, plunged into the pool, and in a moment had flung his wet and glistening body halfway up the bank where Van Cheel was standing. In an otter the movement would not have been remarkable. In a boy, Van Cheel found it sufficiently startling. His foot slipped as he made an involuntarily backward movement, 
and he found himself almost prostrate on the slippery, weed-grown bank, with those tigerish yellow eyes not very far from his own. Almost instinctively, he half raised his hand to his throat. The boy laughed again, a laugh in which the snarl had nearly driven out the chuckle, and then, with another of his astonishing lightning movements, plunged out of view into a yielding tangle of weed and fern. "'What an extraordinary wild animal!' said Van Cheel as he picked himself up, and then he recalled Cunningham's remark. "'There is a wild beast in your woods.' Walking slowly homeward, Van Cheel began to turn over in his mind various local occurrences which might be traceable to the existence of this astonishing young savage. Something had been thinning the game in the woods lately. Poultry had been missing from the farms, hares were growing unaccountably scarcer, and complaints had reached him of lambs being carried off bodily from the hills. Was it possible that this young wild boy was really hunting the countryside in company with some clever poacher dogs? He had spoken of hunting four-footed by night, but then again he had hinted strangely at no dog caring to come near him, especially at night. It was certainly puzzling. And then, as Van Cheel ran his mind over the various depredations that had been committed during the last month or two, he came suddenly to a dead stop, alike in his walk and his speculations. The child missing from the mill two months ago the accepted theory was that it had tumbled into the mill race and been swept away, but the mother had always declared she had heard a shriek on the hillside of the house, in the opposite direction from the water. It was unthinkable, of course, but he wished that the boy had not made that uncanny remark about child flesh eaten two months ago. Such dreadful things should not be said even in fun. Van Cheel, contrary to his usual wound, did not feel disposed to be communicative about his discovery in the wood. His position as a parish councillor and justice of the peace seemed somehow compromised by the fact that he was harbouring a personality of such doubtful repute on his property. There was even a possibility that a heavy bill of damages for raided lambs and poultry might be laid at his door. At dinner that night he was quite unusually silent. "'Where's your voice gone to?' said his aunt. "'One would think you had seen a wolf.' Van Cheel, who was not familiar with the old saying, thought the remark rather foolish. If he had seen a wolf on his property, his tongue would have been extraordinarily busy with the subject. At breakfast next morning, Van Cheel was conscious that his feeling of uneasiness regarding yesterday's episode had not wholly disappeared, and he resolved to go by train to the neighbouring cathedral town, hunt up Cunningham, and learn from him what he had really seen that prompted the remark about a wild beast in the woods. With this resolution taken, his usual cheerfulness partially returned, and he hummed a bright little melody as he sauntered to the morning room for his customary cigarette. As he entered the room, the melody made way abruptly for a pious invocation. Gracefully asprawl on the ottoman, in an attitude of almost exaggerated repose, was the boy of the woods. He was drier than when Van Cheel had last seen him, but no other alteration was noticeable in his toilet. "'How dare you come here?' asked Van Cheel furiously. "'You told me I was not to stay in the woods,' said the boy calmly. "'But not to come here. Supposing my aunt should see you?' And, with a view to minimising that catastrophe, Van Cheel hastily obscured as much of his unwelcome guest as possible under the folds of a morning post. At that moment, his aunt entered the room. "'This is a poor boy who has lost his way and lost his memory. He doesn't know who he is or where he's from.' explained Van Cheel desperately, glancing apprehensively at the waif's face to see whether he was going to add inconvenient candour to his other savage propensities. Miss Van Cheel was enormously interested. Perhaps his underlinen is marked, she suggested. Uh, he seems to have lost most of that too, said Van Cheel, making frantic little grabs at the morning post to keep it in its place. A naked, homeless child appealed to Miss Van Cheel as warmly as a stray kitten or derelict puppy would have done. We must do all we can for him, she decided, and in a very short time a messenger, dispatched to the rectory where a page boy was kept, had returned with a suit of pantry clothes and the necessary accessories of shirt, shoes, collar, etc. Clothed, clean and groomed, the boy lost none of his uncanniness in Van Cheel's eyes, but his aunt found him sweet. We must call him something, till we know who he really is, she said. Gabriel Ernest, I think. Those are nice, suitable names. Van Cheel agreed, but he privately doubted whether they were being grafted onto a nice, suitable child. 
His misgivings were not diminished by the fact that his staid and elderly spaniel had bolted out of the house at the first incoming of the boy, and now obstinately remained shivering and yapping at the farther end of the orchard, while the canary, usually as vocally industrious as Van Cheel himself, had put itself on an allowance of frightened cheeps. More than ever he was resolved to consult Cunningham without loss of time. As he drove off to the station, his aunt was arranging that Gabriel Erner should help her to entertain the infant members of her Sunday school class at tea that afternoon. Cunningham was not at first disposed to be communicative. My mother died of some brain trouble, he explained, so you will understand why I am averse to dwelling on anything of an impossibly fantastic nature that I may see, or think that I may have seen. But what did you see? persisted Van Cheel. What I thought I saw was something so extraordinary that no really sane man could dignify it with the credit of having actually happened. I was standing, the last evening I was with you, half hidden in the hedge growth by the orchard gate, watching the dying glow of the sunset. Suddenly I became aware of a naked boy, a bather from some neighbouring pool I took him to be, who was standing out on the bare hillside, also watching the sunset. His pose was so suggestive of some wild fawn of pagan myth that I instantly wanted to engage him as a model. And in another moment I think I should have hailed him. But just then the sun dipped out of view, and all the orange and pink slid out of the landscape, leaving it cold and grey. And at the same moment an astonishing thing happened. The boy vanished too. What, vanished into nothing? asked Van Cheel excitedly. No, that is the dreadful part of it answered the artist. On the open hillside, where the boy had been standing a second ago, stood a large wolf, blackish in colour, with gleaming fangs and cruel yellow eyes. You may think... But Van Cheel did not stop for anything as futile as thought. Already he was tearing at top speed towards the station. He dismissed the idea of a telegram. Gabriel Ernest is a werewolf. It was a hopelessly inadequate effort at conveying the situation and his aunt would think it a code message to which he had omitted to give her the key. His one hope was that he might reach home before sundown. The cab, which he chartered at the other end of the railway journey, bore him with what seemed exasperating slowness along the country roads, which were pink and mauve with the flush of the sinking sun. His aunt was putting away some unfinished jams and cake when he arrived. "'Where is Gabriel Ernest?' he almost screamed. "'He was taking the little toop child home,' said his aunt. It was getting late, so I thought it wasn't safe to let it go back alone. What a lovely sunset, isn't it? But Van Cheel, although not oblivious of the glow in the western sky, did not stay to discuss its beauties. At a speed for which he was scarcely geared, he raced along the narrow lane that led to the home of the Toops. On one side ran the swift current of the mill stream. On the other rose the stretch of Burr Hillside. A dwindling rim of red sun showed still on the skyline and the next turning must bring him in view of the ill-assorted couple he was pursuing. Then the colour went suddenly out of things, and a grey light settled itself with a quick shiver over the landscape. Van Cheel heard a shrill wail of fear, and stopped running. Nothing was ever seen again of the Toop child, or Gabriel Ernest, but the latter's discarded garments were found lying in the road, so it was assumed that the child had fallen into the water, and that the boy had stripped and jumped in, in a vain endeavour to save it. Van Cheel and some workmen who were nearby at the time testified to having heard a child scream loudly just near the spot where the clothes were found. Mrs. Toop, who had eleven other children, was decently resigned to her bereavement, but Miss Van Cheel sincerely mourned her lost foundling. It was on her initiative that a memorial brass was put up in the parish church to Gabriel Ernest, an unknown boy who bravely sacrificed his life for another. Van Cheel gave way to his aunt in most things, but he flatly refused to subscribe to the Gabriel Ernest Memorial. End of Gabriel Ernest by Saki Recording by David Lewis Richardson, Lancashire, England The Voice in the Night by William J. Wintle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett. The Voice in the Night by William J. Wintle. John Barron was frankly puzzled. 
he could not make it out at all. He had lived in the place all his life, save for the few years spent at Rugby and Oxford, and nothing of the sort had happened to him before. His people had occupied the estate for generations past, and there was neither record nor tradition of anything of the kind. He did not like it at all. It seemed like an intrusion upon the respectability of his family, and John Barron had a very good opinion of his family. Certainly he was entitled to have a good opinion of it. He came from a good stock. His ancestry was one to be proud of. His coat of arms had quarterings that few could display, and his immediate forebears had kept up the reputation of their ancestors. He himself could boast a career without reproach. The short time he had spent at the bar was marked by considerable success, and still more promise, a promise cut short by the death of his father, and his recall to Bannerton to take up the duties of squire, magistrate, and county magnate. In the eyes of his friends and of people generally, he was a man to be envied. He had an ample fortune, a delightful house and estate, hosts of friends, and the best of health. What could a man wish for more? The ladies of the neighborhood said that he lacked only one thing, and that was a wife. But it may be that they were not entirely unprejudiced judges, the unmarried ones at any rate. But up till the time of our story, John Barron had shown no sign of marrying. He used to boast that he was neither married, nor engaged, nor courting, nor had he his eye on any one. And now this annoyance had come to trouble and puzzle him. What had he done to deserve it? True, he might take the comfort to his soul that it was no immediate concern of his. The affair had not happened to any member of his family or household. Why, then, should he not mind his own business? But he felt that it was his business. It had happened within the bounds of his manor, and almost within sight of his windows. If anything tangible could be connected with it, he was the magistrate whose duty it would be to investigate the matter. But up till the present there was nothing tangible for him to deal with. The whole business was a mystery, and John Barron disapproved of mysteries. Mysteries savored of detectives and the police court. When unraveled they usually proved to be sordid and undesirable, and when not unraveled they brought with them a vague sense of discomfort and of danger. As a lawyer he held that mysteries had no right to exist. That they should continue to exist was a sort of reflection on the profession, as well as upon the public intelligence. And yet here was the parish of Bannerton in the hands of a mystery of the first water. As a magistrate, John Barron had officially looked into the matter, and, as a lawyer, he had spent some hours in carefully considering it, but entirely without any practical result. The mystery was not merely unsolved, it had even thickened. This was the history with which he was faced. A fortnight before, the occupants of a cottage on the outskirts of the village, a gardener and his wife, had left their little daughter of three years old in the house while they went on an errand. The child was soundly asleep in its cot, and they locked the door as they went out. They were absent about twenty minutes, and were nearing the house when they heard the screams of a child. The father rushed forward, unlocked the door, and the two parents entered together. The child's cot was in the living room into which the front door opened. As they went in, the screams ceased, and a terrible gasping sound took their place. Then they saw that the cot was hidden by some dark body that seemed to be lying on it. This they hardly saw, though they were quite clear that it was there, for it seemed to melt away like a mist when they rushed into the room. Certainly it was nothing solid, for it completely disappeared without a sound. It could not have dashed out through the door, for the parents were hardly clear of the door when it vanished. They had returned only just in time to save the life of the child. At first it was doubtful if they were in time, for the doctor held out little hope. But after a day or two, the child took a turn for the better, and was now out of danger. It had evidently been attacked by some kind of savage animal, which had torn at its throat, and had only just failed to sever the arteries of the neck. In the opinion of the doctor, and of John Barron himself, the wound suggested that the assailant had been a very large dog. But it was strange that a dog on such size had not done far worse damage. One might have expected that it would have killed the child with a single bite. But was it a dog? If so, how did it enter the house? The door in front was locked, as we have seen, that at the back was bolted, and all the windows were shut and fastened. There was no apparent way by which it could possibly have got into the house. 
and we have already seen that its way of going was equally mysterious. The most careful examination of the room and of the premises generally failed to yield the smallest clue. Nothing had been disturbed or damaged, and there were no footprints. The only thing at all unusual was the presence of an earthy or moldy odor which was noticed by the doctor when he entered the room, and also by some other persons who were on the scene soon afterwards. John Barron had the same impression when he went to the cottage some hours later, but the odor was then so faint that he could not be at all sure about its existence. By way of embroidery to the story came two or three items of local gossip of the usual sort. An old woman nearby said that she was looking out of her window to see the state of the weather a little earlier in the evening, when she saw a huge black dog run across the lane and go in the direction of the cottage. According to her tale, the dog limped as if lame or very much tired. Three people said they had been disturbed for two or three nights previous by the howling of a dog in the distance, and a farmer in the parish complained that his sheep had apparently been chased about the field during the night by some wandering dog. He loudly vowed vengeance on dogs in general, but as none of the sheep had been worried, nobody took much notice. All these tales came to the ears of John Barron, but to a man accustomed to weigh evidence they were negligible. But he attached much more importance to another piece of evidence, if such it might be called. As the injured child began to get better, and was able to talk, an attempt was made to find out if it could give any information about the attack. As it had been asleep when attacked, it did not see the arrival of its assailant, and the only thing it could tell was, "'Nasty, ugly lady bit me!' This seemed absurd, but when asked about the dog, it persisted in saying, "'No dog! Nasty, ugly lady!' The parents were inclined to laugh at what they thought was a mere childish fancy, but the trained lawyer was considerably impressed by it. To him there were three facts available. The wounds seemed to have been caused by a large dog. The child said she had been bitten by an ugly lady, and the parents had actually seen the form of the assailant. Unfortunately, it had disappeared before they could make out any details, but they said it was about the size of a very large dog, and was dark in color. The local gossip was of small importance, and was such as might be expected under the circumstances. But, for what it was worth, it all pointed to a dog or dog-like animal. But how could it have entered the closed house, how did it get away, and why did the child persist in her story of an ugly lady? The only theory that would at all fit the case was that supplied by the old Norse legends of the werewolf. But who believes such stories now? So it was not to be wondered at that John Barron was puzzled. He was rather annoyed, too. Bannerton had its average amount of crime, but it was in a small way and could generally be disposed of at the petty sessions. It was not often that a case had to be sent to the Assizes, and the newspapers seldom got any sensational copy from the quiet little place. He reflected with some small satisfaction that it was lucky the child had not died, for in that case there must have been an inquest and the inevitable publicity. If his suspicions were well founded, the case would have yielded something far more sensational than generally falls to the lot of the local reporter. But a day or two later he had more to ponder over things had developed, and in a way that he did not like. The farmer had again complained that his sheep had been chased about the field during the night, and this time more damage had been done. Two of the sheep had died, but the strange thing was that they had hardly been bitten at all. Their wounds were so slight that their death could only be attributed to fright and exhaustion. It was very curious that the dog, if dog it was, had not mauled them worse and made a meal of them. The suggestion that it was some very small dog was negatived by the fact that what wounds there were must have been made by a large animal. It really looked as if the animal had not sufficient strength to finish its evil work. But John Barron had another item of evidence which he was keeping to himself for the present. During each of the two past nights he had woke up without any apparent reason soon after midnight, and each time he had heard the cry in the night. It was a voice born on the night air which he never expected to hear in England, and least of all in Bannerton. The voice came from the moor that stood above the little hamlet, and it rose and fell on the silence like the cry of a spirit in distress. It began with a low wail of unspeakable sadness, then rose and fell in lamentable ululations, and then died away into sobs and silence. The voice came at intervals for more than an hour, and the second night it was stronger and seemed nearer than the first. 
John Barron had no difficulty in recognizing that long-drawn cry. He had heard it before when traveling in the wilder parts of Russia. It was the howling of a wolf. But there are no wolves in England. True, it might have been an escaped animal from some traveling menagerie, but such an animal would have made worse havoc of the sheep. And if this was the assailant of the little child, how did it get in? How did it get away? And why did the child still persist in saying that it was not a dog but a lady who bit her? The next few days saw the plot thicken. Other people heard the voice in the night, and put it down to a stray dog out on the moor. Another farmer's sheep were worried, and this time one of them was partly eaten. So a chase was arranged, and all the local farmers and many other people banded together to hunt the sheep-killer. For two days the moor was scoured, and the adjacent woods thoroughly beaten, but without coming across any signs of the miscreant. But John Barron heard a story from one of the farmers that set him thinking. He noticed that this man seemed to avoid a little thicket beside the moor, suggesting that there was a better path at some distance from it, and after some pressing he explained the real reason for this. But he was careful to add that of course he was not himself superstitious, but his wife had queer notions and had begged him to avoid the place. It seemed that not long before, some wandering gypsies who from time to time camped on the moor had secretly buried an old woman in the thicket, and had never returned to the moor since. Of course there were the inevitable additions to a tale of this sort. The old lady was alleged to have been the queen of the gypsy tribe, and she was also said to have been a witch of the most malignant kind, and these were supposed to have been the reasons for her secret burial in this lonely spot. It did not seem to occur to the farmer that the gypsies thus saved the expense of a regular funeral. Very few people knew the story, and they thought it well to hold their peace. It was not worth while to make enemies of the gypsies, who could so easily have their revenge by robbing hen-roosts or even by driving cattle, to say nothing of the more mysterious doings with which they were credited. John Barron began to put things together. The whole business had a distinct resemblance to the tales of the werewolf in the Scandinavian literature of the Middle Ages. Here we had a woman of suspicious reputation, buried in a lonely place without Christian rites, and soon afterwards a mysterious wolf roams the district in search of blood, just like the werewolf. But who believes such stories now, except a few ghost-ridden cranks with shattered nerves and unbalanced minds? The whole thing is absurd. Still, the mystery had to be cleared up, for John Barron had not the slightest intention of letting it simply slide into the refuse heap of unsolved problems. He kept his own counsel, but he meant to get to the bottom of it. Perhaps if he had realized the horror that lay at the bottom of it, he would have left it alone. In the meantime, the farmers had taken their own steps to deal with the sheep-worrying nuisance. Tempting morsels, judiciously seasoned with poison, were laid about, but with the sole result of causing the untimely death of a valued sheep-dog. Night after night the younger men, armed with guns, sat up and watched, but without success. Nothing happened, the sheep were undisturbed, and it really seemed as if the invader had left the neighborhood. But John Barron knew that once a dog has taken to worrying sheep, it can never be cured. If the mysterious visitor was a dog, he would most certainly return if still alive and able to travel. If it was not a dog, well, anything might happen. So he continued to watch, even after the general hunt for the dog had ceased. Soon he had his reward. One very dark and stormy night, he again heard the distant voice in the night. It came very faintly rising and falling on the air, for the breeze was strong and the sound had to travel against the wind. Then he left the house, carrying his gun, and took up his post on rising ground that commanded the road that led from the moor. Presently the cry came nearer, and then nearer still, till it was evident that the wolf had left the moor and was approaching the farms. Several dogs barked, but they were not the barks of challenge and defiance, but rather the timid yelps of fear. Then the howling came from a turn in the road so close at hand that John Barron, who was by no means a timid or nervous man, could hardly resist a shudder. He silently cocked his gun, crept softly from behind the hedge into the road, and waited. Then a small, shriveled old woman came into sight, walking with the aid of a stick. She hobbled along with surprising briskness for so old a woman until a turn in the road brought her suddenly face to face with him. And then something happened. 
He was not a man addicted to fancies, nor was he at all lacking in powers of description as a rule, but he could never state quite clearly what it was that really happened. Probably it was because he did not quite know. He could only speak of an impression rather than of certain experience. According to him, the old woman gave him one glance of unspeakable malignancy, and then he seemed to become dazed or semi-conscious for a moment. It could have been only a matter of a second or two, but during that short space of time the old woman vanished. John Barron pulled himself together just in time to see a large wolf disappear round the turn of the road. Naturally enough, he was somewhat confused by his startling experience, but there was no doubt about the presence of the wolf. He only just saw it, but he saw it quite clearly for about a second of time. Whether the wolf accompanied the old woman, or the old woman turned into a wolf, he neither saw nor could know. But each supposition was open to many obvious objections. John Barron spent some time next day in thinking the thing out, and then it suddenly occurred to him to visit the thicket by the moorside and see the grave of the gypsy. He did not expect that there would be anything to see, but still it might be worth while to take a look at the place. So he strolled in that direction early in the afternoon. The thicket occupied a kind of little dell lying under the edge of the moor, and was densely filled with small trees and undergrowth. But a scarcely visible path led into it, and, pushing his way through, he found that there was a small open space in the middle. Evidently this was the site of the gypsy grave. And there he found it, but he found more than he expected. Not only was the grave there, but it lay open. The loose earth was heaped up on either side, and had the appearance of having been scraped out by some animal. And sure enough, the footprints of a very large dog or wolf were to be seen in several places. John Barron was simply horrified to find that the grave had been thus desecrated, and apparently in a manner that suggested an even worse horror. But after a moment of hesitation, he stepped to the edge of the grave and looked in. What he saw was less appalling than he feared. There lay the coffin, exposed to view, but there was no sign that it had been opened or tampered with in any way. There was evidently only one thing to be done, and that was to cover up the coffin decently and fill in the grave again. He would borrow a spade at the nearest cottage on some pretense and get the job done. He turned away to do this, but as he went through the thicket he could have sworn that he heard a sound like muffled laughter and he could not get away from the notion that the laughter had some quality closely resembling the howling of a wolf. He called himself a fool for thinking such a thing, but he thought it all the same. He borrowed the spade and filled the grave, beating the earth down as hard as he could, and again, as he turned away after completing the task, he heard that muffled laugh. But this time it was even less distinct than before, and somehow it sounded underground he was rather glad to get away. It may well be imagined that he had plenty to occupy his thoughts for the rest of the day, and even when he sought to sleep he could not. He lay tossing uneasily, thinking all the time of the mysterious grave and the events that certainly seemed now to be connected with it. Then, soon after midnight, he heard the voice in the night again. The wolf howled a long way off at first, and then came a long interval of silence, and then the voice sounded so close to the house that Baron started up in alarm, and he heard his dog give a cry of fear. Then the silence fell again, and some time later the howling was again heard in the distance. Next morning he found his favorite dog lying dead beside his kennel, and it was only too evident how he had met his end. His neck was almost severed by one fearful bite, but the strange thing was that there was very little blood to be seen. A closer examination showed that the dog had bled to death, but where was the blood? Natural wolves tear their prey and devour it. They do not suck its blood. What kind of a wolf could this be? John Barron found the answer the next day. He was walking in the direction of the moor late in the afternoon, as it grew towards dusk, when he heard shrieks of terror coming from a little side lane. He ran to the rescue, and there he saw a little child of the village lying on the ground, with a huge wolf in the act of tearing at its throat. Fortunately he had his gun with him, and as the wolf sprang off its victim when he shouted, he fired. The range was a short one, and the beast got the full force of the charge. It bounded into the air and fell in a heap. 
but it got up again and went off in a limping gallop in the way that wolves will often do, even when mortally wounded. It made for the moor. John Barron saw that it had received its death wound, and so gave it no further attention for the moment. Some men came running up at his shouts, and with their assistance he took the wounded child to the local doctor. Happily he had been in time to save its life. Then he reloaded his gun, took a man with him, and followed the track of the wolf. It was not difficult to follow, for bloodstains on the road at frequent intervals showed plainly enough that it was severely wounded. As Baron expected, the track led straight to the thicket and entered it. The two men followed cautiously, but they found no wolf. In the midst of the thicket lay the grave once more uncovered. And there beside it lay the body of a little old woman, drenched with blood. She was quite dead, and the terrible gunshot wound in her side told its own story. And the two men noticed that her canine teeth projected slightly beyond her lips on each side, like those of a snarling wolf, and they were blood-stained. End of The Voice in the Night by William J. Wintle The Damned Thing by Ambrose G. Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Finfrock. The Damned Thing by Ambrose G. Beers. Chapter 1. One does not always eat what is on the table. By the light of a tallow candle, which had been placed on one end of a rough table, a man was reading something written in a book. It was an old account book, greatly worn, and the writing was not, apparently, very legible, for the man sometimes held the page close to the flame of the candle to get a stronger light on it. The shadow of the book would then throw into obscurity a half of the room's, darkening a number of faces and figures. For besides the reader, eight other men were present. Seven of them sat against the rough log walls, silent, motionless, and the room being small, not very far from the table. By extending an arm, any one of them could have touched the eighth man, who lay on the table, face upward, partly covered by a sheet, his arms at his sides. He was dead. The man with the book was not reading aloud, and no one spoke. All seemed to be waiting for something to occur. The dead man only was without expectation. From the bland darkness outside came in through the aperture that served for a window all the ever unfamiliar noises of night in the wilderness. The long nameless note of a distant coyote, the drone of great blundering beetles, and all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that seem always to have been but half heard when they have suddenly ceased, as if conscious of an indiscretion. But nothing of all this was noted in that company. Its members were not over much addicted to idle interest in matters of no practical importance. That was obvious in every line of their rugged faces, obvious even in the dim light of the single candle. They were evidently men of the vicinity, farmers and woodsmen. The person reading was a trifle different. One would have said of him that he was of the world, worldly, albeit there was that in his attire which attested a certain fellowship with the organisms of his environment. His coat would hardly pass muster in San Francisco, his footgear was not of urban origin, and the hat that lay by him on the floor he was the only one uncovered, was such that, if one had considered it as an article of mere personal adornment, he would have missed its meaning. In countenance the man was rather prepoposing, with just a hint of sternness, though that he may have assumed or cultivated, as appropriate to one in authority. For he was a coroner. It was by virtue of his office that he had possession of the book in which he was reading, it had been found among the dead man's effects, in his cabin, where the inquest was now taking place. When the coroner had finished reading, he put the book into his breast pocket. At that moment the door was pushed open and a young man entered. 
He, clearly, was not of mountain birth and breeding. He was clad as those who dwell in cities. His clothing was dusty, however, as from travel. He had, in fact, been riding hard to attend the inquest. The coroner nodded. No one else greeted him. We have waited for you, said the coroner. It is necessary to have done with this business tonight. The young man smiled. I am sorry to have kept you, he said. I went away, not to evade your summons, but to post to my newspaper an account of what I suppose I am called back to relate. The coroner smiled. The account that you posted to your newspaper, he said, differs probably from that which you will give here under oath. That, replied the other, rather hotly and with a visible flush, is as you please. I used manifold paper and have a copy of what I sent. It was not written as news, for it is incredible, but as fiction. It may go as part of my testimony under oath, but you say it is incredible. That is nothing to you, sir, if I also swear that it is true. The coroner was silent for a time, his eyes upon the floor. The men about the sides of the cabin talked in whispers, but seldom withdrew their gaze from the face of the corpse. Presently, the coroner lifted his eyes and said, We will resume the inquest. The men removed their hats. The witness was sworn. What is your name? The coroner asked. William Harker. Age? Twenty-seven. You knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. You were with him when he died? Near him. How did that happen? Your presence, I mean. I was visiting him at this place to shoot and fish. A part of my purpose, however, was to study him and his odd, solitary way of life. He seemed a good model for a character in fiction. I sometimes write stories. I sometimes read them. Thank you. Stories in general. Not yours. Some of the jurors laughed. Against a somber background, humor shows high lights. Soldiers in the intervals of battle laugh easily. Any jest in the death chamber conquers by surprise. Relate the circumstances of this man's death, said the coroner. You may use any notes or memoranda that you please. The witness understood. Pulling a manuscript from his breast pocket, he held it near the candle, and turning the leaves until he found the passage that he wanted, began to read. Chapter 2 What May Happen in a Field of Wild Oats the sun had hardly risen when we left the house. We were looking for quail, each with a shotgun, but we had only one dog. Morgan said that our best ground was beyond a certain ridge that he pointed out, and we crossed it by a trail through the chaparral. On the other side was comparatively level ground, thickly covered with wild oats. As we emerged from the chaparral, Morgan was but a few yards in advance, Suddenly, we heard, at a little distance to our right and partly in front, a noise as of some animal thrashing about in the bushes, which we could see were violently agitated. We've started a deer, I said. I wish we had brought a rifle. Morgan, who had stopped and was intently watching the agitated chaparral, said nothing, but had cocked both barrels of his gun and was holding it in readiness to aim. I thought him a trifle excited, which surprised me, for he had a reputation for exceptional coolness, even in moments of sudden and imminent peril. Oh, come, I said. You are not going to fill up a deer with quail shot, are you? Still he did not reply. But catching sight of his face as he turned it slightly toward me, I was struck by the intensity of his look. Then I understood that we had serious business in hand, and my first conjecture was, that we had jumped a grizzly. I advanced to Morgan's side, cocking my piece as I moved. The bushes were now quiet, and the sounds had ceased. But Morgan was as attentive to the place as before. What is it? What the devil is it? I asked. That damned thing, he replied, without turning his head. His voice was husky and unnatural. He trembled visibly. I was about to speak further when I observed the wild oats near the place of the disturbance moving in the most inexplicable way. I can hardly describe it. It seemed as if stirred by a streak of wind which not only bent it but pressed it down. 
crushed it so that it did not rise, and this movement was slowly prolonging itself directly toward us. Nothing that I had ever seen had affected me so strongly as this unfamiliar and unaccountable phenomenon, yet I, I am unable to recall any sense of fear. I remember, and tell it here, because singularly enough I recollected it then, that once in looking carelessly out of an open window I momentarily mistook a small tree close at hand for one of a group of larger trees at a little distance away. It looked the same size as the others, but being more distinctly and sharply defined in mass and detail, it seemed out of harmony with them. It was a mere falsification of the low of aerial perspective, but it startled, almost terrified me. We so rely upon the orderly operation of familiar natural laws that any seeming suspension of them is noted as a, a menace to our safety, as warning of unthinkable calamity. So now the apparent causeless movement of the, the herbage and the slow, undeviating approach of the line of disturbance were distinctly disquieting. My companion appeared actually frightened, and I could hardly credit my senses when I saw him suddenly throw his gun to his shoulder and fire both barrels at the agitated grain. Before the smoke had cleared away, I heard a loud, savage cry, a scream like that of a wild animal, and flinging his gun upon the ground, Morgan sprang away and ran swiftly from the spot. At the same instant, I was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the smoke, some soft, heavy substance that seemed thrown against me with great force. Before I can get upon my feet and recover my gun, which seemed to have been struck from my hands, I heard Morgan crying out as if in mortal agony. And mingling with his cries were such hoarse, savage sounds as one hears from fighting dogs. Inexpressibly terrified, I struggled to my feet and looked in the direction of Morgan's retreat. And may heaven in mercy spare me from another sight like that. At a distance of less than thirty yards was my friend, down upon one knee, his head thrown back at a frightful angle, hatless, his hair in disorder and his whole body in violent movement from side to side, backward and forward. His right arm was lifted and, and seemed to lack the hand. At least I could see none. The other arm was invisible. At times, as my memory now reports this extraordinary scene, I could discern, but it was as if he had been partly blotted out. I cannot otherwise express it. Then a shifting of his position would bring it all into view again. All this must have occurred within a few seconds, yet in that time Morgan assumed all the postures of a determined wrestler vanquishing by superior weight and strength. I saw nothing but him and not always distinctly. During the entire incident, his shouts and curses were heard, as if through an enveloping uproar of such sounds of rage and fury as I have never heard from the throat of a man or brute. For a moment only I stood irresolute. Then throwing my gun down, I ran forward to my friend's assistance. I had a vague belief that he was suffering from a fit or some form of convulsion. Before I could reach his side, he was down and quiet. All sounds had ceased. But with a feeling of such terror as even these awful events had not inspired, I now saw again the mysterious movement of the wild oats, prolonging itself from the trampled area about the prostrate man toward the edge of a wood. It was only when it had reached the wood that I was able to withdraw my eyes and look at my companion. He was dead. Chapter 3 A Man Though Naked May Be in Rags The coroner rose from his seat and stood beside the dead man. Lifting an edge of the sheet, he pulled it away, exposing the entire body, altogether naked and showing in the candlelight a clay-like yellow. It had, however, broad maculations of bluish-black, obviously caused by extravasated blood from contusions. The chest and sides looked as if they had been beaten with a bludgeon. There were dreadful lacerations. The skin was torn in strips and shreds. The coroner moved round to the end of the table and undid a silk handkerchief, which had been passed under the chin and knotted on the top of the head. When the handkerchief was drawn away, it exposed what had been the throat. Some of the jurors who had risen to get a better view repented their curiosity and turned away their faces. Witness Harker went to the open window and leaned out across the sill, faint and sick. Dropping the handkerchief upon the dead man's neck, the coroner stepped to an angle of the room, 
and from a pile of clothing produced one garment after another, each of which he held up a moment for inspection. All were torn and stiff with blood. The jurors did not make a closer inspection. They seemed rather uninterested. They had, in truth, seen all this before, the only thing that was new to them being Harker's testimony. Gentlemen, the coroner said, we have no more evidence, I think. Your duty has been already explained to you. If there is nothing you wish to ask, you may go outside and consider your verdict. The foreman rose, a tall bearded man of sixty, coarsely clad. I shall like to ask one question, Mr. Coroner, he said. What asylum did this year last witness escape from? Mr. Harker, said the coroner, gravely and tranquilly, from what asylum did you last escape? Harker flushed crimson again, but said nothing, and the seven jurors rose and solemnly filed out of the cabin. If you have done insulting me, sir, said Harker, as soon as he and the officer were left alone with the dead man, I suppose I am at liberty to go? Yes. Harker started to leave, but paused with his hand on the door latch. The habit of his profession was strong in him, stronger than his sense of personal dignity. He turned about and said, The book you have there, I recognize it as Morgan's Diary. You seemed greatly interested in it. You read in it while I was testifying. May I see it? The public would like... The book will cut no figure in this matter, replied the official, slipping it into his coat pocket. All of the entries in it were made before the writer's death. As Harker passed out of the house, the jury re-entered, and stood about the table, on which the now-covered corpse showed under the sheet with sharp definition. The foreman seated himself near the candle, produced from his breast pocket a pencil and scrap of paper, and wrote rather laboriously the following verdict, which, with various degrees of effort, all signed. We, the jury, do find that the remains come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion. But some of us thinks all the same. They had fits. Chapter 4 An Explanation from the Tomb In the diary of the late Hugh Morgan are certain interesting entries, having, possibly, a scientific value as suggestions. At the inquest upon his body, the book was not put in evidence. Possibly the coroner thought it not worth while to confuse the jury. The date of the first of the entries mentioned cannot be ascertained. The upper part of the leaf is torn away. The part of the entry remaining follows. Would run in a half circle, keeping his head turned always toward the center. And again he would stand still, barking furiously. At last he ran away into the brush as fast as he could go. I thought at first that he had gone mad, but on returning to the house found no other alteration in his manner than what was obviously due to fear of punishment. Can a dog see with his nose? Do odors impress some cerebral center with images of the thing that emitted them? September 2nd. Looking at the stars last night as they rose above the crest of the ridge east of the house, I observed them successfully disappear, from left to right. Each was eclipsed but an instant, and only a few at a time, but along the entire length of the ridge, all that were, within a degree or two of the crest, were blotted out. It was as if something had passed along between me and them, but I could not see it, and the stars were not thick enough to define its outline. Ugh! don't like this. Several weeks' entries are missing, three leaves being torn from the book. September 27th. It has been about here again. I find evidences of its presence every day. I watched again all last night in the same cover, gun in hand, double-charged with buckshot. In the morning the fresh footprints were there, as before. Yet I would have sworn that I did not sleep. Indeed, I hardly sleep at all. It is terrible, unsupportable. If these amazing experiences are real, I shall go mad. If they are fanciful, I am mad already. 
October 3rd. I shall not go. It shall not drive me away. No, this is my house, my land. God hates a coward. October 5th. I can stand it no longer. I have invited Harker to pass a few weeks with me. He has a level head. I can judge from his manner if he thinks me mad. October 7th. I have the solution of the mystery. It came to me last night, suddenly, as by revelation. How simple. How terribly simple. There are sounds we cannot hear. At either end of the scale are notes that stir no chord of that imperfect instrument, the human ear. They are too high or too grave. I have observed a flock of blackbirds occupying an entire treetop, the tops of several trees, and all in full song. Suddenly, in a moment, at absolutely the same instant, all spring into the air and fly away. How? They could not see one another. Whole treetops intervened. At no point could a leader have been visible to all. There must have been a signal of warning or command, high and shrill above the din, but by me, unheard. I have observed, too, the same simultaneous flight when all were silent, among not only blackbirds, but other birds. Quail, for example, widely separated by bushes, even on opposite sides of a hill. It is known to seamen that a school of whales basking or sporting on the surface of the ocean, miles apart, with the convexity of the earth between, will sometimes dive at the same instant, all gone, out of sight in a moment. The signal has been sounded, too grave for the ear of the sailor at the masthead and his comrades on the deck, who nevertheless feel its vibrations in the ship as the stones of a cathedral are stirred by the bass of the organ. As with sounds, so with colors. At each end of the solar spectrum, the chemist can detect the presence of what are known as actinic rays. They represent colors, integral colors in the composition of light, which we are unable to discern. The human eye is an imperfect instrument. Its range is but a few octaves of the real chromatic scale. I am not mad. There are colors that we cannot see. And God help me, the damned thing is of such a color. The End of The Damned Thing by Ambrose G. Beers Recording by Mark Finfrock Pennsylvania, USA Visit www.timadproductions.com The Nameless City by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Nameless City by H. P. Lovecraft. When I drew nigh the Nameless City, I knew it was accursed. I was travelling in a parched and terrible valley under the moon and afar I saw it protruding uncannily above the sands, as parts of a corpse may protrude from an ill-made grave. Fear spoke from the age-worn stones of this hoary survivor of the deluge, this great-grandfather of the eldest pyramid, and a viewless aura repelled me and bade me retreat from antique and sinister secrets that no man should see and no man else had dared to see. Remote in the desert of Araby lies the nameless city, crumbling and inarticulate, its low walls nearly hidden by the sands of uncounted ages. It must have been thus before the first stones of Memphis were laid, and while the bricks of Babylon were yet unbaked. There is no legend so old as to give it a name, or to recall that it was ever alive, but it is told of in whispers around campfires, and muttered about by grand dames in the tents of sheikhs, so that all the tribes shun it without wholly knowing why. It was of this place that Abdul al Hazred, the mad poet, dreamed of the night before he sang his unexplained couplet. 
that is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons death may die. I should have known that the Arabs had good reason for shunning the nameless city, the city told of in strange tales, but seen by no living man, yet I defied them, and went into the untrodden waste with my camel. I alone have seen it, and that is why no other face bears such hideous lines of fear as mine, why no other man shivers so horribly when the night wind rattles the windows. When I came upon it in the ghastly stillness of unending sleep, it looked at me, chilly from the rays of a cold moon amidst the desert's heat, and as I returned its look I forgot my triumph at finding it, and stopped still with my camel to wait for the dawn. For hours I waited, till the east grew grey and the stars faded, and the grey turned to roseate light edged with gold. I heard a moaning and saw a storm of sand stirring among the antique stones, though the sky was clear and the vast reaches of desert still. Then suddenly above the desert's far rim came the blazing edge of the sun, seen through the tiny sandstorm which was passing away, and in my fevered state I fancied that from some remote depth there came a crash of musical metal to hail the fiery disc as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile. My ears rang and my imagination seethed as I led my camel slowly across the sand to that unvocal place, that place which I alone of living men had seen. In and out amongst the shapeless foundations of houses and places I wandered, finding never a carving or inscription to tell of these men, if men they were, who built this city and dwelt therein so long ago. The antiquity of the spot was unwholesome, and I longed to encounter some sign or device to prove that the city was indeed fashioned by mankind. There were certain proportions and dimensions in the ruins which I did not like. I had with me many tools, and dug much within the walls of the obliterated edifices, but progress was slow, and nothing significant was revealed. When night and the moon returned, I felt a chill wind which brought new fear, so that I did not dare to remain in the city, and as I went outside the antique walls to sleep, a small sighing sandstorm gathered behind me, blowing over the grey stones so the moon was bright and most of the desert still. I awakened just at dawn from a pageant of horrible dreams, my ears ringing as from some metallic peal. I saw the sun peering redly through the last gusts of a little sandstorm that hovered over the nameless city, and marked the quietness of the rest of the landscape. Once more I ventured within those brooding ruins that swelled beneath the sand like an ogre under a coverlet, and again dug vainly for relics of the forgotten race. At noon I rested, and in the afternoon I spent much time tracing the walls and bygone streets, and the outlines of the nearly vanished buildings. I saw that the city had been mighty indeed, and wondered at the sources of its greatness. To myself I pictured all the splendours of an age so distant that Chaldea could not recall it, and thought of Sarnath the Doomed, that stood in the land of Manar when mankind was young, and of Ib, that was carven of grey stone before mankind existed. All at once I came upon a place where the bedrock rose stark through the sand and formed a low cliff, and here I saw with joy what seemed to promise further traces of the antediluvian people, hewn rudely on the face of the cliff, were the unmistakable facades of several small squat rock-houses or temples, whose interiors might preserve many secrets, of ages too remote for calculation, though sandstorms had long effaced any carvings which may have been outside. Very low and sand-choked were all the dark apertures near me, but I cleared one with my spade and crawled through it, carrying a torch to reveal whatever mysteries it might hold. When I was inside I saw that the cavern was indeed a temple, and beheld plain signs of the race that had lived and worshipped before the desert was a desert. Primitive altars, pillars and niches, all curiously low, were not absent, and though I saw no sculptures or frescoes, there were many singular stones clearly shaped into symbols by artificial means. The lowness of the chiselled chamber was very strange, for I could hardly kneel upright, but the area was so great that my torch showed only part of it at a time. I shuddered oddly in some of the far corners, for certain altars and stones suggested forgotten rites of terrible, revolting, and inexplicable nature, and made me wonder what manner of men could have made and frequented such a temple. When I had seen all that the place contained, I crawled out again, avid to find what the temples might yield. 
Night had now approached, yet the tangible things I had seen made curiosity stronger than fear, so that I did not flee from the long moon-cast shadows that had daunted me when first I saw the nameless city. In the twilight I cleared another aperture, and with a new torch crawled into it, finding more vague stones and symbols, though nothing more definite than the other temple had contained. The room was just as low, but much less broad, ending in a very narrow passage crowded with obscure and cryptical shrines. About these shrines I was prying, when the noise of a wind and my camel outside broke through the stillness and drew me forth to see what could have frightened the beast. The moon was gleaming vividly over the primitive ruins, lighting a dense cloud of sand that seemed blown by a strong but decreasing wind from some point along the cliff ahead of me. I knew it was this chilly, sandy wind which had disturbed the camel, and was about to lead him to a place of better shelter, when I chanced to glance up, and saw that there was no wind atop the cliff. This astonished me, and made me fearful again, but I immediately recalled the sudden local winds that I had seen and heard before at sunrise and sunset, and judged it was a normal thing. I decided it came from some rock fissure leading to a cave, and watched the troubled sand to trace its source soon perceiving that it came from the black orifice of a temple a long distance south of me, almost out of sight. Against the choking sand cloud I plodded toward this temple, which as I neared it loomed larger than the rest, and showed a doorway far less clogged with caked sand. I would have entered, had not the terrific force of the icy wind almost quenched my torch. It poured madly out of the dark door, sighing uncannily as it ruffled the sand and spread among the weird ruins. Soon it grew fainter, and the sand grew more and more still, till finally all was at rest again. But a presence seemed stalking among the spectral stones of the city, and when I glanced at the moon it seemed to quiver, as though mirrored in unquiet waters. I was more afraid than I could explain, but not enough to dull my thirst for wonder, so as soon as the wind was quite gone I crossed into the dark chamber from which it had come. This temple, as I had fancied from the outside, was larger than either of those I had visited before, and was presumably a natural cavern, since it bore winds from some region beyond. Here I could stand quite upright, but saw that the stones and altars were as low as those in the other temples. On the walls and roof I beheld, for the first time, some traces of the pictorial art of the ancient race. Curious curling streaks of paint, that had almost faded or crumbled away, and on two of the altars I saw, with rising excitement, a maze of well-fashioned curvilinear carvings. As I held my torch aloft, it seemed to me that the shape of the roof was too regular to be natural, and I wondered what the prehistoric cutters of stone had first worked upon. Their engineering skill must have been vast. Then a brighter flare of the fantastic flame showed that form which I had been seeking— the opening to those remoter abysses whence the sudden wind had blown, and I grew faint when I saw that it was a small and plainly artificial door chiselled in the solid rock. I thrust my torch within, beholding a black tunnel, with the roof arching low over a rough flight of very small, numerous, and steeply descending steps. I shall always see those steps in my dreams, for I came to learn what they meant, at the time I hardly knew whether to call them steps or mere footholds in a precipitous descent. My mind was whirling with mad thoughts, and the words and warning of Arab prophets seemed to float across the desert from the land that men know to the nameless city that men dare not know. Yet I hesitated only for a moment before advancing through the portal and commencing to climb cautiously down the steep passage, feet first, as though on a ladder. It is only in the terrible phantasms of drugs or delirium that any other man can have such a descent as mine. The narrow passage led infinitely down, like some hideous haunted well, and the torch I held above my head could not light the unknown depths toward which I was crawling. I lost track of the hours and forgot to consult my watch, though I was frightened when I thought of the distance I must be traversing. There were changes of direction and of steepness, and once I came to a long, low, level passage where I had to wriggle my feet first along the rocky floor, holding torch at arm's length beyond my head. The place was not high enough for kneeling. After that were more of the steep steps, 
and I was still scrambling down interminably when my failing torch died out. I do not think I noticed it at the time, for when I did notice it, I was still holding it above me as if it were ablaze. I was quite unbalanced, with that instinct for the strange and the unknown which had made me a wanderer upon earth and a haunter of far, ancient and forbidden places. In the darkness there flashed before my mind fragments of my cherished treasury of demonic lore, sentences from Alhazred the mad Arab, paragraphs from the apocryphal nightmares of Damascus, and infamous lines from the delirious image du monde of Gautier de Metz. I repeated queer extracts and muttered of Aphrasiab and the demons that floated with him down the Oxus, later chanting over and over again a phrase from one of Lord Dunsany's tales, the unreverberate blackness of the abyss. Once, when the descent grew amazingly steep, I recited something in sing-song from Thomas More, until I feared to recite more. A reservoir of darkness, black as witches' cauldrons are, when filled with moon-drugs in the eclipse distilled, leaning to look if foot might pass, down through that chasm I saw beneath, as far as vision could explore, the jetty side smooth as glass, looking as if just varnished o'er, with that dark pitch the seat of death throws out upon its slimy shore. Time had quite ceased to exist when my feet again felt a level floor, and I found myself in a place slightly higher than the rooms in the two smaller temples, now so incalculably far above my head. I could not quite stand, but could kneel upright, and in the dark I shuffled and crept hither and thither at random. I soon knew that I was in a narrow passage, whose walls were lined with cases of wood having glass fronts. As in that Paleozoic and abysmal place I felt of such things as polished wood and glass, I shuddered at the possible implications. The cases were apparently ranged along each side of the passage at regular intervals, and were oblong and horizontal, hideously like coffins in shape and size. When I tried to move two or three for further examination, I found that they were firmly fastened. I saw that the passage was a long one, so floundered ahead rapidly in a creeping run that would have seemed horrible had any eye watched me in the blackness, crossing from side to side occasionally to feel of my surroundings and be sure the walls and rows of cases still stretched on. Man is so used to thinking visually that I almost forgot the darkness and pictured the endless corridor of wood and glass in its low-studded monotony as though I saw it, and then, in a moment of indescribable emotion, I did see it. Just when my fancy merged into real sight I cannot tell, but there came a gradual glow ahead, and all at once I knew that I saw the dim outlines of a corridor and the cases, revealed by some unknown subterranean phosphorescence. For a little while all was exactly as I had imagined it, since the glow was very faint, but as I mechanically kept stumbling ahead into the stronger light, I realised that my fancy had been but feeble. This hall was no relic of crudity like the temples in the city above, but a monument of the most magnificent and exotic art. Rich, vivid and daringly fantastic designs and pictures formed a continuous scheme of mural paintings whose lines and colours were beyond description. The cases were of a strange golden wood with fronts of exquisite glass and containing the mummified forms of creatures outreaching in grotesqueness the most chaotic dreams of man. To convey any idea of these monstrosities is impossible. They were of the reptile kind, with body lines suggesting sometimes the crocodile, sometimes the seal, but more often nothing of which either the naturalist or the paleontologist ever heard. In size they approximated a small man, and their forelegs bore delicate and evident feet, curiously like human hands and fingers, but strangest of all were their heads, which presented a contour violating all known biological principles. To nothing can such things be well compared. In one flash I thought of comparisons as varied as the cat, the bullfrog, the mythic satyr, and the human being. Not Jove himself had had so colossal and protuberant a forehead, yet the horns and the noselessness and the alligator-like jaw placed things outside all established categories. I debated for a time on the reality of the mummies. 
half suspecting they were artificial idols, but soon decided they were indeed some Paleogean species which had lived when the nameless city was alive. To crown their grotesqueness, most of them were gorgeously enrobed in the costliest of fabrics and lavishly laden with ornaments of gold, jewels and unknown shining metals. The importance of these crawling creatures must have been vast, for they held first place among the wild designs on the frescoed walls and ceiling. With matchless skill had the artist drawn them in a world of their own, wherein they had cities and gardens fashioned to suit their dimensions. I could not help but think that their pictured history was allegorical, perhaps showing the progress of the race that worshipped them. These creatures, I said to myself, were to men of the nameless city what the she-wolf was to Rome, or some totem beast is to a tribe of Indians. Holding this view, I could trace roughly a wonderful epic of the nameless city, the tale of a mighty sea-coast metropolis that ruled the world before Africa rose out of the waves, and of its struggles as the sea shrank away, and the desert crept into the fertile valley that held it. I saw its wars and triumphs, its troubles and defeats, and afterwards its terrible fight against the desert, when thousands of its people, here represented in allegory by the grotesque reptiles, were driven to chisel their way down through the rocks, in some marvellous manner, to another world, whereof their prophets had told them. It was all vividly weird and realistic, and its connection with the awesome descent I had made was unmistakable. I even recognised the passages. As I crept along the corridor toward the brighter light, I saw later stages of the painted epic, the leave-taking of the race that had dwelt in the nameless city and the valley around for ten million years, the race whose souls shrank from quitting scenes their bodies had known so long where they had settled as nomads in the earth's youth, hewing in the virgin rock those primal shrines at which they had never ceased to worship. Now that the light was better I studied the pictures more closely and, remembering that the strange reptiles must represent the unknown men, pondered upon the customs of the nameless city. Many things were peculiar and inexplicable. The civilization, which included a written alphabet, had seemingly risen to a higher order than those immeasurably later civilizations of Egypt and Chaldea. Yet there were curious omissions. I could, for example, find no pictures to represent deaths or funeral customs, save such as were related to wars, violence and plagues, and I wondered at the reticence shown concerning natural death. It was as though an ideal of immortality had been fostered as a cheering illusion. Still nearer the end of the passage was painted scenes of the utmost picturesqueness and extravagance. Contrasted views of the nameless city in its desertion and growing ruin, and of the strange new realm of paradise to which the race had hewed its way through the stone. In these views the city and the desert valley were shown always by moonlight, golden nimbus hovering over the fallen walls and half revealing the splendid perfection of former times, shown spectrally and elusively by the artist. The paradisal scenes were almost too extravagant to be believed, portraying a hidden world of eternal day, filled with glorious cities and ethereal hills and valleys. At the very last I thought I saw signs of an artistic anticlimax. The paintings were less skilful and much more bizarre than even the wildest of the earlier scenes. They seemed to record a slow decadence of the ancient stock coupled with a growing ferocity toward the outside world from which it was driven by the desert. The forms of the people, always represented by the sacred reptiles, appeared to be gradually wasting away, though their spirit, as shown hovering above the ruins by moonlight, gained in proportion. Emaciated priests, displayed as reptiles in ornate robes, cursed the upper air and all who breathed it, and one terrible final scene showed a primitive-looking man, perhaps a pioneer of ancient Arem, the city of pillars, torn to pieces by members of the elder race. I remembered how the Arabs fear the nameless city, and was glad that beyond this place the grey walls and ceiling were bare. As I viewed the pageant of mural history, I had approached very closely to the end of the low-sealed hall, and was aware of a gate through which came all of the illuminating phosphorescence. 
Creeping up to it, I cried aloud in transcendent amazement at what lay beyond, for instead of other and brighter chambers there was only an illimitable void of uniform radiance, such one might fancy when gazing down from the peak of Mount Everest upon a sea of sunlit mist. Behind me was a passage so cramped that I could not stand upright in it. Before me was an infinity of subterranean effulgence. Reaching down from the passage into the abyss was the head of a steep flight of steps, small numerous steps, like those of black passages I had traversed. But after a few feet, the glowing vapours concealed everything. Swung back open against the left-hand wall of the passage was a massive door of brass, incredibly thick and decorated with fantastic base reliefs, which could, if closed, shut the whole inner world of light away from the vaults and passages of rock. I looked at the steps, and for the nonce dared not try them. I touched the open brass door and could not move it. Then I sank prone to the stone floor, my mind aflame with prodigious reflections which not even a death-like exhaustion could banish. As I lay still with closed eyes, free to ponder, many things I had lightly noted in the frescoes came back to me with new and terrible significance. Scenes representing the nameless city in its heyday, the vegetations of the valley around it, and the distant lands with which its merchants traded. The allegory of the crawling creatures puzzled me by its universal prominence, and I wondered that it would be so closely followed in a pictured history of such importance. In the frescoes the nameless city had been shown in proportions fitted to the reptiles. I wondered what its real proportions and magnificence had been, and reflected a moment on certain oddities I had noticed in the ruins. I thought curiously of the lowness of the primal temples and of the underground corridor which were doubtless hewn thus out of deference to the reptile deities there honoured, though it perforce reduced the worshippers to crawling. Perhaps the very rites here involved crawling in imitation of the creatures. No religious theory, however, could easily explain why the level passages in that awesome descent should be as low as the temples, or lower, since one could not even kneel in it. As I thought of the crawling creatures, those hideous mummified forms were so close to me, I felt a new throb of fear. Mental associations are curious, and I shrank from the idea that except for the poor primitive man torn to pieces in the last painting, mine was the only human form amidst the many relics and symbols of the primordial life. But as always in my strange and roving existence, wonder soon drove out fear, for the luminous abyss and what it might contain presented a problem worthy of the greatest explorer, that a weird world of mystery lay far down that flight of peculiarly small steps I could not doubt, and I hoped to find there those human memorials which the painted corridor had failed to give. The frescoes had pictured unbelievable cities and valleys in this lower realm, and my fancy dwelt on the rich and colossal ruins that awaited me. My fears, indeed, concerned the past rather than the future. Not even the physical horror of my position in that cramped corridor of dead reptiles and antediluvian frescoes, miles below the world I knew, and faced by another world of eerie light and mist, could match the lethal dread I felt at the abysmal antiquity of the scene and its soul. An ancientness so vast that measurement is feeble, seemed to leer down from the primal stones and rock-hewn temples of the nameless city, while the very latest of the astounding maps in the frescoes showed oceans and continents that man has forgotten, with only here and there some vaguely familiar outlines. Of what could have happened in the geological ages since the painting ceased and the death-hating race resentfully succumbed to decay, no man might say, Life had once teemed in these caverns, and in the luminous realm beyond. Now I was alone with vivid relics, and I trembled to think of the countless ages through which these relics had kept a silent, deserted vigil. Suddenly there came another burst of that acute fear which had intermittently seized me ever since I first saw the terrible valley and the nameless city under a cold moon, and despite my exhaustion I found myself starting frantically, to a sitting posture, 
and gazing back along the black corridor toward the tunnels that rose to the outer world. My sensations were like those which had made me shun the nameless city at night, and were as inexplicable as they were poignant. In another moment, however, I received a still greater shock in the form of a definite sound, the first which had broken the utter silence of these tomb-like depths. It was a deep, low moaning, as of a distant throng of condemned spirits, and came from the direction in which I was staring. Its volume rapidly grew, till it soon reverberated frightfully through the low passage, and at the same time I became conscious of an increasing draught of cold air, likewise flowing from the tunnels and the city above. The touch of this air seemed to restore my balance, for I instantly recalled the sudden gusts which had risen around the mouth of the abyss each sunset and sunrise, one of which had indeed revealed the hidden tunnels to me. I looked at my watch and saw that sunrise was near, so braced myself to resist the gale that was sweeping down to its cavern home as it had swept forth at evening. My fear again waned low, since a natural phenomena tends to dispel broodings over the unknown. More and more madly poured the shrieking, moaning night wind into the gulf of the inner earth. I dropped prone again and clutched vainly at the floor for fear of being swept bodily through the open gate into the phosphorescent abyss. Such fury I had not expected, and as I grew aware of an actual slipping of my form toward the abyss, I was beset by a thousand new terrors of apprehension and imagination. The malignancy of the blast awakened incredible fancies. Once more I compared myself shudderingly to the only human image in that frightful corridor, the man who was torn to pieces by the nameless race, for in the fiendish clawing of the swirling currents there seemed to abide a vindictive rage all the stronger because it was largely impotent. I think I screamed frantically near the last. I was almost mad, but if I did so my cries were lost in the hell-born babel of the howling wind wraiths. I tried to crawl against the murderous invisible torrent, but I could not even hold my own as I was pushed slowly and inexorably toward the unknown world. Finally reason must have wholly snapped, for I fell to babbling over and over that unexplainable couplet of the mad Arab al Hazred, who dreamed of the nameless city. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons even death may die. Only the grim, brooding desert gods know what really took place, what indescribable struggles and scrambles in the dark I endured, or what Abaddon guided me back to life, where I must always remember and shiver in the night wind till oblivion, or worse, claims me. Monstrous, unnatural, colossal was the thing, too far beyond all the ideas of man to be believed, except in the silent, damnable small hours of the morning when one cannot sleep. I have said that the fury of the rushing blast was infernal, cacodemonical, and that its voices were hideous with the pent-up viciousness of desolate eternities. Presently these voices, while still chaotic before me, seemed to my beating brain to take articulate form behind me, and down there in the grave of unnumbered eon-dead antiquities, leagues below the dawn-lit world of men, I heard the ghastly cursing and snarling of strange-tongued fiends. Turning I saw outlined against the luminous ether of the abyss what could not be seen against the dusk of the corridor a nightmare horde of rushing devils, hate-distorted, grotesquely panoplied, half-transparent devils of a race no man might mistake, the crawling reptiles of the nameless city. And as the wind died away, I was plunged into the ghoul-pooled darkness of earth's bowels, for behind the last of the creatures the great brazen door clanged shut with a deafening peal of metallic music, whose reverberations swelled out to the distant world, to hail the rising sun as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile. End of The Nameless City by H. P. Lovecraft